Welcome everyone to .NET Conf Focus on Xamarin. I'm James Montemagno and I could not be more excited to be here with all of you all around the globe for an amazing day of Xamarin content. We have nine hours of amazing content from the product team and community members around the globe. I think we have like 10 different time zones that presenters are at right now bringing amazing Xamarin content directly to you. Now, I'm really thankful for the amazing team here in Channel 9 Studio here in Redmond. We have some amazing people with me. Olya will be helping me throughout the day. Also behind the scenes, Cameron, Ryan, Golnaz, Beth Massey, Javier, and a bunch more people are really making this happen behind the scenes. It's been a, it's been a hard time to get here, but we're excited to have this amazing day of content. Now, of course, you can go to focus.netconf.net to find the full agenda. It's a nice long title there. Um, which has amazing content throughout the day, whether you're a brand new Xamarin developer or you've been developing apps with Xamarin for nine years like I have. I'm really excited for the amount of content that we have. And of course, all these videos will be live on YouTube later as well. So if you have to step out, you'll be good to go. Now, I'm ecstatic, honestly, to have my favorite people in the entire world to keynote today um, first, uh, we have our program managers, David and Maddie, that will be coming on joining our CVP, Amanda Silver, who I'm so excited. They'll be launching the day, telling us all about Xamarin, Visual Studio, and .NET. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Amanda. Thanks, James. Thanks for uh, welcoming everybody all over the globe to talk about Xamarin and .NET. And I'm really excited to kick off our second focus event of the year. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, I'm Amanda Silver. I'm the CVP of PM for the developer division at Microsoft. Um, now, you know, obviously we, we, .NET is definitely deep in our hearts. I've been working on .NET since I started at Microsoft in 2001. And you can really build anything with .NET, from desktop to web to mobile to IoT. You really can build absolutely anything. It's free, it's cross-platform, and it's open source. And it's designed to be a general purpose, so that once you so once you learn, you can you to build one type of application. You can quickly build other types of applications for completely different workloads. Your skills can really easily transfer to other domains using the same languages and libraries. .NET enables developers to be more productive, building feature-rich applications of any type for any device with great performance. Now, .NET Standard brings it all together so that the ecosystem can share libraries easily across all of these different types of applications. And we've made really significant advancements in the platform since it was open sourced in 2014. Together, Microsoft and the community has extended the capabilities of .NET to cover workloads we've never had before, like Linux workloads and machine learning and AI. Now, being open source and expanding the platform to more workloads has resulted in significant growth. Just take a look at a few of these stats. Over the past year, we've added over a million new .NET devs in the past year. And in fact, the year before, we, add, we also added a million new .NET devs. It's the number one most loved framework, according to Stack Overflow surveys, and it's one of the top it has two of the top 30 highest velocity open source projects, both with .NET as well as ASP.NET. It's a top five language on GitHub, and it's seven times faster than Node.js, according to the Tech Empower uh, benchmark. 40% of those who are new to .NET are students. And so that really means that the next generation of developers are really starting with .NET. With the help of the .NET Foundation, there's been an injection of innovation in .NET and the surrounding ecosystem. We're really proud of the, its momentum in the open source community, and we're excited to work with all of you guys. There are a number of open source projects that make up the .NET platform ecosystem, and it's amazing to see the engagement. 87% of the people who contribute to the .NET platform don't work for Microsoft. All of these open source developers have made over 110,000 code contributions back into the platform itself. That's really just amazing, and I just wanted to thank you. Now today, we're going to be focusing on building beautiful native mobile apps with Xamarin. With Xamarin, you can build fast, 
beautiful native apps in less time with less code, and there's a thriving ecosystem to support you in doing that. So what is Xamarin? Xamarin allows you to build native performant cross-platform apps for many devices. Now, when it's coupled with Visual Studio, one of our favorite code editing environments and, and IDEs, you can have the most productive environment for building apps for iOS and Android. And of course, it's part of .NET and it's all open source. So let's talk a little bit about what we've been focusing on for Visual Studio and how that relates to Xamarin, building Xamarin applications. Millions of developers rely on Visual Studio to build and deploy code as well as collaborate with their teams. With Visual Studio 2019, we focused on what's important to developers by adding numerous productivity improvements, enhanced collaboration, and faster tooling that bring the best experience to developers building modern solutions, including .NET mobile development with Xamarin. You can get up and running faster with async loading of extensions. You can collaborate on your solution super easily with anybody in the world using Visual Studio Live Share, so you can have a real-time collaborative experience building your applications. You can also be more productive with Xamarin using Hot Reload and Hot Restart, and there will be a lot of really awesome demos later in this session that will show you how that works. And you also can take advantage of AI-assisted IntelliSense using IntelliCode, which also supports Android XML and Xamarin Form XAML. Now, especially for the XML-based languages, IntelliCode really just makes it so that pretty much all you're doing is hitting tab, 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 tab. You're pretty much doing absolutely no typing. <laughs> you don't even have to think about the code that you need to write. Additionally, we've also made it easier than ever to get started. Xamarin is now two times faster to install, and we've reduced the install size to only six gigs. So that makes it a lot easier to get it set up on your dev box and get going really quickly. Xamarin continues to enable more developer productivity features like XAML Hot Reload and Hot Restart, which we'll talk about a little bit later, which will significantly speed up your mobile development. So you can iterate super quickly on your Xamarin Forms UI while debugging and quickly redeploying your Xamarin Forms app without having to do a full recompile. So that means your F5 time is just really super fast. If you grab the latest versions of Visual Studio 2019 or Visual Studio 2019 for Mac, you'll be able to try these out. So definitely check it out. So with this growing ecosystem, you might ask, who are some of the people who are using it? Here are just a few of the companies that are using Xamarin and .NET today. These companies leverage Xamarin and .NET across all verticals, a bunch of different types of solutions, and all different types of platforms. And many of them, I'm sure you're going to recognize uh, some, of these, some of these brands that you see here. UPS is one of these customers. They've been using Xamarin to build their mobile solutions for the last few years, along with many of our other tools and services. Here's a video we did with them back when they started, which is still relevant today. A lot of people think of UPS as a packaging company. I see it as a technological company that also does logistics. We have millions of mobile users using the native apps on each operating system. Visual Studio tools for Xamarin allowed us to develop a single code base in C Sharp and deploy an application to two completely different mobile phone ecosystems. Xamarin allows us to deliver customer features faster. We also use the .NET Core to manage our web service calls and our business logic that we have embedded inside the mobile application. C Sharp has allowed us to decrease our code size by 64%. UPS Bot is an automated virtual assistant that allows customers to interact with UPS using conversational interface. Customers that have Facebook Messenger can ask UPS Bot questions about their packages. The Bot framework gave us the ability to build a multiple channel. So if we built it once, then we could automatically extend that to things like Facebook. With Lewis, we were able to train our bot to understand natural language without having to code 
We're running the bot as a service in Azure and we adopted Application Insights, which is giving us those analytics and tracking intents so that we can implement additional functionality in the future. Azure gives us the ability to scale up and out automatically. The pace at which technology is moving is really exciting and the possibilities are endless. Now, I've got my coffee, and I'm ready to watch eight hours of Xamarin content. And to do that, I'm going to kick it off to David and Maddie, who are going to walk us through some of the awesome things that you can do with Xamarin. Thanks, guys. Take it away. Thank you so much, Amanda. We really, really appreciate you taking the time to uh, introduce everybody to Xamarin, uh, share with everyone how amazing the .NET ecosystem is right now. Uh, there's really never been a better time to be a .NET developer. Uh, I started out my career uh, doing ASP, VB script, and access databases and all that stuff back in the, oh gosh, mid-90s. And then when dot, .NET came out, it was clear that that was going to be a huge thing. And now here we are all these years later. Maddie, how you doing? I am amazing. How are you? I'm fantastic. So I'm ready to start getting into some things, but before we do, uh, I just wanted to, you know, this is these are interesting times for us, right? And we're all working from home. My wife's in the other room doing uh, teaching. She's an educator, and so she's on a meeting right now, and we're having a meeting, and we're all still doing this thing. And I probably have three kids watching, you know, some streaming service right now. But it's important that everybody knows uh, that I am indeed wearing pants. Uh, this is just, you know, when you're working from home, you still got to get dressed up. You still got to do you know, the, the necessary things, right? So, uh, at least today, today. Where's your pants, you know, Cam, Maddie? You know? In the Channel Channel 9 studios, you don't even know whether or not they're wearing pants or not. <laughs> sure. We're all about being sure. transparent. This is, this is, you know, letting everybody know exactly what's going on. So Thanks for well, let's sharing, start diving into some stuff. Yeah, you like that? <laughs> and we like to have fun. We are flexible, if nothing else. Uh, the, the Xamarin team loves that. So, uh, Maddie, who's kicking this thing off? You, me, what's happening? Turn it over to you, Dave. All right. Um, so I'm going to, I'm, I have my own stream deck here. So from here on out, I am in control. Uh, let's go to my desk. That's us. We are in our Zamagons. Say hi to your Zamagon. All right, let's go. So we're going to talk about how Xamarin enables you to, to build fast, beautiful, and native applications. Fast in how productive you can be as well as native performance. Uh, so quick reminder, let's just you know set the, uh, set the stage here, that Xamarin apps, you can build everything in C Sharp. So in one language, uh, you can of course always get to the other languages and do the things you need to do because it's all a native stack, but you're gonna be more productive when you are in the C Sharp uh, space, right? You can just do all your stuff in .NET. All your shared C Sharp for your business logic, your platform APIs, the user interface as well. Um, so 100% of everything you can do in Objective-C and Swift, you're going to have access to that in C Sharp as well. Uh, it's native execution, so native performance. Uh, there's there's really no super magical thing. It's perhaps magical if if you know you're like me and you don't necessarily understand what a, how a binding works. But really, your C Sharp is working directly against the same APIs that you would have if you were writing it in Objective-C or Swift or Kotlin or Java. Um, and you're just using C Sharp and being productive doing it that way. The end result is exactly the same. So whether it's an iOS application or a uh, Android application, you're doing the same thing. A iOS is all going to be ahead of time compiled. Android is all just in time compiled. However, we are enabling new experiences, which we will be talking about today and, and have you have had for a bit now, uh, that will take advantage of optimized AOT to greatly improve the performance and the startup of your Android applications. So native UI, uh, can, it can still be native even when shared. And this is where something like Xamarin Forms comes to play. So on iOS, an activity indicator is the UI activity indicator. And on Android, it's a progress bar. When you're using Xamarin Forms, you express that as an activity indicator but you're still going to get those native controls on the native platforms. 
Similarly, the UI slider for iOS, the seek bar for Android, well, on Xamarin Forms, that's a slider. And uh, another aspect of this, because they are native controls, is you can take advantage of them in any native application. You don't have to use a completely cross-platform Xamarin Forms, per se. You can use them in native applications, whether they're iOS and Android and C-sharp, or even Objective-C, Swift, Java, and Kotlin, it's possible. And so here's a great article from one of our awesome MVPs, Ryan Davis in Australia. He wrote this for Code Magazine, and uh, he demonstrates how he has been super productive doing exactly this, sharing more and more UI, but within native applications um, to benefit. And so, whoops, wrong keyboard, this keyboard. So you could actually take this and flip it um, the same in the same way you, that you use an activity indicator to get the UI activity indicator. On those native platforms, you can share all of those things. So uh, you could use Xamarin Forms from the get-go, or you could be working in iOS and Android, and you could call up a content page from a Xamarin Forms library and say, give me the view controller, give me the fragment, give me the piece, the frame uh, that I need to do the native thing. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility in how you use these controls because they are all native. All right, big white screen because we're talking about this. Uh, so there are some really great things and resources available to you to see some of these beautiful UIs that many people are creating, uh, many of you probably watching, and we celebrate those every time we see them because you know we are the, we're the tool builders, we're the library developers, and certainly we do our best at creating beautiful UIs ourselves, but you take what we've done and you exponentially uh, demonstrate what's really possible using the .NET platform in Xamarin. So builtwith.net is a great place to go. Snippets Dev is an excellent repository uh, where you can submit anything you've built or you can find samples of things that other folks have built. There's a wonderful trend happening right now where uh, developers are taking dribbles and uh, other designs, uplabs, for example, and building out UIs just to kind of flex the library, flex what Xamarin Forms and Xamarin allows you to do, and, and, and really kind of get a flavor for it, and in the process, create some really beautiful examples. So Snippets has those and the code repos where you can go explore those. And then, of course, uh, our own Javier Suarez Ruiz, who is presenting later today, has maintained for a long time his awesome Xamarin Forms repository, which has tons of libraries and plugins. Uh, one of my favorites is this new transitions plugin. Actually, it's been around for a little bit um, that allows you to do like hero transitions and just beautiful fluid animations. Um, and then, of course, the customer showcase, which we kind of touched on a little bit earlier during Amanda's keynote. And then Kim Philpotts uh, of the Xamarin University fame and now part of Microsoft Learn uh, has his own blog and has his own Twitch stream where you can see some of these beautiful dribbles come to life. And he walks you through the thought process, everything from the design all the way into implementing it in Xamarin Forms, how to do some of those really interesting animations um, that can just really jazz up your apps and, and take them to the next level. And then I, I would be remiss if I didn't call out uh, Stephen Thavison's wonderful website, uh, all of his beautiful samples that he has done. Uh, he's been a great voice in the community, also another MVP. Um, that shows you what you can really do with Xamarin Forms. And the great thing is, is today is packed full of these developers sharing with you the latest and greatest stuff that they're doing, uh, hopefully to really, really inspire you and to show you that it's just so, so cool. Um, so a couple of things that happened last year that I wanted to mention, and these are also just amazing resources you can go back to and, and see how everybody's building their apps. What's the code look like, et cetera. So last year we had this uh, a month of love, I believe it was February of last year, so just a little over a year ago, I guess. Um, tons of blogs and samples that were built um, demonstrating the coolest things of Xamarin Forms at that time. Of course, it's been a year, so we've got a lot more. And then we have the Xamarin UI July, uh, which was one of Steven's uh, initiatives, where you could blog and show off all the cool things that you're able to do with Xamarin Forms. And you can see on the screen here, just these samples alone have some really beautiful, beautiful things um, from some of our uh, great community members, many of you who are watching. 
So we have our awesome Xamarin component vendors that really make so much of this possible. Um, you know, you can go build uh, that amazing grid or calendar if, uh, on your own if you really, really want to. Um, but I highly recommend you check out these component vendors to, to you know, supercharge your productivity. Uh, another thing to call out, and at some point I go to Maddie here. So Maddie, you got to flag me <laughs> down because I get so excited here. I just keep talking and talking and talking. But uh, this this year, you know, we have. Uh, I guess it was earlier this year, we announced the new Surface Duo and Surface Neo. The Surface Duo is an Android device. The Surface Neo is a Windows 10X device. So what platform, what cross-platform technology is better suited to support a first-party uh, device, especially ones as beautiful as these, than .NET and Xamarin? So we've been with it since day zero and working with our other, uh, you know, team members within the Windows team uh, and, and others, the design teams, uh, to make sure that we're producing really good samples and uh, dual screen patterns. And we have a dual screen session later today uh, from our, our former colleague, now part of the Duo team, Craig Dunn, um, and then Guy Marin, who also I believe will be with him. Uh, so definitely hang around and check that out. These devices are amazing. I have had the privilege of putting my grubby little fingers on a few of them, and the build quality is just so, so amazing. Hey, Matt, hang on just a second. They're telling me that you're muted. She should be coming through the OBS through mine. She was coming through for Cameron previously, James. I can hear you. It was muted in Teams, so maybe she's good. Check with Cameron. Live streaming from my... Yeah, she looks to be muted. O open up your mic in Teams, Maddie. Hello, hello. Better? Okay. Keep rolling. Um, I'm going to mute my Skype real quick. All right. Awesome. I just, I, I have to stop and say because of this, thank you so, so much to every single person who is in Channel 9 right now, everyone on the Xamarin team. I mean, you folks are absolutely incredible for coming out in this whole situation and making sure that this thing can be such an amazing success and all of the remote sessions we have later are going to be great. I'm so excited. But what I had said was David can turn this over to me because he so lovely put my face on this slide uh, in our Xamarin TV app, which is the dual screen sample app we built um, as part of the Windows event that happened back in February. And you can go back and watch that. It's all online still, but it's where we displayed the Surface Duo and some of the interactions and design paradigms that you might want to start using when you bring your app experiences to dual screen. And Xamarin TV is an awesome example of that. You can just go through our YouTube videos, write some notes about it. It's really cool. And it uses the amazing Xamarin Forms 2 pane view, which is a really easy way to get your screens ready to transition from one to spread across both to vertically spread across both, all those amazing things. And of course with Xamarin, you're always gonna stay up to date. So one thing we've always talked about is our same day support. It's an incredible, incredible asset because when you're building a cross-platform technology, you don't want your users and your customers to feel like they're behind when they're using your app. So you have to stay ahead of the game, which is why we give you previews as soon as we get previews of all of the latest operating systems. And with that, you will be getting Android 11 preview support in the next Visual Studio preview. So keep your eye out for that. I love this slide because the iOS logos are just the same with different colors. The <laughs> Android logos, it's like you can look back at the first one and be like, oh, I think that's Marshmallow, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah and of those, course- Those logos are bananas. I don't, I, the first time I saw them, I was like, what are these? Yeah, now they're moving away from letters. So it's 11 now, turn it up to 11. 
And of course, Xcode 11.4 support is out as well. So, uh, you know, keep up to date with our blog. We're always going to be, um, you know, staying up with the latest technologies on the native platforms. And it's great because when you use Xamarin, it means you'll never be behind the native platforms. You'll always be able to get previews and, and start updating your app before the OS rolls out to your customers. One of the great examples of this that I love is that we take advantage of the latest innovations in the native platforms. And one of those that's been really incredible for our customers so far is Android App Bundles. And what Android App Bundles does is it takes your user who has certain languages that they speak and have the language packs or keyboards downloaded for, they have a certain device with a certain screen resolution, and they have a locale and all of that, and it builds your APK to only include the things that that user needs. So you upload an app bundle to the store, and the store is going to automatically download what the store thinks this user is going to need. And because the store is on their phone, it gets it right 100% of the time. So all the user knows is that the APK is up to half the size of what it would be standard if they downloaded everything. A really good example of this is like you want to have images of all different resolutions for all the different devices. Well, if I have a phone with a certain resolution, I don't want everybody else's images. I just want mine. And that's where you get a lot of these gains. And another innovation that we've really, uh, we're really excited to be seeing come to fruition is support for Android X and, and the support library. So Android X and Jetpack and all these words you might have heard uh, interchangeably or in different uh, settings, but Android has upgraded their support libraries to kind of a more modern edition, and they're calling those Android X. And what you would have to do is go into all your support libraries and find the compatible Android X library and replace that in your code. But we actually have in preview now an experimental Android X migrator. So what you do is you check off that box and we are going to, its like I said, it's preview, it's experimental. You can right click, migrate all your Android projects to Android X. I actually did it with a couple of the apps this weekend just to see uh, how it was working on the latest pu public or the <laughs> preview build. And it was awesome. It worked with no problems. So can't promise that's for everybody, but go try it out. It is in the Sable Visual Studio right now as this feature, and it's in your tools options, Android. Um, and, and this is one of the many examples of the innovations the Xamarin team makes beyond the native technology. We don't stop with the things that the native technologies and the native platforms do, but we also think of how we can create our own experiences that leverage our strengths, and they go above and beyond what you'd expect when you were building that app just natively. And one of my favorite examples of this is startup tracing, which is a feature where we took the ahead of time compilation that David mentioned at the beginning uh, and, and Android's native just in time compilation and we blend them together to give you the perfect mix of app startup speed and app size. And you can tailor it now to your specific app. So we kind of did a best effort. We knew we did the things that everybody knows we can AOT and everybody knows we can JIT, JIT but with the new startup tracing that just came out, there's actually a command line tool that lets you bundle it specifically to your app and tune it the way it should be. And the performance you get from this is really, really cool. So if you look at normal, which is JIT on Android, AOT, fully AOT, the startup speed is a lot slower, or is a lot faster, a lot lower, but the APK is almost twice the size. Not great. Then you use startup tracing, which in this early build was profiled AOT, and you have not much longer of a startup speed. It's from 18 milliseconds to 518 milliseconds, but still well under two seconds. And the normal is almost three in this one. And your APK actually only went up four megabytes in this one. So instead of you know having the speed for double the size, you get almost half the speed for much, much, much less than double the size. And this is something that you don't have to do any work to turn on. So you can just go into your settings and hit check enable startup tracing and it will start startup tracing appropriately for you. This is also a feature available in community. So you might not have, you know, if you're just trying it out and you want to start building a Xamarin Android app and see if startup tracing is going to work for you, it's right there in your community edition. Nothing fancy. Check off the box and we'll start doing it for you. Yeah, that's an, it's an amazing feature. It makes a huge difference. I did some of my own benchmarking on one of my apps uh, like a week ago, and main activity was appearing in 600 milliseconds. 
regularly, amazing. Um, which is amazing. And then everything else after that, I was responsible for. So, but as far as what Xamarin was doing, uh, super, super amazing. All right. So why did that not advance? Because huh? I need to push this. Huh? So we've got some tons of wonderful examples that are out there, just beautiful applications for you to go look at. Some of the things I referenced previously, we've had the visual challenges and the carousel view challenges and all that. These are all your examples where we did a visual challenge and said, hey, can you uh, use these new material renderers to create more quickly, more easily, consistent UI between iOS and Android? still using native controls. And these are just a few of the examples of what you showed us that you were able to do in, on average, four hours. So, you know, some really amazing things in there. You can see some LinkedIn, some Outlook, some Instagram. Uh, it's just so cool. So with that, I'm going to jump into a demo and show a little code, shall we? Da -da -da. Change around from that. Go to this. I'm already on my desktop, so I just need to exit. Exit PowerPoint. Yay! All right. Cool. This is working, Maddie. This is working. Yeah, live right, streams. Cool. <laughs> uh, live streams. All right. So I'm going to get my mouse over out of this screen. Cool. So uh, a couple of the things that make it so simple to uh, create these beautiful applications. Here I've got my Fly Me application. Super appropriate for being stuck at home. Um, so we'll try to make it a little more appropriate as we go here. Um, but well, within an application to, to beautifully style it, um, CSS is something that a lot of developers have told us is really, really productive for them. Now, CSS isn't for everybody. I certainly know that uh, there, there are you know, those who prefer XAML styles. And the great news is that CSS is essentially a preprocessor on top of XAML styles. So really, anything you can do in one, you can absolutely do in the other. But one of the cool things uh, that one of our community members, Bodon here, put together is the ability to uh, register your own CSS selectors. And so in these examples here, you can see that, uh, for example here, we have a new method or a new property, an attached property, to set the nav bar has shadow property. Um, I wanted to get rid of the, the shadow at the bottom of that nav bar at the top, right? Hate that thing. Uh, doesn't match any of my dribble designs. So I wanted to get rid of it, and I wanted to do it in CSS. So using this registrar, I'm able to create my own selector here. And then in my, uh, in my CSS, I have my shell CSS, where I'm going to change my background colors, my foreground colors, all that. And then here's my custom selector. And now I'm able to control my shadow directly from here. So big shout out to Bodon for that. Uh, go follow him on Twitter. He's doing some really cool stuff. Just did a presentation showing how you can use less. And I know that uh, you can also use SAS, these other preprocessors. You have CSS variables. It's so cool. Um, web developers know what I'm talking about. A couple other things that can jazz up my app here, which I'll get to in just a second, is I can set my new flags for all the experimental things, the things that are in preview that we're stabilizing, but we want to make sure we get into your hands as soon as possible so that you can begin using them and providing feedback to us. So carousel view, indicator view are part of that. And of course, app shell. So let's talk about app shell for just a second. This is shell, which is a new and simplified way to uh, declare the flyout items, the tabs, whether they're bottom tabs or top tabs for your application. You used to have to write you know, four or five different classes to be able to do this sort of thing to implement a, a tab view or a master detail view. And you certainly still have all of those controls at your disposal. They haven't gone away. But we wanted to introduce a way to make it super easy. So you can see here, I'm just declaring my shell item and then a series of flyout items. So those flyout items will appear um, on the left hand side, let's go ahead and click into the application here so that we have a visual representation of what we're talking about. So you see that I started out with that login screen, which is the first shell item in my list here. Um, because it's of a different type than flyout item, it controls what I see first. Order matters in an app shell. So login screen appears first, but now I'm within the flyout items because I've moved past the login. I navigated to my home. Um, so you see that I have my flights today, book, and notifications. These are my 
four flyout items. Um, and then I've got this logout. It's a menu item. So a menu item being slightly different in that I can uh, execute a command off of it, hence logout, um, without it uh, navigating to a page. But otherwise, I'm just declaring my content templates, which are my content pages for these things, um, and then the icons that go along with them. So very cool stuff there. So let's go ahead and look here. And you may have noticed, maybe I'll log back out and log back in. Watch when I go to that first screen. There's some animations that kick off. Whoop. Look at that. Wasn't that cool? So how am I doing that? Um, so Xamarin Forms has a rich animation API for you to use. Um, and then there are plenty of uh, tweening libraries out there. So if, if this isn't your flavor of how you like to do animations, you certainly can find C-sharp versions of tweening libraries anywhere. Um, and so, but this is using our built-in animations. And I just call this in on appearing, and I commit it all at the same time. And I've got a wonderful, beautiful little animation to make that happen. What else do we have going on here to make this a beautiful app? Of course, I've got a carousel at the top. Love my touch screen. Um, and so more advancements are coming to the carousel all the time. It's approaching stable release, so be on the lookout for that. Even now, as it is, super easy to use. Um, previous carousels, it was pretty hard to get that inset around each side to have each of the, the before and next items to peek through. Uh, so that's cool. And then let's go look at a couple of other things that are in here. So I've got a today view. Oh, yeah. So here's my today. So I need to stay home. So yeah, um, I can't I can't travel just yet. So but what I could do is I could do um, hmm. St. Louis County where I live has told us to stay home until like the end of April. So I could do this and I can say, OK, now find me a destination. Oh, look at that. So I wanted to show you this. It's, this is how I'm navigating. So uh, Shell has URI-based navigation, and I can say, take me to the results route, and then pass some query string parameters. So I need to stay home until 4.30, um, 4.30, 2020. And I can go to async. Well, how does Shell know what the results page is? I'm so glad you asked, Maddie. I'm so glad. So I come over here. Uh, back in my app shell, back where the app started, I have my own little method that I created called init routes where I initialize my routes. And so I tell it, hey, when somebody wants to navigate, when I, when, when a developer wants to navigate to the results route, uh, add, add this page. This is the page I want to navigate to. So just as simple as that. So this page does not exist back in that app shell, uh, you know, flyout items. It's not one of the flyout items. It's another page. Uh, something else that you can now do is you can do modals. All right, so let's go ahead and continue on from here. Let's go to that page. Here we are. You know, I've been stuck in my house for so long um, that I think that I can do better here. I think I think I can make this look better. Um, something that really inspires me to kind of get to the end of this whole thing, right, and to be able to go somewhere beautiful. So let's go ahead and make a few updates here. So I'm in my collection view. Um, I should probably talk about the collection view here for a moment. Um, one of the cool things about Collection View is it now supports like infinite loading, right? So I have a remaining items threshold of two, and when it gets to that threshold, it can call this command where it can go load more flights. So every time I scroll to the bottom, let's see if I can just go do that real quick. Boop, a little animation down there at the bottom, and now I've got more. Get to the bottom, boop, load more. Pretty cool, huh? All right. I imagine there's applause in the homes all over the Woo! world. <laughs> thank you, Maddie. Thank you. Um, okay. <laughs> thank you, Amanda. Very kind. Uh, so linear items layout. I can declare any layout I want to here. It can be horizontal or vertical. Uh, we also support a grid layout, which is amazing, and that can go vertical or horizontal. Um, and then custom layouts. As a matter of fact, uh, when we first implemented dual screen support in Xamarin Forms, we used custom layouts with collection views to be able to support that. Um, and then custom layouts as well using a grid. All right, so let's, let's jazz this up. I, I want this to look better. So dun, 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 I've got another. I, I pre-created this result photo view. you got to give me something to really dream about here. So we've got that. Save that. That's much better. 
at the end of this thing from cold St. Louis, Missouri. I want to go to one place. Maui, Hawaii. I want a beach. I want blue water and blue skies. Notice that these beaches have appropriate social distancing. There's nobody on these beaches. They're my beach. So all still good and safe. And I will say that after after uh, after the, the, the stay home is lifted, I, uh, I will be supporting local first. And then I'll go somewhere else. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. So that's cool. Um... Let's see, what else did I want to mention while I was in here? I had this open for some reason. Oh, so I did want to demonstrate real quick. Boom, ba -boom. Uh, so you see I'm passing this 430 in. Uh, I can undo that break. I wanted to show you how I'm routing that query string parameter to, uh, to, the, to the destination page. So down here on the results view model. So we have this query property and I decorate my view model with it. So this particular page is using MVVM. I've got a flight results view model, and I'm going to take in that start query string parameter, and I'm going to route it to the from date in. Um, I'm passing strings because it doesn't like passing dates in the query string parameter, as you can imagine. Um, I'm using a parse exact to get my date, and then I have a display date, which I can display on the following screen. So... I need to actually display it on the screen so you can see it. And I'll just put it up here in the title. Finding display date. Save. So it, of course, went back to 1 1. But if I come back and navigate again, I'm free starting April 30th to go to Maui. Woohoo! Woohoo! So. That's just a few examples of the cool things that you can do in Xamarin Forms today. Um, many of those are features that we shipped over the past year. We're shipping every six weeks. Um, and so no time like the present to get all those things. Did it start from the beginning? Like yeah, but if you want to switch it, I have mine up as well. So You've I can, got yours up? All right, uh, yes, sweet. I can drive for a little bit. I know I'll, I'll turn it back over to you for though. a little I'm bit. Seeing, I'm seeing the PowerPoint. Ah, uh, you're right. Skype, share screen. Oh, oh, got it. There you go. There you go. All right. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Oh, well, with with every Xamarin release, we make it even easier for you to make those gorgeous experiences that David just showed you with less and less code and with less development time. So you're shipping to your customers quicker than ever, and you're also not really duplicating that work for different platforms. I mean, that was Xamarin Forms, so that same app will run on any device that David puts it on that uh, Xamarin Forms targets. It's not just for UI, though. We also have Xamarin Essentials, which is our de device function API library. And that's actually, in the past 18 months or so, grown to over 60 APIs, which is an incredible feat. And it's a place that you can in one line of code, in most cases, access all of these features and more through your C-sharp. I can go like, hey, I want to get the geolocation of my device. All right, device dot geolocation, blah, 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 whatever the API is. And find that out cross-platform, whether it's for my Android, my iPhone, my Windows device, even watches and TVs running watchOS and tvOS. So really, really fantastic powerful library to help you write less code to do the same things that you would do before. You might have to write twice or more. And then, of course, there's Xamarin Forms, which is the UI library that David had used for his Slimy app. And just like those APIs, you can build that native UI once for each platform. And if you don't want to, you just share it using Xamarin Forms. So many developers are using Xamarin Forms. And David said at the beginning, many developers use a blend of Xamarin Forms and native UI. And it's changing the way you build UIs for mobile. So just like with what I mentioned before with some of our native tooling innovations, we're not just doing what the device or what the operating system says a UI should look like and, and what it should do and how you should do navigation. We also innovate on top of that and come up with our own strengths and use those to create a really, really rich platform that helps you write less code. So David, why don't you tell us about some of the amazing things that have happened in Xamarin Forms this year? Awesome. So, looks like my animations are a little goofed up. So let's just talk about it like this. 
Um, so I mentioned Shell, which is the far left there that you saw, um, making it super easy and fast to create those flyout menus, tabs. Of course, you see I'm also supporting gradients there, which we're making easier and easier in Xamarin Forms. In the middle, we have the material design renderers for iOS and Android that you can uh, use the new visual API to very easily and quickly say, hey, I want um, I want the same look and feel for, for those controls across platforms. Notice that I also there in those buttons have a wonderful cake, another thing that we should be enjoying in this time of staying home, more cake. Um, <laughs> And that's actually a font icon. So you can use font icon images as sources for anything that supports uh, images in Xamarin Forms. Super easy to do. And then on the right, I mentioned previously the collection view. So you're seeing a grid there. And these are samples that we have just distributed over the past year to give you a really good idea of how to use all of these APIs. Uh, yeah. Oh, I did hit the right keyboard. That's awesome. So ton of things shipped over the past year for Xamarin Forms. These are just a few of the top level items. This doesn't even go into all the different new properties that are available on labels and entries and editors and uh, button and things like that to kind of round out all the APIs that you may have been missing. A couple of notable things on here, the checkbox, the radio button. Um, and so as Maddie was saying, we go beyond what the native platform gives you because we don't serve the native platforms. We serve you, the customer, you, the developer. So if you're telling us, I need a checkbox, I don't care that iOS doesn't deliver a checkbox in the SDK, we've given you a checkbox, uh, which was a wonderful contribution started by our own James Montemagno. Um, so yeah, a couple of other things. Of course, the carousel view, you saw me uh, showing you my basic carousel view. You can see some even better carousel views here that show some parallax rotations and animations. Javier put that one together. Um, and then just recently in Xamarin Forms 4.5, we've got Swipe View, Visual State Manager Target. Visual State Manager is getting quite a few updates lately, including some new state triggers uh, that are available both for, for VSMs and just directly on your controls, uh, for, especially for dual screen support. And you'll learn more about that later today. Custom embedded fonts are coming your way. So uh, I imagine you don't like putting fonts in three different platform heads and figuring out what's that magic code in the info P list and things like that. So we're making that a whole lot easier for you. But let's go to Maddie because I'm super interested to see these awesome tooling things. Oh, and I guess my Android emulator decided to chime. Of course. Yeah, I mean, a question that I get all the time is, uh, well, my apps are now more complicated than ever. Even though I'm not writing that much code, there's a lot of animations and there's a lot of fonts and images and I have been doing some custom stuff and what happens to my builds? Are those going to be really slow now because I'm doing all this really cool stuff? Well, no, because we have an amazing team dedicated to the tooling for Xamarin and making sure that you are not only writing less code, but it's taking you less time to do all of the steps of development. And one of the fundamental things of that is building, right? You do that all the time. We call the inner dev loop all the time. Always building, A, B, A, B, B, always be building. Um, and we call that the inner dev loop. So that's the idea that you make a build, you deploy it to wherever it's going to get deployed to, you look at your app, and you're like, oh, I screwed something up, close it out, make a change, do that over and over and over. And the first way that we can shorten that loop is by just shortening your build and deploy. And we've done a bunch of work. This is my favorite uh, for the past year kind of statistical jump. When we shipped VS 2019 last year, we were able to shrink builds and deploys anywhere from 20 to 50% in times. And that's for our Smart Hotel 360 sample app, which is on GitHub. But we've continued to innovate in this and shave seconds off where we can and make sure that you have the most streamlined builds and deploy as possible. I know I just saw on Twitter this weekend, the new release 16.5, a bunch of people have been tweeting about how their Android apps are building faster than ever. And that always makes me so happy. But at some point we have to say, okay, you know, there's a diminishing return theory that comes into play. We might have to do a lot of work at one point to make your builds go from 10 seconds to nine seconds. And so what do we do then? Well, we just let you stop building. And that's where, one of our favorite tooling features, the hottest thing that came out this past year, calendar year for Xamarin, XAML Hot Reload for Xamarin Forms. That's where that comes in. 
And the way XAML Hot Reload works is, you saw David using it actually in his demo earlier. He was debugging his app, he made a change, he hit save into his XAML file, and immediately the app popped back up and it changed from his boring flight results page to his list of Hawaiian pictures, which I thought was beautiful. And this has kind of been the um, first foray for us into building these really fully featured, rich, runtime iteration tooling tools into Visual Studio. So runtime iteration is not, you know, when you're in your IDE and you're just making stuff. It's when you're running your app and you're changing things. And this Hot Reload has been, uh, we've, we've experimented with things like this before, but this one has really been one that we, we knocked it out of the park with because we made sure to talk to all of you folks and talk to all of our amazing component vendors and library creators and framework creators and make sure that our Hot Reload was working with your app. So you can interact with your real data, you don't have to do any setup, but of course with Hot Reload, you don't have to stop using the things that you love to use and David has highlighted so many of those to use this amazing tool. And we've moved past this. So Hot Reload is the first thing, it's XAML, you hit save, but what happens when you want to make other changes? Well, that's where Xamarin Hot Restart comes in. And what Hot Restart lets you do is restart your app with whatever changes you've made, but it skips the packaging and deployment steps. So it's a small build, it can't do everything, but it's much, much, much faster. And this is a really cool feature because it lets you plug your device right into Visual Studio, right into your PC, and start debugging, hit restart, and often in under 10 seconds, you're back up and running again. And we did a similar thing with Android. And Android, the native operating system and the native technology in Android Studio came up with the idea of apply changes. And what that lets you do is kind of the same thing. It does a package diff, so there's no full rebuild or re repackage. And it, you restart your app, and you get up and running. Sometimes you don't even have to lose, lose the activity that you're on, the Android activity. But we brought it into Visual Studio. So you can do it with your Visual Studio inside of, or with your XML inside of Visual Studio, hit the apply changes button, and using that native technology but brought into Visual Studio and, and modernized for Xamarin, you're able to use this tool and get back up and running with your Android activity, any XML change that you make. So these are a lot, there's a lot going on in the runtime space. Sometimes I get confused talking about it. So what I wanna do right now is hopefully the resolution of leaving PowerPoint doesn't break everything, but show you how all of these tools can work together. And also, of course, touch on some of the amazing Xamarin Forms features and um, take a look at how amazing this experience can be. So I'm gonna exit out of here. I'm gonna open my Visual Studio. I'm gonna open my Android emulator. I'm gonna unlock my iPhone that I have plugged in to my PC right now, uh, and that's using Hot Restart. So because it, um, skips that like repackaging step for debugging purposes. Once I already have that app kind of up and built, I can use it on my iPhone. I'm going to hit start here on this multiple startup projects. And while that builds, I'm also going to screen mirror my iPhone. So this is the one thing I haven't figured out with demos yet is how exactly to keep my screen mirror alive while I ramble for a long time, but we'll get there. Um, I'm gonna drag that. Not, not just your problem, it's my, it's our problem too. Oh yeah, no, it's all of us. <laughs> yeah. So I'm gonna roll that over and you can see that Visual Studio is asking me to launch my beautiful Monkey Finder application. So I'll open it up right here. I, could I get a sanity check, David, that this is all viewable and yeah. everything's working? I got it, yeah, looks good. So I kind of breezed through one of the coolest parts of Visual Studio 16.5, which is multiple startup projects. So this feature has been here for a while. Uh, the idea that you can set multiple startup projects at once. But we've actually brought that technology and made it compatible with Hot Reload. So what you can see is this button here. Oh, actually, I need to redeploy this on my iPhone, too, because this is an old app. So I'm going to stop this, delete that app, and restart it. Make sure I'm in the right page. And I should see that button isn't going to be styled. But what I can do is when these are both back up and running, I will be able to hit save and hot reload on both of the targets that I'm debugging to right now. So I'll drag this down here, make this a little bit smaller. And typically people would be super worried about redeploying not just one, but two apps. Oh yeah, 
for me, it's like, that would take like an eternity in the past. But look at that. Back up and back running. up and running. Oh yeah. I feel like I should be selling some sham wows or something. I know you really should. So yeah, so this is uh, still the the old button style, but I'll hit search anyways, and I'll I'll see that this pops right up. And then I want to make that Android button look like this button here. So I'm gonna just set a style that I have already, and it is my uh, static resource button outline. Hit save. That's going to refresh. That's going to refresh. Now the button looks the same. So I think this must just have had an old page on it, which is fine. That happens. Um, hot, hot reload is working, is in stable. Hot restart is a preview feature that you can now turn on in the stable Visual Studio. So I'm going to go into this carousel view page. Actually, you know what? I'm going to go back to my home page. I'm going to show you one of my favorite features of hot reload, which is that if I click on this monkey here and a different monkey here, this has got the old button as well. So I'm going to go into my details page, go back into that button, set the same style. And because Hot Reload is just working within your existing running application, when I hit save, this is going to refresh, but it's going to save my state on both of these. So it saves the navigation state, which means that I'm not getting kicked back to my home page. It also saves what actual monkey I'm on. This is one XAML page. This is loaded in, and the code behind this page it just says, hey, send my monkey there. All right? That's it. It's great. It's so great. And this is also awesome because if you're a Xamarin Forms developer, you're probably targeting more than one platform. So what if you want to oh, yeah. see everything at the same time? All right, real quick, because I don't want to run us over. I want to make sure we have plenty of time for all the amazing sessions. I do want to show you. This will work with something like uncommenting this massive carousel view I created. I'm going to hit save. Bam. Reloads. Hit search on both. Search. Search. Oh. All right, my iPhone's not in the mood. It's okay. But you can see my it reloaded enough to give me an error, which is great. Um, my Android here has this beautiful new carousel view, which is this huge chunk of code. And really, most of this code is actually just creating this grid. The actual carousel view is this, and then me being really picky about styling a really nice frame and a stack layout and all that amazing stuff. But just like that, I can switch between my home page, my old paradigm, my carousel page, and this top tab is using Shell. And start testing these things cross-platform using Hot Reload. One last thing before we go back to the slides. My top bar here does not match this blue on Android. And so I could customize this top bar in Shell and make it whatever color I want it to be, right? But I don't want to do that right now. I just want to change what my Android top bar is saying here, what color it, it wants it to be. And my iOS one is already white. So I'll go in and I'll change this resource so I'll just make it, I'll make it the same blue as below, which isn't going to be much better, but it'll be closer. Hit save. And then I'm going to go into my Android Apply Changes button, which if my Visual Studio is full screen, boop, that's right here. Apply, Android Apply Resource Changes. Minimize it again. Give it a few seconds. You can see it starts building again, but it's just doing that package diff. So it's going to quickly just repackage it, give it a second, kick it back up. It's going to take me to the home activity, and my tab is all of a sudden the new color I set it to. So Very nice. Pretty cool. That's all your runtime tools running together. Pun not intended. Kind of intended. <laughs> uh, but when, it, you, when you see them all together like that, they really are. It, it's a whole new ball game in terms really of is. productivity for building apps. It really is. And the coolest thing is that, I mean, like my iOS app, I could have still played with and interacted with while my Android app was applying those changes. I can, it's not going to just stop everything because I want to do something native, but then I can do it in the cross-platform way and make sure that it does reset everything, and I have a lot of control. Um, right. And I know we're, you know, getting close to the at top of the hour, but David and I really, really wanted to end this keynote with a, a big resounding thank you to everybody in our community. Everybody in our community. Uh, we have so many resources that you can go to. David highlighted a lot of them. Another one is this one. Uh, aka.ms Zam Streamers, which is a list that David put together, I think, of a bunch mm -hmm. of people who stream, live stream, uh, and post those on YouTube for you to go back and watch their Xamarin development experience. Some of them are, are framework creators. Some of those are people who make our amazing frameworks that we use. Some of those are library creators, or they're highlighting specific libraries and some of the, those amazing tools. Uh, but all in all, we are so thankful for the amazing Xamarin community and how much work you all put in. It's such a huge part 
of what makes .NET amazing. I know Amanda shared that number at the beginning. 87% of .NET contributions come from outside of Microsoft. That is in large part due to the incredible Xamarin community and all of the con contributions across the Xamarin repos. Um, and, and you are what keeps us evolving at this incredible rate that we're evolving at. So we can't thank you enough. Just want to go out one more time. Amazing. You do this all with .NET. Xamarin is .NET. If you're a .NET developer, you're a Xamarin developer. And your Xamarin code is going to live right alongside your other .NET apps and backends and your critical business logic. And you have the power of the other .NET amazing developers and ecosystem and, and all those tools. Um, and, and this is going to be an amazing day, an amazing event. It's going to be a really big year for Xamarin, and it is going to be an even bigger year for .NET. So thank you. Whew. We made it, Maddie. Whew. We made it. Made it to the end. Now we get to chill. We get to sit back, Oof. go get our coffees, our second coffees. Until our sessions. And, uh, and enjoy a full day. So if you have questions, uh, and James, I guess you'll come back. And uh, if you have questions, here. ask them. Yes, oh, we have time for yes, one. Yes, we will be sending you a free Xamarin plush monkey if yeah. we select your question, oh. which means it has to be a good question. So, so you can't be like, oh, Maddie, why are you wearing a red Xamarin shirt instead of a blue Xamarin shirt? I'm not going to send you a monkey for that. But <laughs> you can ask David how long it took him to set up the pants cam. I would accept that as a monkeyable question. It did not, did not take very long at all. <laughs> All right, so we are back here. Thank all you right. all so much. I, we have time for one David, question. You let me know when I can stop screen sharing so I can watch Team. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> He's got a question. All right, we're back over here. Thank you, Amanda, David, and Matt. We have time for one question. It's really, really quick. Um, I wanted to get one in, um, and we're going to summarize it here. So this is from Patrick Clover on Twitter. So he came in with the hashtag .NET Conf. Um, where is the best? place or what is a great community for Xamarin or .NET or Visual Studio? Each of you, one, where would you send people to go? So we'll go Amanda, David, Maddie. And make sure you're on mute. <laughs> I'll say mine. Mine would be planetxamarin.com, which is a beautiful blog aggregator, open source of all the amazing Xamarin bloggers. Boom. Uh, well, actually, I would say you know Twitter actually has a lot of great Xamarin bloggers, and and uh, Ginny and Jeremy are definitely kind of retweeting this uh, keynote as we're doing it. A lot of awesome screenshots that they've done so far. So Jeremy Sinclair and uh, Ginny Coffee, like uh, definitely follow them. And the the Xamarin community on Twitter is definitely live and lit. Oh, yes. fire emoji! <laughs> fire emoji! Uh, I don't know, Matt. Do you have one? I think maybe I need to think a little bit more. Oh, Xamarin.com is amazing. I mean, the, it's the .NET website, right? It's the landing page for Xamarin. You can use Xamarin.com to get there. But if you look across the top, there are the links to learn, the links to the Xamarin blog, the links to our customer showcase, to our docs, which are amazing. We put so much effort into the docs. Um, David and I know that as PMs. That's like the best part of a release is updating the docs. But Xamarin.com is my go-to for all things kind of just official, see what people are doing. And I also have to mention, David mentioned it before, snippets.dev is my favorite. I always bring it up in community stand-up, so. Yeah, it's fantastic. I think, uh, you know, I, I highlighted a lot of them in the presentation as well, so um, I, I love video format, um, short videos especially, so YouTube. We've got YouTube channels for Xamarin developers. Uh, and of course, the Twitch. Uh, and if you are a Twitch developer, if you're streaming on any platform and you're doing .NET development and you want to be added to that uh, list that was before, please just let me know. And I'm more than happy to add and, and continue to grow that because it's really been uh, exponentially growing, the people that are joining and sharing their knowledge. And, and if nothing else, the chat that happens while the streaming is happening. Like somebody asked previously, what's the point of having a live event in this day when everything's going to be on demand anyway? It's the, it's the interaction. Uh, it's being able to interact with the folks that are chatting. Uh, you know, we're having a good time here as well, and, uh, and we're learning all along the way. So, yeah. There you and go, I, James. I think the other oh, one yeah. that we should just call out, just because there's so many people who are here who have contributed to it, is GitHub, obviously. Um, oh, you know, whether it's people who are actually contributing to the platform or people who are contributing to the docs uh, or people who are just kind of, you know, giving us feedback on the product. Everybody there. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amanda, David, and Maddie. It's an amazing keynote. I absolutely love it. 
course, we'll have it on demand later. Thank you all so much for making this happen. We're going to head over across the Channel 9 studio over to Olia. Hello, everyone. I'm Olia. I'm program manager on .NET team. Super excited to be a part of this event. I will be with you guys all day today, introducing speakers and running questions with James. We just heard an amazing keynote, very inspiring. And now I'm super excited to introduce our next speakers, Javier and Gerald, with their talk on visualizing your data. Hello, hello. Yes, here we are. Hello. Uh, hello. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so let me just go in directly and share my screen. Here we go and get this session started. Um, so yeah, like already mentioned, we are going to talk about today uh, visualizing your data. So we're going to talk about collection view, carousel view, a couple of other more things. Um, I think David already, David and Maddie already um, shared some of the goodness that we're going to show, but uh, we'll do our best to give you a little bit more of a deep dive and uh, show you what is actually possible with all these awesome controls that are in Xamarin forms available today. Um, so this is us then at least you'll know who uh, you'll be listening to. Um, my name is Gerald, uh, Gerald Versluis from the Netherlands, uh, and my good friend Javier. We are both uh, part of the Xamarin Forms team, uh, software engineers. So um, yeah, we are creating some of the stuff that you hopefully uh, enjoy using. Um, and today we're going to talk about these things. Basically, we have a lot to cover. Um, so we're going to have a lot of different demos combining all these awesome controls and features. Um, so try to keep up. If you have any questions, please reach out uh, to any of us. We're happy to answer any questions. Um, Javier and I will switch a couple of times. So if you see your screen flickering or anything else funny going on, don't worry. It's all us. It's not you. Um, and let's get started. I'm going to talk a little bit about the collection view first, and Javier will take over. And uh, uh, yeah, like I said, we'll we'll switch over a couple of times. So whenever you hear a, a beautiful Spanish accent, then Javier took over. Um, <laughs> let's start with the collection view. Uh, collection view is basically the spiritual successor of the list view. Uh, the list view we all know, or you you know and love. I mean, we've all used it. Um, but yeah, uh, you can love it, you can hate it. The fact is we need it in basically all of our apps. I mean, we need to show data in our apps. That's basically the fundament of, of every application that uh, you're using. And um, But yeah, there has been some things with the list view that, that, you, uh, that could be improved. So that's why we came up with uh, the list view. And we've taken all the learnings uh, from the list view and put that into this new control. Uh, and uh, you can use this to show all kinds of data in different layouts. You have more flexibility. And most of all, it's more performant than ever before. Um, so you can see down here uh, a little um, sample uh, where you can define the collection view. I mean, this all works, of course, in XAML and in code, uh, just like you're used to from, from Gremlin forms. Um, you can specify your item source just like on the list view, uh, but now you can also specify the items layout. So you can specify, do you want it vertical or horizontal? Uh, and you can also say, do you maybe want to have it in a grid? Um, so yeah, there's there's already some flexibility that you can see happening right here. Uh, this is all the this is all the things that you can use um, today out of the box with collection view. So we have data bindings, and you can use data templates, um, template selectors, of course. Uh, you can use the different layouts on the right here. You can see uh, the grid layout, for example. Uh, you can use item selection, so you can you click on on one item in the collection view. Um, and uh, do your magic on that. You can drill down to a detail view from there. We have the empty view. So whenever you might mix this with a search bar and there's no results for your search action, you can pop up this empty view uh, without a sweat. You don't need to swap out any views in your own uh, visual tree. You can just do that directly from the collection view. Uh, we also have improved the scrolling. Uh, so you now have an event with lots of information. You can determine how fast someone is scrolling, which way they're scrolling. Um, and we also have the scroll to method. So you can easily scroll to a certain point in your collection view. And this is just a few things, a few of the things that we have implemented in this uh, amazing new control that is uh, in Xamarin Forms right now. So let's just quickly jump into Visual Studio and show some demos. 
Um, hopefully, whoops. There we go. So here we have Visual Studio for Mac. If you have not seen it before, uh, you can just use Visual Studio on a Mac right now. And let's just first go into some visual demos. So I have the iOS simulator open right here. Um, Javier and I have created a little sample app. Now, mind you, these uh, demos uh, are taken from our gallery app, which is part of the Xamarin Informs repository where we run all our tests on. So it might not necessarily be a beautiful app, but it's functional. Um, and we have some, some more beautiful samples to, to show you. Uh, you can style this any way you want uh, at the end of the session. So don't be confused if it doesn't look totally amazing, but focus on what's functionally happening here. Uh, so we, we basically took the agenda and here's all the different things. So we have the collection view, the carousel view, uh, indicators view and all the things. Uh, but let's go with the collection view right now. And like I mentioned, you have, uh, for example, well, you can just go with a um, collection of strings we have right here. And uh, this is it. This is just a collection of strings. You, you hook that up to the item source and boom, um, you have a collection view with strings. And as you can see, this is also uh, with the selection capabilities uh, enabled. So you can select items right here and based on the selected event or the command that you hook up to this, you could go to, to the next screen from here. Um, as you can see, we, we there's a lot of stuff in here. So you probably want to check this out for yourself. Um, all the functionalities are, are uh, listed and uh, you can have a play with this. So the most of these things will also have different variants in code and maybe XAML um, and horizontal, vertical. Like I said, this is also used to, to run our tests on. So there's a lot of stuff in here. Uh, the other thing that I want to show you here uh, that this combines a couple of the things that I talked before um, is the data template selector. So this template uh, selects whenever it's a weekday, it uses a template for a plus for some reason. Uh, and whenever it's weekend, we see this uh, other icon here. Um, so this, this is repeated for a couple of times, uh, but you can easily filter this. So if I just go for Monday, uh, this code isn't really optimized. So this, this takes a little bit and I should press enter. You will see all the Mondays. And if we search for something that is not in there in here, so Monday day, uh, you can see this is the empty view because we don't have any search results here. So it will pop up the empty view. Um, and this is just what you will uh, uh, get out of the box whenever, uh, yeah, your collection doesn't have any items in there. So what do we have more? Uh, of course, this all works with uh, observable collections. Um, so you can just take this and you can see here, we have a couple of controls uh, here at the top. Uh, we also have headers and footers. Uh, I think Javier will show you a little about that. Um, but here we have items and because it's an observable collection, uh, you can observe any changes that will happen in this collection. So we can remove a couple of here and you see that it updates automatically. Um, and and uh, whenever we want to insert a couple of things, uh, it will be here inserted at the top. Uh, I can also specify a different index to insert it in a, a different position if I want to. Um, so yeah, and I can also move uh, a couple of these things around. Um, so you see this, this just um, works instantly, uh, very performant, it looks good. It has this kind of fade animation. Uh, it looks amazing, right? Um, so what do we have more? We have snap points. That's also something we've introduced. Uh, so if you've never seen it before, let's take a vertical list this time. Um, and snap points basically mean that whenever you scroll, I mean, now it doesn't do anything, but whenever we select a uh, snap point here and we set it to mandatory, then you see whenever I scroll here and I set it to something, it snaps to uh, yeah, a certain item. And you can influence that behavior by setting uh, here the, the, the start or the center. So whenever I set it to center, it will center an item. So right now you see uh, two items here, but now I start scrolling. And whenever I don't have an item uh, in the center here, it will make sure that it snaps to a center item uh, right here. So this will look beautiful in your designs and you can make it work any way you want. You can um, uh, configure a couple of things here to, to make it work with your design. So what do we have more? We also have the scroll too, I already mentioned. Uh, again, multiple options here to choose from. Let's just pick one uh, and we can say, okay, scroll to index. So we have a number of items here again. 
Uh, like I mentioned, not necessarily very pretty, but uh, you know, it works, it works. So if I say scroll to index and I say 10, which is not in view right here, and I do this, then it will make sure that it scrolls to 10. And because I set the scroll to position to make visible, it will just make it visible, so it will be at the end now. But I can also configure this to be at the start, center, or end. So if I set this to be at the start, and I press go again, it will make sure that this item is presented at the start. Um, so yeah, what do I have more? Uh, carousel view, we're going to see that later on. MP view, we've already seen that a little bit, and selection as well. Uh, but let's just quickly dive into this one. We have multiple selection modes. So you can have single or multiple selections here, or none, uh, which is also a possibility. So right now, I can't select anything. But when I set it to single, then you can select one of the options here. You can see that also works in the grid layout. Uh, and you can see here all the uh, info coming in from the event. Um, and we can also do multiple. So right now you see that I have a selection of multiples. Um, I would go into the code right here, but I see that I'm taking up uh, some time already. So I think I'll just hand it off to Javier right now, and Javier can then show a little bit of code um, and dive into that. So Javier, take it away. I will try. So let's continue with more stuff about uh, collection view, because in fact, we have a crazy amount of, of samples. So I don't know exactly where you, do you live uh, the the sample let me execute in this case using android i think that you use it ios so let's see some stuff from yeah so i i, I knew you were going to show uh, i'll just talk while you get this running um i, I knew you were going to show android so just i mean it's all xamarin forms right so Whatever we implemented, uh, you can do this on Android whenever the emulator works, and you can do it on iOS, and it will both show uh, similar results, right? So, uh, yeah, that's exactly. that's why I chose to do it on iOS. So I think that I have a problem with the simulator. I don't know why it's not working. Anything? All right, you want me to just continue? <laughs> yeah, please while you figure it continue out. with the All demo. Right. And All right. I made a mistake and I, I live prepare all the demos like one hour ago and I think that uh, maybe it was not the, the best idea. So no let worries. me review what's happening here. No I'll just uh, I'll just uh, fill the time. Let me know whenever you're ready. So yeah. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Sorry for the flashing, flashing screens and everything. Um, here we go. Let's just see whatever we have more here. So, uh, what you can do more with collection view, we have had selection. Um, you can also do grouping. So that's also something that you might know from the list view. So here we have some grouping, and I see we have some superheroes in here. And uh, this has a header and a footer uh, per group. So here we have the Avengers uh, with all the members there, and the Fantastic Four and the Defenders and all kinds of other superheroes. Uh, they're nicely grouped in, in a group. Uh, as you would expect, uh, which is also something that you could do. I think we're working on um, actually snapping this group headers here, so that's something that's still uh, uh, coming. Uh, but at least you, you have the possibility to do this uh, groups right now. You can also do this without any templates, so then it doesn't look that, um, that good. Um, Javier, you have it up and running again because I'm just swimming here. I'll just go to item spacing. Um, which is also something that you can do. So uh, let's do this with a grid. That's always good. And here you can uh, specify how much space there should be between the different items. So um, if I just start playing here and I say 10 and update spacing, you can see that uh, between the columns there will be 10 uh, spacing. And I can also do this be between the rows because this is a uh, grid um, view. So uh, whenever I do that, then you should also see the spacing here. So that's that's something that will also give you more control over how things look and uh, to to make it work with uh, with your design better. All right. So can, you got it. Continue if you want. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good, yeah. Okay. Let me 
swap the screen and yeah you talked about dating spacing and then we can continue talking about other stuff like dating size and there are different options here but i want to talk about dating size strategies a property where you can use different values uh, there are a value that is measure files item this means that uh, we will calculate the size of the files item and we will use the same size for all the cells but uh, of course there are the options to calculate the size of all the different sizes and, and as you can see in this uh, specific sample all the sales have uh, different size so what's the difference the difference in this case is uh, related about uh, performance if all your cells have exactly the same size you just calculate uh, one time is is something interesting then, of course, as we have talked before, we have option to set the header and the footer of the collection view. We can use uh, simple streams, but we can also use views, templates, and we can dynamically change the visibility of the header and, of course, from the footer. And the last one, and I'm, uh, I think that this this use demo well, don't look very, very nice, but this is amazing. Take a look to this amazing performance. And I want to use stop a little bit in this sample because what we are seeing here is a nested uh, collection view. And that means that everything that we were seeing before was just a collection view where every item is another collection view. So we are nesting all these collection views to create this kind of layout where uh, probably you have seen, for example, multimedia applications, streaming application, and it's very simple to recreate, and yeah, it works very, very nice. I think that uh, we can continue focus on uh, collection view, but let's jump to another control. In this case, carousel view is a, another very nice control, uh, and one of the, very nice points that uh, he's sharing a lot of uh, code with the collection view and by default we get a lot of functionality from the collection view working in the carousel view but uh, let's uh, get some time with uh, gerald talking about uh, the carousel uh, view with more details yeah well you told everything already um, all right, so let's see. <laughs> let's jump into the carousel view. So like Javier already mentioned, it is built on top basically of the collection view. So um, the carousel view is, is basically the thing that you probably know from the web and other popular apps. Um, so most of the time they just show a horizontal list which slides uh, title tiles or that kind of stuff. Uh, so think Netflix. I mean, we're all working from home now, right? So we all know Netflix by now. Um, and you have these rows uh, where you have all these carousel views where you can just scroll through all your series and movies and, and each tile um, is, is a series or movie. Um, so that's, that's basically all uh, collection uh, sorry, carousel views right there. Uh, that's what we implemented uh, here as well. You can see a little sample here at the bottom. Um, so it's basically just a specialized view of the collection view um, uh, that, that has a very specific use case. Uh, so you can use that to show your data in a visually very appealing way. Uh, it's very popular in, in today's modern apps. Um, you, it's, it's more suitable for like limited length data. That's a, that doesn't mean that performance is something that will not work for this control, but it's just more suited for uh, yeah, a limited number of, of items in your collection that you want your users to scroll through. Um, you can use a lot of things that are also in the collection view. So you can also use orientation. You can also use layout if you want to. Uh, data templates will be big for this control as well. Um, and it works perfectly together with indicator view that we will see a little bit later on. Um, this control is in preview right now, so if you want to use this today, you can, uh, but you need to enable it with the experimental flag. So you'll see this um, um, in a couple of slides more for other controls that are in pre preview as well. Um, so yeah, then, then just remember that we're still working on it. Uh, some things may change, but uh, yeah, most of the stuff should just work. Uh, so let's quickly go into a little demo of that as well. 
this should work. And again, I'll just pop into this demo app here. Here we have the uh, carousel view. So this big button, don't forget to forget to press that because that enables the actual uh, experimental flag. And here we have a couple of options. So we can do this in code, uh, horizontal or vertical, and we have some snap and also an empty view, that kind of stuff. So let's just see if we can get this. Um, and here you can see, so we have five items. I can easily update this to 50 and I should have a lot of more uh, carousel items here. So we have a little uh, scroll bar here. So you can see we have a lot of items and you can see a lot of things going on here when I'm scrolling. So this fires the uh, scrolling event. So you can see which item is visible, the first one, the last one, also the delta and the offset. So that's uh, what I talked about before, a lot of data coming in from that scrolling event. Um, also here, the spacing is just something you can use, so you will get a little bit more spacing. Uh, 10 is not that much, 100 is a bit much, but uh, you get the idea. So you can play with that. And also you um, have something that we call uh, peak area insets, I think. Uh, so you can see this, this little items here to the left and the right, and you can determine how much of that item you will see. So it, it looks a bit funny whenever you change this uh, while running, but you can see that you can tease uh, a little bit of the item that is uh, previously or next. Uh, you can also see is dragging, so that's mostly to, to see if the user is dragging yes or no um, and we have some other properties like can we animate this can we swipe this uh, the bounce so basically whenever you reach the beginning or the end of the list does it does it bounce like this or does it just stand still um, and of course also here the the go to thing so you can go to a certain um, uh, item in, in this carousel view. Um, so if we very quickly, so also here, I see I have a tab open for the snap. Um, yeah, sorry. And, and those scores, uh, just if you go back very quickly to the, yep. to the list of samples, you center in the vertical oh. carousel view to notice that uh, it's more common to have uh, horizontal carousel views, but of course you can create uh, vertical ones uh, without problems. Yep, no problem. And also here we have the snapping mechanism. So this doesn't have any snapping at all. Um, or oh, sorry, it does have snapping. So I should just slow this down and you'll see it. Uh, so whenever I don't land on one specific item, it will make sure that it will go to, to the start right here. Um, and I think we I had a little code open for this right here. So, uh, you know, for all these things, we've made it as easy as possible for you to use. So here you can just say, uh, make a new carousel view. You can specify which layout to use. We have some predefined for you. Uh, you might be able to, to uh, create your own layouts right now. Javier, do you know? Or maybe we will enable that in the future. Um, you can use the item templates, uh, the background color, well, the peak area insets. I also uh, already mentioned that. Um, so yeah, this is basically all you need to do to set up a new carousel view and use all these this great features right here. All right. Uh, so indicator view, yeah, that's that's something that is tightly coupled with the carousel view, uh, as I already mentioned. Uh, so if you have the carousel view, you might also know that a lot of these uh, controls have these little dots at the bottom, uh, which uh, shows you um, uh, how many items there are in the actual carousel view, but also which uh, index currently is selected. So that's what we want to do with the indicator view. Uh, again, also in preview, um, here you see a little bit uh, of code of how to, to use that. Uh, we have the options to, of course, do some uh, layout with that, where how do you want to center it horizontally, vertically, uh, but also what color do you want the indicator to be? Uh, what color should the selected indicator be? Um, and what kind of shape do you want to use? So. You can see here a little uh, sample uh, on this slide right here. Uh, the color, I've already mentioned that, the shape, but you can also use a template. So you can also give your own uh, template uh, for the, the indicator. And of course you can give it a size so you can uh, make it bigger or smaller. Uh, so let's quickly jump into that as well. We have a lot of demos. Um, so, my mouse pointer sometimes disappears when I switch. Here we go. 
So here we have the indicator view. Again, don't forget to enable it. This is a very straightforward gallery. We just have one. Uh, on iOS, we forgot to use the safe area things here. So it's a little bit down the bottom here. Uh, but you can see whenever I go to the next one, you can see the selected one uh, pops over to the next one. And this all works nicely with the carousel view. Uh, we can set this to uh, blue if we want to and you can see it's it's still black uh, you can play with the size here a little bit so you can make it bigger or, or tiny um, and um, you can also just pop it over to square or we can make a little Xbox logo out of it by using the templates haha <laughs> this only works on uh, <laughs> uh, on Android I see uh, because this is probably using an icon font Javier um, yeah, which, yeah. which is not but, going to... uh, you, you... Just remember that we keep by the four the circle and the rectangle yeah. because are probably the most common uh, indicator views used in in general applications, in common application. But uh, with the indicator template, you can use a data template and set any kind of content inside every indicator. Yep. So I quickly switched over to to Android, and here you can see. Uh, yeah, we're using this this small thing here to also show the template. So you can load everything into your indicators, uh, uh, whatever you want. Um, so again, uh, this is very simple to just initialize. We have the carousel view, you uh, have the indicator view, and then you just say carousel view dot indicator view is this instance right here. And they'll be linked together. It will automatically know how much items there are based on the item source. Uh, one last thing I want to note quickly is the indicator view is built as a separate control uh, because in the future we might open it up to other controls as well. Right now it's uh, you can use it for the carousel view, but who knows what the future might bring. Uh, so uh, this way we will have the flexibility to also use it for other controls. All right, Javier, you want to talk about refresh view? Yeah, exactly. So let's continue with more controls. And in this case, let's continue with the with the refresh view. So in especially in list, one of the uh, common patterns in UX to refresh the data is the pull to refresh effect that it use a gesture to refresh your data. And below this king of stuff, we have included a new control called Refresh View, uh, which you place like a wrapper in any uh, scrollable content. And that's the, the important thing because you only, uh, you only must refresh scrollable content. And to use it, it's very easy. At the end, as we said, we wrap any control. In this case, we are using a list view around the, the reference view. The two main properties is there is refreshing that is a, is a Boolean that, of course, we can bind and use using MBBN and all the stuff that probably you love. And we can use also a command to indicate and execute the logic to, to refresh the list. Of course, there are also options related with the customization of the control. So you can customize what's the color of the refresh indicator, what's the color of the background of the of the refresh view, and all this stuff that again we are going to see with a quick uh, demo. So I move to the previous sample. Let me go to the. I don't know why I'm losing the touch sometimes. It's crazy. I don't know if it's related with the presentation or, but uh, happens in this simulator in the race if working. Luckily, the emulator boots really quickly these days, right? So. Voila, now it's working. I don't know. Whatever. Uh, in this case, we have many, many samples, but at the end, the important thing is that you can use with any scrollable content, and that means that, of course, you can pull to refresh any uh, content that is using the scroll view. Of course, you can use list view, collection view, and uh, carousel view to trigger uh, the pull to refresh. You can use it, uh, of course, with the gesture, and also, we can directly invoke the command to, for example, pressing a button, uh, show the indicator views and, and refresh the view in the same way. 
Of course, it also works with other kind of uh, controls like WebView. Now, I think that is loading the Xamarin block and we can pull to refresh it. And one interesting point is that uh, in many of the controls that we are showing today, we are some platform specific. Remember that are logic specific to some platform. In this case, in Windows, you can set a swipe direction. You can swipe from the top, the bottom, the left on, or the right. In the other platforms, it only works from, from the top by, the, by default. And the code is very, very simple. Let me just jump, for example, to the use with the list view. So here we are, the list view, of course, uh, being the to our list of items, and we are using the refresh view to customize the control, we are using the reference color and background color properties, but again, the most important properties are the refreshing property and the command. With the button that we executed the refresh, what the only thing that we are doing is execute the same command being the, to the refresh view command. And continuing with more controls, because we had a bunch of demos and more stuff uh, to review, Let's see the swipe view. In the same way that we have seen before the refresh view that allowed to do the pull to refresh gesture without uh, be associated with any specific control, as we have seen before, it works with any scroll content. Now we have uh, an option to, uh, in a list of items, for example, access to, uh, to uh, an execute an, a specific action in one of the items. For that, we are uh, allowing a swipe commanding without needing to change the state of, of the app. To do that, we introduce the, the swipe view. The swipe view allow us to uh, swipe in any direction. We can swipe, swipe up, uh, down, from left, and from right, and we have different modes. Let me explain very quickly the, the two different modes because they are very, very different. We have uh, in one hand, the, the reveal mode, uh, this, uh, in this mode, we swipe to open the swipe view. We will see the different commands, and to execute a command, we need to explicitly tap one, one of them. In the execute mode, it's, it's, it's uh, totally different. We only need to swipe, and if we pass the swipe result, the command associated with, the, uh, with the every item with every command will be executed, and if not, uh, just the, the swipe view will be uh, closed. As other previous controls, this control is still in preview, and that uh, that's in, uh, this, this um, needs the, the use of the experimental flag. So here we have a basic um, demo using the swipe view. Of course, what we are seeing here is the swipe content that can be any kind of, of content. We are here, we are using a, a basic layout with a label. And then the swipe item is a basic element that allows us to set a text, an icon, a background color, and then of course have commands and methods to, to be invoked. And as you can see in the uh, in the GIF that we will see later with a demo, you can swipe in, in any direction. We also have the behavior in bulk that is used, the behavior that uh, will have the swipe view when we press or tap in, in any of the commands. We have auto by default, that uh, means that the swipe view by default will be closed. Of course, we can set it explicitly with the close option, but there are another option that is remain open. And with this option means that if we tap one of the commands, the swipe view will remain open. To execute and invoke any action, it is easy using uh, commands or uh, in this case, the invoke it method. And to use it in collection is very, uh, very similar to the use of, of reference view. We are using inside, for example, the data template of uh, item template from a collection view to use and allow to have um, contextual options in every item from the collection. Last thing we have seen is why before are very basic items allow 
to customize a little bit, you know, the background color, you can set the icon, you can set the test, but what if you want a custom content inside any of the items? Well, we introduced also another uh, swipe item, call it swipe item, item view that uh, allow any kind uh, a view, uh, so allow any kind of content inside him. So you can create a custom content, content inside any of the swipe items. Let's see a demo reviewing all this stuff. Let me move again to the emulator. Let's see if continue working. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. So, well, you can swipe in any direction. You can use it also in collections. And, well, let me move quickly to custom uh, swipe views. This, this uh, seems to be a content view, but uh, if you swipe to any of the directions, you can access to uh, more layouts at, at the end are swipe items. And Gerald and I have some very uh, nice and good looking demos prepared using all this stuff. We have too short time to review everything, but uh, let me move very quickly for all these demos. For example, in this one, uh, Gerald, if you want to talk very quickly about it. Yeah, so uh, this this one combines all the things. So on the top there, you see a, a carousel view with an indicators view right on top of it, and uh, another carousel view right down there. So you can see you can create beautiful designs with with all of this together. Uh, at the bottom there, you probably see a collection view. Um, so yeah, I mean, don't don't let the uh, functional design of our demo app get you off track. Uh, you can certainly create very awesome things uh, with with this. So Javier, you want to quickly show off your your swi uh, your refresh view uh, custom animation thing? Yeah, here? let's show it very quickly. So uh, we can customize the colors of the refresh view, but in this case, for example, what's happening if you want to create a customized uh, pull to refresh effect? Well, you can do it uh, very simple. Again, what I'm doing here is just using the, the refresh view, sorry, the swipe view, and using the top item to use a very beautiful lot animation that I animate based on uh, the loading time. So you can mix all these kind of controls and stuff uh, to create very, very good looking UIs. Uh, uh, we have more demos, but uh, not much, uh, much time. So uh, <laughs> we reach to the end. Uh, let me share very quickly where you can find all these demos. Uh, and there are a lot of more demos and stuff that uh, we have not shown because uh, we have to, uh, less time that uh, all these demos need to, 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 to pass one by one. But uh, you can find everything in these two links. Hopefully it's helpful for, for you. And I don't know if we have uh, questions. Yes, we have just one quick question before we head over to the next speakers. And that is, is collection view have the lazy loading and infinite data feature? I think, uh, I mean, you are able to implement it yourself. Uh, we could probably do in more in that area to to support you um, out of the box. But uh, right now, you can do it with the uh, the swipe event. You can see which item is shown, and uh, so you can start loading in new data. Uh, so yeah, that's that's definitely uh, possible. Perfect. So by default, the collection view has some some commands to detect when you reach the end and lot lot more data and all this stuff. So. All this kind of stuff is, is possible. It's much easier than with list view. Yeah. Sounds great. All right. Thank you so much for your talk. And now I head it back to James. Awesome. Thank you so much, Olia and Gerald and Javier. Super awesome. I love all the amazing features that are happening. Now, I'm really, really excited because live from Italy, Codrina is here to talk to us about how we can actually test our Xamarin applications, our UI, and our source code. Uh, Kodrina, I'm going to pop it over to you and take it away. Thank you, James. Hello, everyone. And uh, I'm going to share my screen. And uh, I'll be ready to start. 
Okay, so here it is. I will be speaking about testing, and I think that uh, speaking about testing might sound something like uh, nice to have, but it should be a vast, uh, and I show you how you can deal with that. Uh, um, let's start with this nice testing pyramid. You can uh, see that uh, at the top there is some manual testing that should be performing on your application, also you as a developer can perform it. And uh, if you go down at the bottom, you see the automated unit tests that are also written by the developers. Some, somewhere in the middle we have the automated service test, so if your application is uh, interrogating some services, you must test also the services. And then we have the automated UI tests. So, um, for Xamarin and Xamarin Forms app, you might use the model view view model pattern that helps you uh, separate the business and the presentation logic of, a, of your application. This separation also helps you in addressing uh, different issues and make the app uh, easier to test. And going back to this pyramid, uh, you can have your UI test on your view as you separate that, and the unit test on your view model. Very, very general speaking about testing, there are some principles that this nice to keep in mind while you're writing your test. So your test can, must be fast, independent, repeatable, self-validating and timely. So maybe a little bit of theory that is also behind the test. So fast, you just keep in mind that your tests are slow, but try to not make them even slower. They should be independent, so a test should not call another test inside them. They can also be repeatable. So keep in mind to not use constants. You can use mock server or mock services. Uh, every test should use assert in order to self-validate themselves. And uh, last but not least, try to mm, not make them very long or complicated and maybe an action can be split in uh, multiple tests. While you're writing your test, there is also a pattern that you can use, which is the arrange act asset pattern. So imagine you have uh, this uh, simple method here that give a sum of two numbers. If you want to test uh, uh, this method, you simply arrange everything. So for example, you create two variables and give it the number you act, so you call your method passing your uh, variables, and then you assert that something is, in this case, equal, so the result is equal to 12. In this case, uh, it's uh, some basic uh, unit testing that you can perform also in a summary and summary forms application. So let's get straight to unit testing. So unit testing is basically the same in each language you might be using. It has the greatest effect on the code quality and uh, should be integrated in the software development workflow. And uh, um, in a very ideal world, each time a method has been written, um, then the test should be written also in order to verify how the method behaves in uh, response to the standards and uh, you can also find if there have been incorrect use of data. Some uh, people can um, also be using the so-called test-driven development technique and uh, in this case unit tests uh, are written uh, before the, the app itself and it's also useful for documentation and uh, specification. And I think um, the next que question can be why do you do we need to unit testing? So uh, we need to test the system functionality, also the test very small part of the application to answer. Um, for 
very complex apps will need to also identify or maybe simplify the architecture. It, it's also helpful to identify bugs earlier and also to avoid uh, regressions. Um, speaking uh, again about the view models, when you are testing your view models, it's exactly the same technique uh, as you're testing any other class. And uh, so you can use uh, all the unit test frameworks that you have been using with .NET and G-Sharp, like any unit, uh, XUnit, or VS test. And so it's nothing new also in, uh, in our scenario. Um, while testing an Xamarin in or Xamarin for application, it's very important to unit test your own piece of code. So it's very helpful to use a mock or a mock queue service in order to create the instances of your interfaces. Um, while you, you're focusing on your um, view model, it will be nice to don't focus on things like bindings or JSON parser because they are ideally unit tested by the people who are offering you these services. Also, you won't test the plugin, but you're using them in order, in order to test your code. From your view models, you should test your comments and your logic. And based on the test framework you might be using, try to use the proper test decorations. So it would be helpful for you to reread the unit test framework documentation. And also is this pretty cool feature in Visual Studio, which is IntelliTest that uh, can help you writing this uh, test. Another thing that it's also important is you can interface everything. So if you are using uh, plugins, NuGet packages, you can add them to your unit test project in order to test uh, uh, everything that you're using in your application. If you're using Xamarin Essentials, you can create the interfaces in order to mock all the services. Like you can see here, there is a sample of the iConnectivity method. And you're using a lot of, uh, of features from this, um, this plugin. So. OK, so now it's time to see some code. So I will open my Visual Studio. For this uh, demo today, I'll be using Xamarin Forms uh, cross-platform application, uh, mostly on the Android part. So as you can see here, I have my views, my models, my view models. I'm using uh, a fake application using Shell. And I added any uh, UD test, pro test project here. I'm also used to use an unit, but as I was saying, you can use your own, your preferred unit test framework. And here, I will be unit testing my login model. So in, to my view model, I have very basic login model here, which has a username, which is a string, a password. I'm mocking also an authentication service. I have a login command and also something that is some basic checks here and also a command that it's fake because I haven't got any services here. Going back to my unit test, uh, we in this frame we are using a setup decoration in order to prepare everything. So I'm using uh, a login mock in order to create uh, and test my login view model. And as uh, doing this kind of session is very like a cooking show, I already have here my unit test using the arrange act acer pattern. So I want to ensure that uh, the username is set. So I'm passing a string to my username. Uh, string variable. I'm calling my view model 
and I want to assert that my username is not known. In order to do that, from the test tab here in Visual Studio, you can open the Text Explorer, and the Text Explorer will automatically found your unit tests. You can expand them and right click here. You can run your unit test directly from Visual Studio. It uh, will take some time and Visual Studio will do everything for you. We'll build the project and run the unit test. And as you can see, everything went green. Okay, so that was about the unit testing. Let's go back to the application, to the presentation. And uh, we will uh, speak now about the UI testing. And uh, um, the UI testing is a very fragile level. So in order to uh, UI test your application, you should only focus on the UI flow and interactions. Because if you've done everything, as I was saying at the beginning, your uh, system functionalities and your service fun functionalities have been tested in the unit test part. Mm. Imagine you have a very simple login page. How would you test this manually? So I have this page here. I have a username box, a password box, and a login button. So for example, in order to test this, I will enter a username and a password. I will tap the login button. And I will ensure that uh, I have actually logged in into, into the application. And uh, the two main tasks that you're doing manually are just locating the element that you want to interact uh, with and then interact uh, with it. And pretty simple, we will do the same in uh, your UI test. As for the unit test that you are trying the logic, in the UI test, you're just trying to verify your views and the controls on the screen. You will also want to check the, navi the navigation between pages and also make sure that some of your life elements are working, something like if you have a button that um, handles some visibility in your page, you ensure that uh, the other part is also displayed. Um, some of you may have used the, the so-called uh, BDD feature files or the behavior-driven development. And uh, some of the QI tester or engineer create these files and give you the, the, the scenario and also some logic that uh, also help you understand how you should test your application. You can use this kind of files to create also your uh, UI test and uh, specify also the steps that you need to ensure for your uh, UI test. Something very important to keep in mind is that the UI automation it's slow and uh, it, uh, it has been created in order to emulate uh, an actual user interaction. So every time you write uh, a UI test, uh, you might also wait for some elements uh, before verifying or something, it's, uh, it's on the screen. In order to write this uh, UI test, there is a very fancy and maybe old style uh, tool that it's called REPL that you can use in order to, um, to write your test. It's this console-like environment that is like a viewport to your application and help you identify everything on, uh, on your application. It's very useful 
when you're creating the UI tests as it helps you to explore the user interface and you have an also an interactive way to create uh, some queries. So, and let's see this in action. So let's go back to our Visual Studio application. Also, I already created my UI test project here. I have some tests. And in order to invoke uh, this uh, console, you can simply create uh, a test that I called Open Repl that will open this, uh, this console like. So if I go back to my text explorer, now that, that I have uncommented this test, uh, a new UI test has been found here. And when I run it, it will open this, uh, this application. In the meantime, I want to show you my very fake uh, application. Okay, that now the test to have closed it and will open it again. Okay. And also the the report is now up and running. So as it says here, your app has been initialized with the app variable. So everything I will do inside here will be just using the app. As you can see, you also have intelligence here. So if you want to, you can use it. And uh, there is also a very nice command that is called tree. And if you launch it, you will see everything that is on the screen. So I have uh, something here on the screen, something that uh, Android is creating for us and also something that uh, I have added myself. Okay, I'm gonna stop the test here and go back to PowerPoint. Okay, so you might have seen something inside the REPL and there are the so-called automation ID. Uh, some ID that help you identify a control on the screen. You can add them on our XAML or from the code behind. They need to be unique and uh, uh, present on every element you want to interact with. So for example, if I have a label, I created an automation ID for my label and now I will be ready to uh, identify it easily on, uh, on the screen. Also, while writing the UI test, it's important to not take everything for, for granted and also uh, trying to imagine every single action a user might perform on, uh, on your interface. Everything that you will be testing are uh, just simple queries that can be written uh, inside REPL just to quickly identify them, and then you can move them inside your test. So very simple queries. So for example, I want to have my label, so I will query all the app to find an element which is marked my label, so an element which has an automated ID, my label, and if I have found any, this is a Boolean, will be true. Uh, other stuff can be performed, like for example, sweeping. I can also tap on something. And uh, something also that may happen that uh, some of you might use a web view inside uh, your application. So uh, it's nice to remember that also the web view can be UI tested. So if some of you are some um, web developers using you know, CSS selectors or other kind of selectors, you can also um, found them from your uh, UI test. Okay, 
So let's try to write the, the UI test for, uh, for this view here. So I will go back to my test. I want to assure that also in my view, I have added into the login page the automation ID. So I have some grids, I have some label, I have the entry. So I have one entry with automation ID username box, the other entry with password box, and I also have the automation ID for the login button. And basically in this test, I will want to verify the navigation so that from the login page, I will jump directly into the other page, which is the home page. So also in the home page, I added an automation ID to an element that I have. I'm gonna show you here from Visor. So everything is fixed. If I click login, I will login into this very funny application and I have this welcome box. So I will know that I actually log in into the application. So going back here, we're gonna write our test. So here, IntelliSense help us. I have this method. It's very usual to name your test something like should be able to or could be able to do some action. In this case, I will write um, a test that it's called should be able to log in. Should be able to log in. I will be using the AA pattern that we saw earlier. So I will arrange the application. So as uh, we already said, everything is uh, inside our app. I'm gonna show you also something here in the setup page, in the setup part of the test page, the app initializer will start the app on your platform. The platform are here. I will be using uh, Android phone and the Windows machine. If you want to test also uh, on the iOS, you need a Mac. So here I have my application. I want just to form a tap on the first username box. have all the common case here. So imagine that I will tap on the user username box entry box. I will enter some text. You can see IntelliSense is help, helping me also here. We enter my username. The same I will be doing for the password box. Here my password. And I will add my password. Very, very secure here. And uh, something that can be handy to do in between these two interactions is that I will dismiss my keyboard in order to be sure that uh, the keyboard will be dismissed and will not hide any part uh, of my screen. And I will do the same after I enter Okay. Then I will act. So I will tap on the login button. This is my in main interaction here. And I will wait for the element with automation ID welcome box. Welcome. After that, I want to assert that, for example, if I have here a query, app.query, on my page, find the element marked as 
Welcome box. If there is any, then I will assert that is true that I found this element here. Okay, so just a quick view here. I've done the common case in right. I have the test decoration here, so if I go back to my text explorer, I see that now I have two, two white tests here. This is my new test. I will run it, and in the meantime, I will open visor. So, what the test will do is uh, that will kill the application if it's running. Okay, we'll open that again. Everything will be loading. Then we'll tap, enter the text, tap, enter the text, do the login. The assert is true. And now I have the other green test here. Um, another thing that it's... Uh, it comes with this UI test project, is the app in initializer. So for the platform Android, I give him the epic app file path. And also I created some, um, some helpers in order to wait for some uh, interactions. You can also use uh, some installed app that you have uh, on your phone, just give them the, the bundle name. So it's very useful also to test uh, uh, already installed application. Okay, so back to PowerPoint here. So we've seen a very basic uh, UI test. You might also want to interact more with some elements inside the UI test. There are, there are some API that help you do things like waiting for some elements that we saw, or scrolling. If you have something like a long page or a long list, you can scroll down, scroll up to a specified element. You can also use every gesture like double tap, or uh, swiping, touch and hold, it depends very much on, uh, on your application. And uh, from inside your UI test, you can also do some screenshots. So for example, if uh, some asserts are not okay for you, you want to see maybe something, so you do the app.screenshot and create uh, a screenshot for that. Uh, specific uh, page. Mm, before trying to write your UI test, it can be handy for you to write them in a natural language and just before perform them manually on your application. And then you can uh, write them. So once you have your unit test that you already have been written and also you now have your UI test and you'll be time to run them. So you can add your unit test to your DevOps pipeline and you also have the pre-created task that you can use in order to run them after your application has been built. Also, DevOps give you some uh, very nice reports that uh, you can use that show you how much have been passed, the failed ones. And as regarding the UI test, you can run them on your app center test cloud. And uh, it's very simple. You just configure uh, your run, in this case, by creating Xamarin UI test. You upload your package. 
the app center will validate for them will uh, create all the devices so for example i wanted to test my application on four different android devices and app center will run them on each device and generate the repo result for for me you can also uh, add the ui test to devops using app center so you have this uh, task you'll need some configuration tokens that you can get from app center so you can also run your ui test directly on uh, your pipeline and App Center Cloud Reports give you some reports also on the portal and uh, locally, something like this command prompt here. And you can also add your uh, unit test and UI test to your uh, local continuous integration server. If you have a on-prem installation, you can create the, the, the task as for um, DevOps. And I think that uh, that was something, just a little about uh, testing your application. It's very important to, apart from writing your, uh, your tests, uh, to keep them alive as the application are changing a lot. Maybe you're doing some agile uh, working, so remember to to keep the tests alive, maybe you can add them in your definition or done or something like that in order to also uh, check if everything is up and running in order to have uh, the best quality for uh, your application. And uh, that was me. If there are some questions. Okay. Oh, turn it on. Let me turn on the so microphone. do I? I'll do it. Do I join to that call first? Oh, my mic back to do you want Hold me on. to just go to your station? Yeah. All right. So my mic back to that. All you're gonna ask is some questions. <laughs> I have the first question. Good. Scott wanted to confirm uh, which UI testing library you were using for the these tests. So I am the UI testing or the unit testing, sorry. So which library was it? For the UI. For UI, I'm yeah. Using, yeah. I'm using the UI test project that you find inside Visual Studio. So it's the summary UI test uh, framework. OK, perfect. And the next question is, Will it be easier to test code behind logic, especially when using dependency injection? I think it also depends on uh, your application, but it's related to unit tests from your code behind. OK, sounds good. Uh, next question we have from Matthew Pierce. Is there a particular testing framework that is considered the best option for Xamarin projects? I don't know if there, are, if there is a best one. I think it depends on how some people are used to do the unit tests. I personally use any unit because in previous projects I used any unit, but you can just take a look on the everything you can find, there are X unit, N unit, and try to find the one that best uh, suits you and uh, which you think it's easy for you to learn. Yeah, just give it a shot to a few and see which one works for you, right? All right, yeah. and the last question we have today is, uh, could you point to a BDD framework usable to test Xamarin applications? I honestly haven't used them. There will be something, I think, around the community you can uh, find. I can't remember the name, uh, but I will uh, tweet it. For yeah, you. just tweet it. All right, thank you very much for a great talk. And I give it back to James, who will introduce our next speaker.
Thank you. Bye-bye. Awesome. Thank you so much, Olea and Kodrina. Um, I know I definitely need to be testing my apps and need to test these mic packs to make sure we have batteries in them, <laughs> which is very important. Now, I'm super crazy excited again to have one of my best friends in the entire world, Maddie Legere, um, talking about productivity and all the good stuff, even deeper than what she showed off, which blew my mind in the keynote. So with that, I'll head it over to Maddie. Awesome. Thank you so much, James. I'm really excited. Uh, welcome, everybody, to boosting your Xamarin development productivity, which is going to be my talk this afternoon. Um, if you missed the keynote, it will be up. You will be able to watch it later on, so hopefully you get a chance to do that. Um, and I'm Maddie. I'm a, I'm a PM on our Xamarin team, and I focus on our tooling experiences. So David, who is also in the keynote, focuses a lot on the SDK and kind of the, like, how can you make a really pretty app using things like the carousel view and the collection view? Uh, and I'm kind of on the other side of that. I look at how we can boost your productivity. And today what I want to go through is the four main ways we do that. And then we're going to look at a demo, which will be similar to the keynote demo, but I'm going to take it a lot slower and, and talk you through how we actually, um, how you can actually set those up today, which is cool. So the four ways that I like to focus on when I talk about boosting our Xamarin developer productivity is coding, building, deploying, and iterating. So coding is hopefully pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Build and deploy can go hand in hand, but there are different ways to boost your productivity with those. And then how to actually help you iterate quicker. Um, so instead of having to go back and code, build, deploy, are there ways that we can kind of skip that step? So we're gonna start with coding. Uh, one thing that is incredible, Amanda mentioned it this morning, is IntelliCode. And IntelliCode works for C Sharp, as well as Android XML and your Xamarin Forms XAML. Um, and it works out of the box. So we, oh, these should be GIFs, but I don't think they're in the mood. That's okay. But what it does show you is that you have these stars up here that recommend what the most popular control other developers on GitHub, on the internet, using the same kind of project style, have used in this kind of location. So you can see this is the top level of a content page, so it's giving me layouts. And this one is um, the first thing in a stack layout, so it's giving me label, button, entry, another stack layout, all those great things. And so this is on Windows, but there's been a bunch of innovation on the Mac side, and I was getting some tweets earlier about, like, hey, what about Visual Studio for Mac? So we, we're demoing on Windows because that's where all of our stream setups are, and trying to do this all remotely is very difficult when there's more than one device per person in the loop. But Mac is absolutely a huge part of our Xamarin developer story. Um, and the first thing that I really wanted to call out with that is our optimized code editing experience. So we rebuilt from the ground up the code editor for Visual Studio for Mac, and it's optimized for C Sharp, um, and so you get the same code snippets and Roslyn analyzers, light bulbs, multi caret functionality, emoji support, uh, and go to line, I believe you also get with this. Um, on Mac, exactly the same Roslyn and brains that you have on Windows, but it's native. So it's using the shared brains. I call them the brains. That's like your Roslyn, right? And your, your snippets and light bulbs. But the actual editor itself is native. So you get things like right to left support, you get that emoji support, and it's blazing, blazing fast. So it is available now. It has been out in Mac. It's the default experience for a couple of releases now. Um, and if you haven't noticed it yet, pay a little bit, pay, pay some attention next time and see if it's um, really helping you out. But from what I've heard, most people notice this instantly, and we're very excited. That's just C Sharp, though. We've also done the same with XAML. And we use the same kind of native editor. So you still have the snappiness and the emojis and the right to left, of course. But we brought over the XAML IntelliSense engine from Windows. So it's separate from Roslyn, it's separate from C Sharp, but we brought it onto Mac. And this gives you all the things you want, like light bulbs and resource IntelliSense, markup extension IntelliSense and completion, namespace IntelliSense and completion. There's so many. Um, linting, what else am I missing? Uh, tag matching, and so that's a really big one, as well as things just like fuzzy matching. So I can type, I can misspell something, and it'll know what I was trying to spell in a lot of the cases. And both of these, XAML is Xamarin Forms, C Sharp is obviously all Xamarin and all the amazing .NET things that you can do on Visual Studio for Mac. But on both, we've also been looking at our Android experience. So we've done a whole lot with our Android XML, 
Um, if you saw in the demo earlier, and you'll probably see it again later, there's things like just color previews for the colors you type in. That's amazing. There's better auto completion, better IntelliSense. There's IntelliCode, higher fidelity layout rendering, all these amazing things. Um, and IntelliSense and auto completion for all your Android resources. And that goes hand in hand with one of the iteration tools, Apply Changes, which is uh, the way that you can apply resource changes. So your styles.xml, your colors.xml to your running Android app. Now you have amazing IntelliSense for those too. So that's just a taste of the code faster or or code easier section and all the innovations we're doing there. But the next one that I wanna cover is building. So building is kind of the core thing that you do most of the time, probably. Um, and, and when I started with the Xamarin team, which was a little bit under two years ago, there was a joke that was, I build my app and I go make a cup of coffee and I come back. And I was like, oh, that's funny. I like coffee, I have tea right here, so we're good. But pretty quickly, we started to increase or I guess decrease build speeds even more than we had been already. So we have the native platforms, we have the Xamarin layer, everything, right? There's a lot of things to build and mobile is a pretty um, slow build as it is compared to something like the web, right? So when I started, one of the big, big focuses was just we want to increase builds all the time. We want to make them as quick as possible. We don't want anybody to be able to go get that cup of coffee. And that really has come to fruition over the past two years. This I showed earlier, uh, but I, I always come back to the slide. It just blows my mind every time. This is point two, so 15.8, which was the second to last release of VS 2017. And then the very first release of VS 2019, the, just the changes in build time and deploy time is so stark and amazing. I mean, if you look at this first column here in VS 2017, it's a minute to do your first build, a minute and four seconds. We take 15 seconds off of that in Visual Studio 2019. All that does is, that's how long it takes to upgrade Visual Studio. I mean, that's fantastic. Um, and we've continued these things. I know I mentioned earlier, um, there's just the amount of people who've been reaching out with the 16.5 release, which is the one that came out last Monday, and just said, oh my gosh, like my Android project just rebuilt in 10 seconds. My iOS project is back up and running in no time. This is amazing. Uh, those are the kinds of things that warm my heart as the tooling PM. That's what gets me excited to go to work every day. And if you do the math out, if you think, hey, I'm a developer, I build, you know, 10 times a day maybe, and that's probably a low ball, and you're saving me six seconds per build. Well, that's a minute a day, so that's five minutes a week. Well, keep multiplying that out by how many times a week, a month, a year you build, and how many people on your team that is, and that's how much time we're saving you with builds, which is fantastic. So on the flip side of building, there's deploying. And deploying, part of it is deploying it faster, right? Getting it over to the, the actual device faster. But also part of it is making sure that you're deploying in the optimal way. So what that means is you want to make sure that the app starts fast, that it's a good size, that it's not this huge APK you're pushing over the wire or this huge IPA. Um, and you want to make sure that your customer doesn't have to install this massive app and then wait 10 seconds for it to start. So deploy faster doesn't just mean, hey, when I'm debugging, I want to deploy faster. It also means I want to make sure that I am optimizing my app for all of the use cases when it will be deployed to any of my customers' devices. And that's where startup tracing comes in. So startup tracing is this idea that we can take the normal way of doing Android, which is JIT, just-in-time compilation, which usually has a pretty, a, a relatively slow startup speed. It's not super slow, but uh, small app sizes because you're doing things on the fly. And then we can blend it with if we did full AOT. And that's the idea that you do everything ahead of time. So your app is gonna be a lot bigger, but the startup speed is a lot uh, quicker. And that's how iOS does it. And then we can blend those together and, and pick and choose the SDKs and the libraries and stuff that can be pre-built and that don't have a huge performance hit and that we know your app is gonna have to use and then JIT everything else. And that's where we get startup tracing. And you can see in this video down below and also from this graph, um, it, it saves a lot of time. It saves over a second in this example here and you only get four megs added to your app. So in the uh, initial case, you get about a second and a half of an advantage nor between normal and um, AOT. And you almost, you more than double your app size. So I think this is a pretty good trade off. And it's just a checkbox. Check enable startup tracing. It's going to start doing this. This is in your Android build settings. 
uh, you don't want to do this for your debug builds, right? So when you're debugging, it doesn't matter so much what your uh, startup speed is going to be because you're just debugging. And you want to make sure that you're running it, you know, the, the kind of the basic way, making sure everything works. And then you can start going into release modes and checking off all these boxes and stuff. Um, but what's great about startup tracing is that everybody's app is different, and we know that. And so we came out with this a couple of releases ago, and we had a lot of feedback for, hey, you know, you you AOT this thing, but I can actually also AOT this thing in my app. Or, hey, you jitted this thing, and, and I, I think this should be AOT. Um, all those different scenarios. Well, we've come out with a command line tool that's going to let you customize your startup tracing bundle, package, whatever you want to call it, and go ahead and say, hey, my app, I know that my app, I've been playing around with it. I've checked this box. I can actually also AOT this, and my app's going to work perfectly fine, and trust me. And we do. We'll let you do it. So that's a really awesome thing. Uh, another thing is Android app bundles. And so this is built right into Visual Studio as well. You basically change what you want your Android app to be packaged as from an APK to an AAB. And this is the idea that you have a, a user, a customer. So I'm Maddie. I have a Pixel 3. The only language I speak is English, unlike many of our community who are so global and amazing and impressive and speak multiple languages and deal with me and my talking too fast and rambling. Um, and I have the Pixel 3 screen resolution, which is a little bit older. It's not as nice as the Pixel 4 now. And I have a certain Google Play version and a certain device version. So when I traditionally download an APK, I get everything. I get the images that you would need for running this on a Pixel 4 XL and the images I need for running this on a Nexus 4. And I get all the languages. So I have this actually pretty large app resources area that I don't use. And what App Bundles lets me do is just get the stuff that I need. So in many cases, we've seen 20 to 50% size reduction, roughly, kind of based on what that end user has, um, how many things you have in the app to begin with. And it's a really, really easy, intuitive way for you as a developer to say, hey, I'm going to package this as an app bundle. That's what I'm going to put on the store. And the store is going to do the work to say, this user needs this. Give them this APK. So again, this is a release tool. Um, not so much for debugging. But it is one of those things that when you think about deploying faster, you want to make sure that you're striking the right balance and you're optimizing for both the debug situation and the release situation when you give it to your customers. And that brings us to iteration, which is where I've really spent a lot of my time over the past year. Um, I think if you've seen me talk before, you've probably heard me say something about Hot Reload, which is what I call my baby. It is so one of my favorite things that I've ever gotten to work on in my career because it has just been so impactful. And what it does is let you change your XAML, hit save as you're debugging your app, and reloads that page. It's pretty simple. You keep your state. You keep your navigation. Uh, your view model is not going to get screwed up. It's your real data. When it breaks, you can look at it, and it doesn't crash the whole app. It just says, hey, the XAML's wrong, and you can fix it and continue right where you left off. It's just a fantastic tool. And one of the things that we really focused on when we were developing it was reaching out to control vendors and framework vendors and making sure that it worked with those things. Because when we had done previous iterations, kind of experiments on how to do a runtime type tool, an iteration tool, one of the feedback points that we always got was, hey, I use this really cool control from this really cool person and it doesn't work with this. And we were like, oh no. So that was kind of the foundation of Heart Reload for us is really making sure it works for everybody. And there are a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of new things coming out in the next few releases for Heart Reload. Um, if you go to the aka.ms slash XAML Heart Reload link, there is a blog post that's our public preview announcement. And we're in stable now. We're in Visual Studio. I'll show you how to turn it on. But there are links at the bottom of that to popular feature requests. So if there's something you want, check it out there. Feel free to upvote on developer community. And if there's if what you want isn't there, feel free to add a new one. Uh, one of the, the big things that's coming out that we're also focusing on that isn't kind of a tangible feature, but will hopefully be in one of the later releases of 60 and 6, which is our preview right now is increasing your reload time by only reloading a subset of the page. So keep your eye out for that option popping up in the next couple preview releases. Then, of course, there's Hot Restart. 
And Hot Restart is another kind of Xamarin Forms tool, but it's not for XAML, it's for everything else. You, of course, can hot restart your XAML changes, but if you have hot reload, why would you? Um, and what hot restart allows you to do is plug a device into your PC and hit restart, and it just re it rebuilds only what's changed and sticks it into the existing package. So instead of repackaging and resigning and everything, you don't have to wait for those steps. And what's happened, what we've seen is that this actually can improve first build times by a landslide. Um, so first builds are always going to be longer, right? It has to have deploy the package for the first time. But incremental and, and, and further builds are so quick. Many are under 10 seconds, which is a really, really good way to get back up and running. So there's also apply changes. I showed that this morning. I mentioned it a little bit earlier with the Android um, coding tools. What we're going to do right now is we're going to go into a file new Xamarin Forms app, and we're going to look at how to set all these things up and how you can start using them how you can start using them today in Visual Studio 16.5, which is GA. And I am going to check my time. All right, 135, good. Since I ran us behind schedule, I also promised that I would try to bring us back on schedule. So I am going to be good about stopping and, uh, you know, letting everyone get on with their day at 2. So this is VS 2019. Nothing fancy here. If I go to About... 16.5.0 just came out last week. It's fantastic. And I have a shell application. It's the standard one that comes when you do file new. And I want to make sure that I have both hot reload and hot restart on. So tools, options. This is kind of your go-to. Hot reload is down here in Xamarin. Xamarin hot reload. One checkbox. That's all you got to do. Enable XAML hot reload for Xamarin forms. Uh, and, and there's the link to our docs right here. This is also where more options will pop up as we come up with new features. So this is kind of your home. When, when you hear something or you see something on Twitter that's like, Hot Reload does this now. If you think it's something you might have to turn on, here's what you want to check. And then there's Hot Restart. So Hot Restart is up in Environment, and it's still in Preview. So it's in the stable Visual Studio release, but it's an experimental preview. It's an experimental feature. And that's in here, Xamarin Hot Restart. And you do have to restart your IDE. But what's cool is that on this menu, there's a whole bunch of other existing preview features. So you can see what's going on across all the different teams, not just Xamarin um, and not just .NET to just gen general Visual Studio improvements. And check those off here and, and always keep an eye on this. I like every time there's a new release, I like to go into the preview features menu and be like, ooh, like what's new? Like what can I try out? And sometimes I, there are things that I never turn back off because I love them so much. So this is how you turn on hot restart. All right, apply changes is on. That lives here in your um, Android stuff, but on this toolbar. But first thing I want to do, set up my iPhone here so I have it. Hopefully you all can see my video. I honestly don't know how this stream is going to work. I have it plugged in over the, the usual cable. I'm going to screen mirror it. So I use this amazing tool called Reflector for screen mirror. Um, and what it does is it gives you an AirPlay code, and you type it in, and then it pops your phone up. So I'll, whoop. it's not interactable, but it is um, a really snappy, like, instant reflection. So that's cool. Uh, and I'll minimize it a little bit because I'll fit my Android one next to that in a second. So I want to make sure I have iPhone selected here. So the CPU is iPhone. If it's iPhone simulator... It's going to think I need to pair to a Mac. I'm not paired to a Mac right now. I'm just, just got this plugged in. So um, I have to select iPhone, iOS project, and then my phone pops up right here. You do need to have iTunes installed, and um, you always are going to need a Mac for development of an, an, iOS or an iOS app. And the reason for that is because uh, Apple has the APIs you need to sign and package your app, right? But what we've been able to do is, is kind of give you this basic app that you can put your Xamarin Forms changes in. Um, that being said, if you change things like in your info.plist down here, um, your entitlements, all of those things are going to require a pair to a Mac and, and a proper rebuild. But for debugging, this is a really great um, tool. So I see XAML Hot Reload connected down here, Hot Reload connected and ready, initialize agent, yada, yada. So I'll go into my views. I'll go to my About page, which is the best because it has a big colorful button on it. Click on it right there. I'll make this a little bit bigger for now. And I'll just change this primary color to B. 
the usual purple, you know. Hit save. Refreshes real quick. Pink. Hit save. Oh, so easy. Lime. Keep going. And one thing that's great about Hot Reload is that if I hit delete, and so lime is now spelled lim, which is not how you spell lime. That's not a color. And I hover over it. IntelliSense tells me, hey, that that is not a color. That's not a Xamarin Forms color. What are you doing? But my app is working totally fine. The only thing that's different is my button went away. And that's because it doesn't know what color to set it as. So it just didn't set a color at all. So I can go back here. I can come back in. My app is still working perfectly fine. But I'll put that E back for lime. Hit save. Bam. And so you can see the screen refreshes there. Like when I change something, I'll do that again. It flashes for a sec and it goes away. And so part of that is because we're reloading the whole page. Um, and it, it's, it's uh, just a visual cue for you that it worked, right? And so what we're trying to do in one of our future releases is get that flash to go away. We've also heard it could be possibly an, excel an accessibility issue. So we want to just reload this button here. So nothing around it on the page is going to change. There's no flash. It's just that the button is going to go away and come back with a new color. And that will not only speed up the reloads, but also get rid of that flash and keep even more of your date, your scroll state, the state that your video is in when you're playing. So like I said, tools options is where that feature will pop up in a few releases. Um, great. So I'm going to stop debugging this, and I'm going to show you my favorite feature in 16.5 which is hot reloading with multiple startup projects. So what are multiple startup projects? Good question. That is the idea that you can hit this debug button and it's gonna start that for multiple things at once. So the first thing I wanna do is check that, okay, yes, my iPhone, it's going to my iPhone. What's my Android project going to? All right, it's going to this Pixel emulator, which I believe is already open. Oh, it is, good. Sweet. So these are both set up correctly. Any CPU is fine for Android. It kind of knows what it's doing here. I'm going to right click on my solution and then I'm going to go to set startup projects right here. So I know this is small, I'm sorry, but it's it's right click on the solution level, not the project level, which is a mistake I tend to make. And this pops up this nice little dialogue right here. And you can see the default is current selection or single startup project, which is my current selection. But I want to click on this multiple startup projects box right here. And so if you're a Mac user, by the way, this is the same it's a different dialogue, but it's the same step. It's right click on solution, set startup projects, and then you actually name the configuration and pick what to do. But you have the same feature as well, and it is equally as fantastic. And what I'm gonna do is go into that Android start, that iOS start. Okay. Ooh, great. I'm gonna check that this CPU is still set to iPhone. This is something we're figuring out why it wants us to do this, but it does. Uh, this is also how we tell it to use hot restart and not pair to Mac right now. So we're figuring out how to make this multiple. We're looking at this experience all up. But for now, just make sure that this is set to iPhone and hit start. And we'll check, we'll give this a couple seconds to uh, just build. You can see that since this has been deployed on both of these already though, this build is flying. I mean, this is almost done, yeah. And so I, another anecdote, if I go back a few years ago, when I started demoing, I remember it was like, I need to build my stuff when I start talking. Because if I have to wait and have a talk track over as a new speaker, have a talk track over a build, I'm going to be so stressed out. I don't even worry about it anymore because every talk track I make is completely way longer than the builds actually take. But just like that, I'm up and running. Hot Reload's connected again. And we'll do that same about page little button demo about and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll change this to purple, back to the best, hit save, and it quickly just changes both of them. And so this works really well also when I want to do something like not style this button, right? So it's got a background color. Uh, if I delete the background color and I change the text color back to whatever the default would be, hit save. This is when you really start to see the native platforms shine through. And that's an amazing thing about Xamarin Forms, in my opinion, is that by default, my app looks like my users expect it to. Uh, if I make a settings page, it's gonna look like an iOS-y settings page and an Android-y settings page. But sometimes when I'm writing my app, when I want something to be branded the way that I want it to be branded, I want to dictate exactly how those controls should look. And that's where something like material design comes in. So what I'm gonna do is actually stop running this app Go to my NuGet lovely package manager. 
manage my NuGet packages and find my material design package. So material visual where are you visual material i'm typing it backwards great i'm going to check that off install make sure it's the versions all match up hit accept i'm going to go add these into my uh, startups here so my main activity here and my app delegate here Let's do my material in it. Make sure everything's installing all right. Oh, 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 what did I do? Oh, my Xamarin Forms version's out of date. That's okay. I file new right before this because I wanted to make sure it was a fresh project. But of course, that means I have to update some more stuff. So update, accept, perfect. Go back to browse, do my material again, visual. Of course, this also works on the command line if you're a command line person, but um, I am I am not very good at NuGet on the command line, unfortunately. So, all right, great. I'm going to go to my app delegate. I'm going to add this change right here, forms material dot init. It's either material or forms material. Save. I'm going to do the same thing in my Android project right here, right before my forms init. Hit save. Ah. Oh, did I do something? Dot init. What do my quick actions say? Forms dot. Maybe I have to do it after. Oh, this is why I need to give it arguments. I love my uh, platforms. Okay, save. There we go. And I'm still in the same multiple startup projects. I'm just going to hit start and let this go. And so what Hot Restart is going to do is pick up the fact that I just added that NuGet package, pick up that change. Android is going to do the same thing. It's going to pick up that change to my app delegate to make sure that it, it emits the package correctly. And so this one takes a little bit longer, right? It has to go in and, and get a whole new NuGet package and say whatever. But it's still kind of flying through. Hot Reload is still on. I'm going to close out of both of these. I'm going to get back into my About page. Give it a second. My Deploy is starting. Go to my Pixel first. And then it's going to come over my iPhone. Hot Restart asks you to open the app on your iPhone, so just make sure you keep an eye out for that pop-up when it happens. Um, boop, boop, boop. Debugging. Please launch my application. Launch. Woo. There we go. It's just Everyone's waking up. It's a Monday. I'm going to go back to my About page. I can still I see have that. I, I can see I still have that old button style. Type visual equals material. Hit save. And so I can't see my iOS one, which either means that the NuGet package didn't get installed or I screwed up the colors. Let's just double check. Ooh, references, it's here. Oh, it doesn't have the material iOS components. Well, that's what it needs, that's okay. But um, I'll just set it back to default and I can actually debug right now that I installed my NuGet packages, not all the way. Um, and switch it right back and it's going to work totally fine, which is awesome. And I don't lose any state. Uh, one last thing I wanted to show before we go open up for questions is how Hot Reload handles changing or state across devices. So this is the same page. This is one XAML page. This is my item detail page. And I'm on the fifth item here and the first item here. And as you saw in the keynote, and if you didn't see it, definitely go back and watch it because it's with monkeys, so it's way cooler. Um, when I change these things, these items stay the same. But what's great about that is that I can also edit two different pages at the same time. So I'll go into the About page on iOS because I want to tweak that button. And I'll stay on the Item Detail page on Android because I want to make sure that everything I'm doing is re reflective or I'm testing two new features at once, whatever it is. I'm going to change this background color to like light gray, hit Save. I'm going to go into my item detail page. I know that's a horrible button. I'm so sorry. I'm going to change this font size to header, hit save. Ooh, and just like that, changes, totally different states of the application. That's two actually separate debuggers running, which is so cool. But that's still working, just like I would expect Hot Reload to, as if it was one at a time. And so then I can go back into my, you know, go back to browse, go back to my uh, 
about page here, and I have the button updated the way that I did it. And then iOS, I think, didn't pick it up because I navigated wrong, but that's okay. Um, but Or the header text is not the right size for iOS. But uh, cool. And then finally, apply changes. That button is right here. It's in one of these. Yes. So I'm going to maximize my screen so that it's not hiding it anymore. But apply changes is your Android resources. So that's everything in this file folder right here. Let me drag this out. In this folder right here. So that includes things like your tab bars, your abouts, your, your feeds. This Amberin logo is an image in here. The layouts, you can re reload those or apply those changes. And the most important one to me is the values. So your colors and your styles. In this sample app, we have our um, top bar set as a style. So this bar right here, this blue on the top of this Pixel 3. I'm going to pull this to the side again. And I'm going to leave this iOS app up and running. And then I am going to go into color primary dark. And I can see that's used for the status bar. I'm going to change this to purple. And I'm going to hit save. Or actually, I'm going to change it to a hex code. I'm going to change it to this. Paste it because I want it to be that hot pink. And I also get that beautiful color preview. And I'm going to hit the apply changes button. And it's building. I hope that means I clicked it. Yep. And I can still interact with my iOS app while this is running. So like I said, it's a completely separate debugger. And just like that, my iOS, my Android app is back up. You can actually see it just applied it twice because I hit it twice. But everything is working as I'd expect it to. I can still play around with my iPhone while my Android app is applying those changes. Um, and it is super, super fun when you're working cross-platform. So I'm going to stop this. 151. I'm doing great. I'm going to go back to my slides. Demo's over. Some links. Um, hot Reload Docs, aka.ms slash XAML Hot Reload Docs. Hot Restart Docs, you might be able to sense a pattern, aka.ms slash Hot Restart Docs. Hot Restart, like I said before, is in preview. The docs are also in preview. If you find an issue with them or you want clarification on them, absolutely send that my way. Multi-deploy instructions. So it's called Multiple Startup Projects. It's a Visual Studio and Visual Studio for Mac feature, but they are linked from the Hot Reload documentation. So you're more than welcome to go there and take a look. Um, and finally, the Monkeys app from the keynote this morning is on my GitHub. The, the app we just looked at was the Shell sample app. So file new Xamarin Forms Shell. And that is all I got. I hear Channel 9 is clicking around, so I would love to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Mehdi. That was amazing talk. And Howard on Twitter agrees with me. He says, great presentation. And he would like to know, what would you recommend to read about all this awesome startup performance in order to know what to pick for their applications? That's a really good question. Um, Android in particular is one that has a lot of options. And we've started to do some blogs and challenges. I know there is a really good blog. I can't remember the title of it. But if you at me in your Twitter comments, I'll respond with the link um, that kind of details what you should do for debug and release. There's also an Android challenge we did on GitHub where we, told, we gave people uh, you know, all these different tools. And we said, hey, Try these out with your app and tell us if the performance actually got better or if it got worse or what happened to your app size. And there's a lot of really cool results and anecdotes from that as well. So I'll link that if you add me on that tweet. And uh, I'll give you that info. Perfect. Uh, I have another question from Gis Liberty. He would like to know, does multiple start projects work with emulator simulators? It does, yeah. So that demo right there was actually an Android emulator and my iPhone physical. And it works vice versa or, or both. So awesome. I can do that, all the permutations. Perfect. Amazing. One more question from Darges. Uh, does Hot Reload work with native libraries? So XAML Hot Reload does not. Um, if you mean native libraries, like specific UIs for your Android and iOS app, XAML Hot Reload is just, just XAML changes. Um, if you're putting things like custom controls or like custom custom renders that exposed through XAML in your Xamarin Forms project, those will be reloaded. But the rule of thumb is generally, if it's not XAML and it's not in your .NET standard Xamarin Forms project, it's not going to reload with XAML Hot Reload. And that's why we have tools like Hot Restart and Apply Changes that can get you back up and running with those. 
Okay, great. Uh, another question from Hussein. Does hot restart supports also emulators or only connected devices? So it's only devices, and, and the reason for that is because the emulator that you use, your remote emulator that you'd use on Windows, is actually being run on the Mac. So we don't, we can't run a, 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 or I guess it's a simulator, right? We can't run the simulator for iOS on Windows, which is why you need the device, and that's how we kind of do the communication. Um, but yeah, it's always something we want to make uh, a seamless experience. Experience, and if you do want to use simulators, the pair to Mac experience and the stability of that is also something we're always looking at and improving. Yeah, makes sense. Great. Okay, next question. According to deploy to Android and iOS simultaneously, when I set a breakpoint, how can I see on which debug context iOS or Android am I? That is a good question. <laughs> uh, tweet me, at me, and I will make sure I have someone on the engineering team respond to you with an answer that is not fake, because my answer is like, you should be able to tell, right? But I don't think that's... A, suitable answer for that question. So I will double check it. I will get back to you. Perfect. Yeah, Rob Wilson on Twitter says that that was amazing. Dual iOS and Android updates at the same time. And he has a question, will this ever support desktop as well? Oh, that's a great question. And I get that all the time. So I know I mentioned earlier the public preview blog has some links at the bottom. The number one piece of feedback we have is Windows support. And I can tell you it's coming. I cannot tell you when because I don't know. The reason that we didn't have it initially is because this runs over the mono debugger. So everything is based on debugging. Um, and so we, we hacked it together and then we kind of productized it. We tested it a bunch. And then people were like, well, where's Windows? And we were like, ah, Windows doesn't use mono. So we've been going back and, and working to make sure that we are going to support Windows platforms. We just want to make sure we're doing it right, which is what the holdup has been. But check that um, developer community ticket on that blog post, aka.ms slash XamilHotReload. We keep it updated. It's currently on under roadmap, but feel free to upvote, um, comment, all those things. Sounds good. OK, just me, Pratik, uh, would like to know what are the specifications of the PC used for demo? He says it was super snappy. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a couple years old. So I have a Ryzen processor, which is great, because the Android emulator, Ryzen, and Hyper-V all get along really well now with the latest Windows builds. Uh, I, I, it's a 2600, so about it's like not the X one. It's it's pretty good, and I have 16 gigabytes of RAM. Um, I have two monitors. I have a decent enough GPU that I can play Fortnite, but um, not great. So I wouldn't say it's a top of the line PC, but it is a desktop. This one isn't a uh, laptop that I'm demoing on today. All right, thanks. I think that was all the questions. Thank you awesome. again for the amazing demo and great Q and A. And we're moving back to James. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Awesome. Thank you, Olia and Maddie. I love all the amazing work that the team is doing. Of course, all of your feedback as well, helping make the product better and better with the features that you need. Now, I'm really, really, I'm excited for everybody today, to be honest with you, but I finally got my good friend Steven all the way from the Netherlands, I'm pretty sure, right? 95%. Good friends. I should know exactly where he's at. Um, to come and give a talk about creating beautiful, stunning applications. You've already seen a lot of things, but this individual's, this man's libraries save my applications every single day, help them look absolutely stunning, and they can help yours. I'm really excited um, to hand it over to Steven to let him take it away with building beautiful, stunning applications for Xamarin Forms. Thank you, James. Um, well, first of all, good morning, good afternoon, evening, wherever you're from. I hope you're having a great day so far. My name is Steven Tewisse, and for the next half hour or so, I'll be talking about building beautiful apps with Xamarin Forms. A small intro, I'm a mobile developer, obviously, from the Netherlands. Um, I've been working with Xamarin for about six, seven years now. I work for a creative digital agency named uh, Thought Control. And if you want to find me somewhere on the internet, you can check out the social links that I put up on this sheet and also my blog, which contains a lot of Xamarin-based posts. 
And I want to prefix this talk with saying that I'm not a designer. Uh, I was in school to be one. I'm just a developer who has uh, an affiliation with visual things. So looking at this title uh, of this talk, I want to highlight two small things here. First of all, beautiful apps, because if you think about it for a second, what actually makes an app beautiful? Um, and you might be thinking of specific elements like gradients or maybe a shadow, something like that. But all of those on itself are not guaranteed to make your app beautiful. So truth is, this term beautiful is, is a very subjective one. An app that I find beautiful might not be one that you like. Um, so there is no definitive answer to this question. Uh, if you look at this screenshot that I put up here, it's an app from quite a while away in time. Um, I think it's somewhere in 2010, back when Apple was still doing skeuomorphism. Um, and you really can't imagine an app looking like that anymore these days because it, it's just, it's dated, obviously. This is not the design trend anymore. We've moved on. We've left this one behind. Um, and we're now doing flat design, I think, still. So what makes an app beautiful is also very uh, sensitive to how trend works. And if we look at, for example, um, at an app that some of you might know, 9to5Mac did a nice article a few years ago about 10 years of design evolution. So they highlighted a few different apps that most of you will know um, and just looked at the evolution of those apps visually. And I think it, it gives you a nice idea of all the different trends that we've gone through. Um, so for example, this one, it, it starts off way back when on early iPhones um, with just a, basically a table view, nothing too fancy. Um, we move on into uh, tiles with very good looking gradients at the time. Um, and we see that the Yelp logo makes an, makes an appearance in the navigation bar and is for some reason subsequently removed again. If we look at some more recent samples of that app, um, it goes back to a list again, this time with icons in front of it. Uh, we also see images making an appearance, which is probably due to technical improvements in uh, data, like for example, 4G. Um, and near the end, we see dials are back again for some reason, um, this time around with better looking icons and we also see the logo is back. Um, so it, it has a few iterations where things are going back and forth between we need this or we need that. And I think you can conclu conclude pretty much that designers are just fickle beasts um, and they're just flowing with the trend and what's hip and happening in, in the world of app design. So why is it that we can spot such a dated design so easily? I think it's it's mainly due to app developers and their designers tweaking apps regularly. So if if you don't look at your phone for a week, the the update bubble on your app store icon is is probably saying something like 30 or 40 maybe. So they're constantly pushing updates and and conditioning your perception of what is beautiful. And then that way they they can kind of go with the trend a little bit easier. Or sometimes they just throw in a bigger overhaul and just overhaul the entire app in one go. Um, we all get mad. We make a post around on Twitter and we, well, that's it because they're not going to change it anyway. And we'll have to live with it. Um, so I think one can safely say that designers keep us busy. And in the end, uh, the design can be very beautiful, but if the app doesn't do what it's supposed to do, um, it doesn't really matter. So it doesn't really fix a lack of substance or uh, functionality in the app. In the end, it's just there to make it look good and improve your experience as a user, basically. So a great developer also doesn't make a great designer. I think most developers wouldn't even want to try and design an app. Um, we just smack some basic labels on there and call it a day. It's good enough as it is. Um, but designers don't think that way. They have a completely different mindset. And I think it's, it's really a specialized craft, obviously. So it's always a bit of a, a balancing act to find the middle ground between 
how much time does it cost me to build it and how good can we make it look within the time that we have. So the second part I want to highlight is Xamarin Forms because it kind of has a bit of an image problem. Um, way back when, when it was released, somewhere in, I think, 2014, it, it was really marketed as, oops, sorry, as just suitable for simple data entry apps. Um, it, it really uh, was pretty basic back, at the day, back in the day. So a lot of the current crop of controls didn't exist yet. Um, and it, it really was the most sensible way to market it at the time. And the thing is, though, that things change, obviously. It's, it's been six, seven years. So people who were around way back then, or maybe even a year ago, haven't been around to notice all the good improvements that have happened. And I think there definitely have been improvements that make it very possible to make good-looking apps with Xamarin Forms. So a lot of stuff was added, and I think also the there's a, a small shift in design focus where people wanted to have apps look native to the platform, and now we've kind of moved over into where apps need to look the same on both platforms. And I think that's also where, where Xamarin Forms can shine. And in the end, um, I think it's inherently human to be more interested in shiny new things. Um, so even though the team might have been hard at work, changing that initial opinion is kind of hard, and people rarely tend to revisit something once they've originally discarded it. And it it's, might also have something to do with the association with the word forms, because obviously that, that kind of screams simple data entry apps. Um, or maybe you have different technologies with a similar name, like ASP.NET Web Forms or WinForms, that people have certain um, feelings for, be it positive or be it, neg meant, be, or be it negative. Um, so yeah, in the end, I think every UI has elements in it that you can use to make a beautiful UI in the end. So some of those I've listed here on the screen. And I already mentioned that it's a, a specialized craft, obviously. So if you as a developer want to embark on this journey of making something look really nice and awesome, I think these are some of the things that you need to look into. You need to start somewhere, so let's take a look. First of all, obviously, everybody needs this in their life, gradients, because it's the most essential tool in your toolbox. Um, and I think you'd be pretty hard-pressed to find a modern app that doesn't have some sort of a gradient in it, be it a, a fancy rainbow or just a simple two-tone gradient. Um, I think it's very hard to find one that doesn't have one. And there are multiple solutions out there to get your gradients. Um, obviously, Skia Sharp, which is a cross-platform drawing library. Magic Gradients, which is all the way from Poland. Um, that goes very deep into the gradient world. Um, they even let you style them with using CSS. Pancake View, which I pretty much built to fix my own gradient problems. Um, and the one I'm most excited about is the built-in ones. I think David mentioned them earlier already. I'm not sure. Um, but they're coming. They're being built. And it's, I think it's great to have built-in support for that. Looking at shadows, these are a bit more functional in nature because they are, in the end, important visual cues for your users. So they help your brain decide what is it that I'm looking at? Can I click this? Um, because it makes things pop off the page. So it, it immediately gives you the idea that you can interact with that. And that's a principle that, that's been around for a while, as you can see by the screenshot that I put into this slide. Um, even way back then, the shadows are, are being used to contrast the buttons with the background, which also gives it this form of hierarchy in 3D space. So in the end, uh, layered on top of one another, all of these elements might not stand out as much if you don't give them either a shadow or a highlight or something like that. 
And I think this is also a, a principle that's used a lot on Android. So if you want to build shadows on currently on Xamarin Forms, you have pretty much complete freedom on iOS. I think you can do pretty much everything from shadow colors to uh, direction, blur, all that good stuff. Um, problem is, on Android, you don't have that much creativity um, to go by. So what happens on Android, if you look at an app, and this is a side view, which is kind of odd for something that's in your phone, but still, um, your app consists of different layers, and they are all lit due to, uh, or by two lights in Android, which have a fixed position. Um, you can't really change that much about them. So all of these uh, different layers in your app cast a certain shadow based on those two lights. I think they added shadow color in a fairly recent version, um, but you can't really influence it that much. The only thing you can do is influence an element's position in the Z axis, so up or down, which means that it, it casts a bigger or a smaller shadow using elevation. So if you want to match a shadow on both platforms or multiple platforms, you need to get a bit creative. So either using Skia Sharp, or maybe you could fake it by using an image, um, or you could just accept the fact that your app will look a bit different on both platforms. And in the end, your, your designer is probably not going to like that last option, but it's an option. So looking at what I think is the most important part of each app, identity-wise at least, um, it's typography and colors and icon usage. So most um, companies have their own little um, style guide of how their brand looks and uh, what colors to use, what fonts to use, and that's mostly um, pointed at stationary or maybe a web identity or something like that. So it means that it doesn't always translate nicely into an app. So for example, also if they use a font which has a specific license, it might even incur additional costs if you want to use that font in your app. So luckily for us, there are a few free options available so we have Google Fonts, which is probably well known throughout, um, which has a huge library of free fonts for you to use. And I think on the icon side, Font Awesome is probably one of the most known ones, but there are others out there. Um, and if you're one of those people that tends to struggle with these type of things, um, you can also generate this stuff. So for example, if you need a color palette, there are people that have made generators um, that just let you input one or multiple colors, or maybe not even a color at all. And they just generate a set of five different colors for you to use that go well together. Same goes for font matching. So if you have a specific font in mind, there are some generators out there that help you find fonts that go well with that one. So that's all out there, and I have a few links to those near the end of this presentation. If you want to look at movement, obviously, um, also very important because it, it spruces up your app quite a bit. So for example, micro animations, they have, um, they're basically just small functional animations that you see on the left side here um, that support the user by giving them some sort of visual feedback um, to display changes to your interface more clearly. Uh, a good sample is, for example, a shopping cart. If you add an item to it, um, just animate it that it shakes a little bit, or maybe you've seen instances where an image of the product is physically moved into the shopping basket by using an animation. Um, and those are all micro animations that kind of help the user in giving them some visual feedback. Another simpler form of micro animation is if you need to show a certain panel, um, you can either display it immediately, so it immediately pops up into screen, or you can slide it in from the side, which gives it that much more feeling of what, that it's an actual element that's coming from somewhere, and that just randomly spawning in front of you. So if you want to do some of this stuff, maybe even want to dive into 
more heavy animations, like the one shown here. Um, for micro animations, you could use something like Lottie. Uh, and I think David also already mentioned earlier today the actual built-in Xamarin animation form framework, which is pretty extensive. You can do a lot of cool stuff with that. Um, Javier, who you've heard talk earlier today, also has a nice package called Xam Animation, which you can also leverage to do all sorts of crazy animation stuff. And I think if you really want to be the cool kid in, in class, uh, you can use these uh, shared transitions that you see happening here as well. So for example, on this sample, the, uh, the moment where that bag of spaghettis or whatever it is um, becomes bigger and transitions into the next detail page, that's all done through something like a shared transitions plugin. So it's, it's also all available on Xamarin forms for you to leverage. So, so far, I've pretty much spent most of my time just babbling about fancy visuals, but not everything in a beautiful design is just a fancy visual. There's a lot of other stuff that go into making one. Um, so, for example, user experience, obviously. Uh, how does a user navigate through their app? Um, the distance your thumb needs to travel to get to certain elements. Uh, and also in the sense of consistency. So if we name something store in one location and we name that same kind of behavior save in the other, that kind of isn't really consistent. So also very important copywriting. We need to make it clear what the context of what a user is about to do uh, is and what he can expect. So also the intent of actions is very important to really make that shine through in your copywriting. Performance as well. Um, if you have a big animation doing all sorts of fancy visual things, as soon as that animation starts to be laggy by just a few milliseconds, it, it's easily noticeable as a human being. And it, it starts to annoy you more than that it impresses you. So that's that's also definitely we need to keep that into account. Um, we also have accessibility. Obviously, not everyone is created equal. Uh, we have people with visual disabil disabilities, cognitive ones, um, and it really means you have to look at the, the crowd that is going to use your app. Um, you can do that through analytics, maybe, or uh, other kinds of user research things. But especially if it's a, a public-facing app, then, well, you get the entire spectrum of humanity possibly using your app. So you need to take that into account. So if you really want to get started on making one of these UIs or making beautiful UIs, there's not a whole lot of tips to give because, um, well, there is no school of implementing good UI. Obviously, you have designers um, who can make something cool, but you as a developer, it's, it's, in the end, it, it's just technology. So you need to be able to put that uh, design into code. So I think the first place to, to actually start is to really get used to using styles, which you can pretty much compare to um, a CSS file on the web but then in XAML. So every button in the app gets a specific style um, implicitly by one of these styles. Uh, so this one, for example, gets a certain text color, gets a certain corner radius, font family, all that good stuff. Um, and that all that's all coming from that one style and it's applied to every button in the entire app. So what I usually tend to do is split that all up into different files so all my buttons, all my colors, all my different typographies, so headers and body text, all that good stuff, um, and all my icons as well into a separate folder or separate file, actually. And then in the end, merge those all together uh, into one big dictionary. So everything is, is comes together basically at this point, and that's your style guide. And what I also like to do myself is in 
your app, make a separate page where you list out all of the elements that you have and all the different styles. So it, it's kind of like a, an in-app style guide, basically. So all the buttons, all the different headings, they're all there for you to look at um, and tweak to your liking. And you can put that behind a debug flag or something like that. So it, it's not directly available to your end user eventually. So what I also think is a, a good exercise to just get started with this kind of stuff is to find something cool online, be it through Dribble or be it through um, an app that you already have on your phone and just challenge yourself to build it. Um, make that same thing, but use Xamarin Forms to achieve it. I think you learn a lot of things along the, along the way uh, on how you can do things better in the future. And I think it, it's really a very nice exercise to do. And the community has been doing this for a while. And I have a few samples of that later. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd just say do it. If you are going to do it, then it's probably important to get a feeling for how to dissect the design into usable components. So first of all, obviously, you need to split it into different parts because you can't make the entire thing from the get-go. So make it into smaller pieces that you can actually build, combine those in the end. And if you see stuff that's going to be reused throughout your app, just abstract it away into a separate component and start uh, by applying some bindings to that and make it something that can actually be reused. So you only have to manage that one component in a central location. And also very important is just to know what kind of controls you have at your disposal. So for example, in Xamarin Forms, you have stack layout, a grid, um, a scroll view. All these things have different behavior and they do different things. And you need to know how you can leverage those to eventually make that design that you're making. So I've showed this app earlier on in this presentation around the animation part. Um, so I wanted to use that as a sample of how to dissect this whole thing. So we actually built it as well. Um, I put the link to the GitHub down there. So let's take a look here because what we have here is basically two separate pages, one being a list view um, that has a, a some sort of swipeable panel at the bottom that expands to the full height. And then we have a detail page for each item. So if we look at this, this starting page here, it's uh, if you want to separate that up, what I did in the end is go with a grid, um, which has two rows which both have their height set to auto. And that immediately raises some questions on multiple levels probably, because um, setting height auto is actually something you kind of want to avoid because it, it takes um, a bigger performance impact than setting just star or a fixed height. And um, why I ended up doing it like this here is because in the end, what you want to do is you want to animate those two parts of the app. So the bottom part slides up, the upper part becomes smaller and, and shrinks, but you can't animate row definition heights or widths for columns. So what I ended up doing is making two rows, setting both to auto and sizing the actual control that's within that row, which is what happens here. So in the top part, basically, it's, it's another grid with one fixed height row and the other one takes up all the full remaining height. I wrap that into a different control, which allows us to do rounded corners. So for example, a frame would work, pancake view would work. Um, and that's just to get that little black background to shine through near the bottom. So it, it kind of gives it that layered feel of the shopping basket being an element that's underneath the rest of it. Um, if we look at the details, it's pretty much a collection view. 
people have talked about it earlier today already. It's set to repeat vertically. It spans two columns. Those are all just things you can set on the collection view as is. And within each item, there's a pancake view or once more a frame, something that does rounded corners to give it that little card-like appearance. And within that, it's a stack layout to stack all the fields and the image on top of one another. So if we look at the actual card, pretty much the same thing. It's a grid with a few rows, a collection view, and in that collection view, you also see a delivery um, price and a total price. And those two are pretty much uh, just elements that you can put into the footer row of each uh, collection view, because that's where you have access to all that grouped data. Um, and if you want to use the actual or make the actual animation, you can use swipe gestures. Um, so you can handle the up and the down swipe and change all the heights of each element individually in there. Looking at this part, which is kind of the, the tricky part, you could say. Um, so what we have here is on the left side, we have a cart that is horizontally oriented. And on the right side, all of a sudden, it's vertically oriented. So you could do all sorts of crazy work um, making the, the different translations of items to, to different locations um, or positions on screen, changing heights, all that good stuff. Or you could simply fake it by adding a second cart in there and just showing one or the other when the thing is expanded or collapsed. So a lot of this UI stuff means you can also fake things um, to make it look the way you want it to look. The details page, it's not that fancy. It's just a basic grid. Um, it has one little fancy thing, maybe, um, which is just a little fade over on the text. And that can be done by just adding an image on top of it. If you bake the gradient from transparent to white into an image, overlay that, um, you, you would be fine. So looking at this demo, obviously we built this as well. And this is how it looks like. Um, it behaves exactly as you would expect it to. So all the sliding and collapsing works. Also clicking different items. Um, it has that transition where you see the picture becoming bigger into the details view. So looking at some of those small things that I haven't highlighted yet. Um, we see here the app.xaml file, which I put pretty much everything in. Um, I talked about separating this out into different files, but for the sake of demo, I put it all together in this one. So all the colors, all the fonts, all the different generic styling. So each label looks like this. Um, each button has certain properties to it. And then we end up with the specific styles which um, you can apply explicitly on certain labels or buttons or other components. Looking at the main page, you can see what I mentioned, the two rows both set to auto. The grid row one has no height, and the second one does have a height, so that's the initial state where the shopping basket is collapsed. And in code behind, looking at this, we have two gesture recognizers that handle that swipe up and that swipe down motion. If we look at what code is in that, it's, it's not really that much to change all the height because basically what we're doing is just animate three different elements and change their height. Um, and all of the other stuff is basically hiding other elements that we don't need at that point. So looking at the sample again, for example, this local delicacies header with the little icon here, we don't need that when it's expanded, so we just fade those out, and they're not there anymore. Um, the swipe down is pretty much the opposite of this, so that's not that important. 
looking at the actual transition of that image becoming bigger into the detail page. Um, I already mentioned I used a separate NuGet package for that, which is shared transitions. They are located in here. So this is the image in our list page, um, and that has two separate properties to it. So the name, which is just a unique identifier for that animation, um, and a group, which tells it that this item is uh, something that's in a collection of items. So a list view, a collection view, if you have individual items, you need to give it a certain group so it knows this is the item that I'm supposed to use to animate. I'm binding this here to a name, but you're probably better off binding this to an ID, um, but I don't have that in my data set. Looking at the details page, um, we see here another grid with just some different definitions in row and columns and all of the items. And we see here that the image says the same thing for the transition name. So that way it knows that this animation needs to go to this image in the details page. And the only thing that's missing here now is which item I'm supposed to move to that detail page. And that is done all the way down here when you actually click on an item. Um, when you do the transition and load the new page through your navigation, you need to set right in front uh, of actually pushing that new page onto the view, you need to set which item um, we're supposed to transition into, which is done here through just setting that same name that we bound in the XAML file as well. So that pretty much sums up that demo. Um, code for that is available on my GitHub. I've already mentioned that. And I think I put this together in half a day, maybe. And it's, it's definitely not entirely polished, but it does show that you can make cool stuff in reasonable time frame. Um, so if my demo didn't convince you, like I said, there's a active movement in the community to create cool apps. Um, I'll show just a few of those to convince you. So we have this one by this very happy man um, talking about the weather currently in Seattle. You can't go outside anyway, so just admire the weather from your window and stay inside. What you could do while staying inside is looking at these beautiful pieces of art that Kim helps create. Um, so both the app and the content of this app. You could go on a cruise, but I would highly advise against that. Um, either way, Andreas made a very nice app that shows you how you could go about making an app for booking cruises. If you are starving, Leah Morris has you covered because she made a very nice looking food app um, to help you order takeaway. And if at some point this whole Corona stuff is over um, and you want to start visiting cool spots in the world again, then Lorenzo has made a very nice looking app to j do just that. And in the end, it, it all comes down. I've, I've said it a few times. If you can't make it, just fake it. Um, because not everything needs to be built in the way that your eye perceives that it should be done. Like, for example, those headers in the shopping cart, you could go through all the trouble of transitioning and animating that, but just swapping into different views might be just as, might work just as well. Um, so if we can fake some of these visual effects and achieve the same result, that's fine. And if you can't fake it, then Probably what you have going on is something that Xamarin Forums doesn't support yet. And also there, obviously, you can help. Xamarin Forums is open source. So if you want to take a look at some of the cool stuff on the UI world that's being done right there for gradients and shadows and shapes and transitions, that's all publicly available. You can chime in with your opinion or maybe you want to help actually build it. So just go there on their GitHub. It's all there. Have a look and let's make some cool apps. So I hope this talk kind of gave you a good impression of what you can do today using Xamarin Forms. And I also hope it inspires you to create some really cool looking apps. So just before I leave you, I want to share this one last sheet or slide with you. Um, 
which sums up all the NuGet packages that I've mentioned. Um, if you really are desperate for design inspiration, there's a few different places you can go. Um, I think David already mentioned Kim, uh, Phil Potts, Snippets, and also Javier's list of curated good-looking Xamarin apps. Um, some of the generators that I mentioned, and also essential tools, XAML Hot Reload, I think without it, iterating on UI is just close to impossible. Um, and also Mfractor is a really helpful, um, unmissable tool to get your productivity up. So with that, I want to thank you for listening. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Um. Thank you so much, Stephen. I love just all the beautiful things that I know I myself can't make, basically. But now I think I can a little bit. I'm actually working on it. I like all the tips. And I love that, hey, one of my apps was featured, so I love that. Um, I want to say, though, we got a lot of good questions coming in. So we got about four minutes left. Um, so we're going to head over. First, we have Alex, um, who wrote in, not such a question, but more of a comment. He says, sorry, James, David, and Maddie, but the current session by Stephen is the best .NET conference session so far. Um, I have to agree. It's oh, actually you. awesome to see not only the great things that you're doing, but all how everyone's building it. Thank you. Um, Tobias asks, is, how do you decide between using Xamarin Forms or using like a traditional um, storyboard or Android XML when you need to do UI work like this? Um, well, it, it kind of depends. Um, in my case, I usually tend to go with Xamarin Forms, um, mainly because I'm usually working for people that actually want an app on both platforms. Um, and it, it would just cost way more in the end if it's, if it, it depends, obviously. If it's a simple animation or a simple thing that we need to build, um, Xamarin Forms is definitely the way to go, but also for complexer stuff. But it, it, in our case, we are all Xamarin Forms developers. So we don't really have um, very intimate Android and iOS specific knowledge. So it 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 kind of also depends on the composition of your team, I guess. Gotcha. That makes sense, especially if you're coming from a, I guess, traditional iOS or Android stack, you might be more comfortable using some of that UI. Yeah, and and you have it available to you because, well, in the end, you can just always go the custom renderer route or custom control and all that kind of stuff. So you can drop down just that one level to native Got if it. you need to. All right, we have one another question here from Bala uh, who asks, um, Stephen, can we move all of the code behind that you showed to XAML? If not, um, what can only be handled in the code behind? It's a good question. I, uh, I that recently is a good question. did yes. a whole podcast on this. <laughs> um, I think uh, the, the XAM animation package that I mentioned uh, uses a lot of behavior kind of stuff to do um, all these translations and some of these animations. So you could uh, look into making it actually behaviors instead of code behind. Um, Obviously, those behaviors would need to be coded, but uh, I think it, it could work. All right, cool. Yeah, I agree with that. Sometimes you just got to write a little bit of code behind, right? That happens. <laughs> it, it happens, yeah. And especially if it's just visual code, so stuff that happens on the UI, it, it mm -hmm. doesn't need view models or anything like that. I think you're, you're perfectly fine putting it in the backing code of the XAML page. Makes sense if it's like an interaction with the UI, got it. Here's a good one from Greg L. Um, this one is about accessibility. So he says he's loving these micro animations. They look fantastic. He's like, are they ADA compliant? So, a, you know, like A11Y uh, um, 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 accessibility wise. I guess that would be any application, not just a Xamarin app, but traditional iOS, Android, anything. Like when it comes to animations, I mean, if you know anything about the accessibility part there? Um, I personally am not a, a big uh, source of knowledge on accessibility, but um, I do know that, for example, the designer that I work with in our company, um, he really does design things also with accessibility in mind. So modern design tools like Figma, for example, mm -hmm. um, they all have these different modes, for example, different colorblind uh, types, and you just see your entire mock-up immediately as 
someone who has a certain type of color blindness. Um, so I also think it's a somewhat of a design um, decision in or, or a task that falls to a designer more so than a developer, um, especially when it comes to colors and, and visual um, disabilities, obviously. Um, but if you look at code, things like text-to-speech and, and that kind of stuff, that's obviously things we have, as developers can add. Um, but it also depends on whether or not your client wants to add it, I guess, if he wants to allocate budget for it. Gotcha. That makes sense. Now I have a last one here for you before we head over to the next session with Rodney. Um, it's from our good friend Hector uh, on Twitter. It says, best Xamarin UI UX talk I've seen in a long time from Steven. Great work and all the emojis. Thank you so much. And Steven, thank you so much um, for this amazing session. And of course, all these sessions are recorded and will be on demand. Thank you, Steven, so much. Have a go on. Yes, thank you. All right, we're head back over to Olio right now for the next session. All right, and I'm very excited to introduce the next speaker. It's Rodney, who will tell us about going React with React extensions and UI. So, Rodney. How you doing? Uh, welcome to .NET Conf, and uh, today we'll be talking a little bit about going reactive uh, with reactive extensions and reactive UI. So let me load my presentation and share my screen, sharing my desktop, sharing the PowerPoint, and off we go. So <clears throat> I am a maintainer of reactive UI. I'm sorry, going reactive. So I'm Rodney. <clears throat> I'm a maintainer of reactive UI. Uh, I'm a .NET Foundation member and I'm a Microsoft MVP. And today I'll be talking to you about going reactive with reactive extensions, reactive UI, and why you would want to use that in a mobile application. I'm gonna start with a brief history lesson, uh, some concerns that mobile developers face, um, a little bit of a demo, a shameless plug, and give you some takeaways at the end. I am sharing. It says share desktop. Hold on. Desktop. Are we, now can we see my screen? Okay, and you can hear me now too, yes? All right. Wonderful. So I won't bore you again, but I'm Rodney. That's me. Here we go. <clears throat> so in 2007, uh, .NET 3.5 landed, and with it brought link, uh, language integrated queries. Um, that was C-sharp's first step towards adding functional elements to the language. It allowed uh, SQL-style functions to be parsed over collections like objects, SQL, and XML. Uh, 2009, Rx.net was created. Uh, Eric Mayer and Wes Dyer pretty much broke the world. Uh, while working at Microsoft, they stumbled upon a monad, and they realized that if there were pull-based collections, that there had to be push-based collections. In 2010, Anais Betts created some extension methods uh, using reactive extensions for MVVM in .NET applications. So the interfaces that you see are first-class citizens in the .NET space, right? On the right, you see your I enumerable and your I enumerator, and on the left, you see I observable and I observer. Um, when you traverse a list in, in .NET, you are using the I enumerator interface to get the current node, to move to the next node, or to reset to the initial position of the list. Um, and that creates a pull-based collection. Uh, it pulls in a certain amount of data and doesn't change unless you explicitly mutate it. Um, if you've ever seen the yellow squiggly that says multiple possible enumerations, this happens because the enumerator could reset once the list mutates. And if you're not explicitly to listing, uh, you'll, you'll end up starting back at the beginning of the list and having extra traversals of the list. iObservable is a push-based collection. This works well with technologies like SignalR, real-time events, and uh, asynchronous programming. 
the observable allows you to subscribe, which basically allows any observer of the observable to process and read values from that list. Uh, an observable is really a collection of things over a span of time. You have on completed, which is a notification that lets you know that there are no more elements coming on the list. And on error, so if the list errors in the middle of processing, you'll be able to catch the error and handle it accordingly. And on next, where you can explicitly act on whatever the next value is on the list. I want to point out that this is similar to the Gang of Four publish subscribe pattern. Um, and a great example of, of an observable is a Twitter stream. Uh, you have many people watching the stream. You have stream constantly updating and pushing new data to it. Um, and all subscribers have the opportunity to act on any value pushed to that stream. So I know most people think that reactive extensions is this evil wizardry. And I will tell you that I've had people look at the code and say, it looks like magic. And I'll tell you, I agree, it is magic, but it's composable. You can compose parts of queries the same way you could do with an I enumerable and branch various observers to do different things at different positions in the query execution. It's declarative, so you declare what the code should do and it will just do it. It's reactive when the state changes, the code will just fire off and it's readable. Uh, it's very human readable because it uses link operators. Um, reactive extensions themselves are across a lot of different languages. Java, Go, Swift, JavaScript, Kotlin, and PHP. Even PHP uses reactive extensions. But reactive extensions is really all about collections. So I've got a quick video that I want to play that kind of explains what I want or what I think reactive extensions are. <clears throat> and I know that there's no audio for this video, but this is a very good point. And I'll go ahead and pause because we've just erred, as you can see. <laughs> we've hit the on error condition. Um, in this example, uh, the conveyor belt is basically the observable. It's a collection of things that are happening over time. The chocolates represent events or tasks that are happening, and Lucy is an observer of that observable. She's able to pick chocolates off the conveyor belt and act on them. She's able to put them back on the conveyor belt. Um, and this is a great example to me because events happen fast. Uh, we need to respond fast, and maybe we need to group the events, maybe we need to batch the events, and maybe we need multiple people observing the events in order for them to be successful. So, I'll go. <clears throat> so what does this have to do with Xamarin and mobile? As mobile developers, we respond to events. Um, we are constantly using the commanding pattern to create event handlers that will do work in our view models. Uh, we're trying to avoid memory leaks. We have limited resources. Uh, we have a managed runtime that we have to deal with in Xamarin. And iOS, as many of us probably have already seen, will crash your application if you exhaust the memory that's available. It's also recommended that we use Xamarin Profiler before every release, but let's be honest, who does that? You know, you just wait for the inevitable crash, and then you go look for logs and try and scramble and figure out what's going on so you can push an update to your application. Uh, asynchronously loading data. Um, we need to load data when the page loads because unlike web, there is no global application state. So when the page loads, we need to call out to an API and get more data. And we have to handle disconnected state. No internet, no problem. Your application still has to function and it still has to work in a disconnected state, and you as the developer have to respond to that state change. So how many of us have ever seen this? <clears throat> this is a basic Xamarin search bar with a text changed event handler, and we're providing it some delegate. The problem with this is that the delegate isn't cached. So if the delegate isn't cached, you can't properly dispose of the delegate. And because there's no explicit reference in memory to the, to the delegate, the garbage collector won't recrane that memory. So what happens? It leads to memory leaks. 
the three main things that I think developers need when handling events are event handlers, which are basically callbacks. Uh, callbacks, you can do separately if you want to, and then deallocation. Um, and I think deallocation is the thing that we struggle with most because it's a question of how do we properly dispose of objects. So what if I told you that this is basically link over an event stream? System.reactive provides a way to convert events to observables. This is effectively link over events, just like you would have link over objects, just like you would have link over an I enumerable, you can have link over an I observable. Um, this particular code sample will delay the processing on a set of events it will process this off the main thread, which is important for Xamarin developers, because if we do too much processing on the main thread, the main thread will lock and our application will crash. Uh, it allows us to select the state, only select state that has changed, verify that there is an actual value to process. It's, we're also telling the code to return to the main thread when we're done executing. We can invoke a delegate, and then we can easily dispose of this entire process when we clean up our view bindings. So let's look at some code. Mm, that's not the right one. There we go. Let's close that down. And look at some code. So first I'll talk about what you do in a non-reactive scenario. In a non-reactive scenario, you would create some search bar, which is just a Xamarin form search bar with a text changed event, and you would give it some hopefully cached delegate. Then you would have to explicitly dispose of that cached delegate at some point in the future using the dispose method. Standard I disposable. The problem comes in with this delegate itself. If you'll notice, we are responding to every single text changed event that happens during execution, which means every time the, the user of your application types in a letter, we have to then go execute our search command. This can become process intensive. It can lead to too much HTTP traffic over a very small pipe, um, and, it, and it doesn't lend to a great user experience. Now you can write your own code around it and write a buffer and do all of, all of these things, but that's additional code that you have to maintain and hopefully unit test. But in a reactive scenario, <clears throat> I can take my event, my text change event, and wrap it in an observable. So the system.reactive allows us to take an observable from an event, provide an event handler, allocate and deallocate memory all in one succinct block of code. So now, again, I said earlier that observables are composable. I've now composed an observable of text changed event arcs. I'm again going to Okay, let's see if we can do that. I think it's control. Yeah, I'm hitting the command plus and it's not doing the thing. Let's just go ahead and, and let's go to preferences and bump font, which I had it set. So let's look at where's font, text editor, general, right below key bindings, key bindings, key bindings, fonts. So let's set to the font. Let's set to size 18, see if that works better. Okay. I guess not. Okay, let's try 24 then. All right, is that better? Hopefully. Let's hope that that's better. Okay, good. So again, what we're doing is throttling and saying we only want to process events 750 milliseconds after the user stops typing. And we explicitly want to look at these events on a different thread than the main thread. Uh, we're selecting, we're exp 
explicitly making sure that it's distinct and that it won't change. Uh, we're selecting it out and then we're processing it. So let's go ahead and run this code and that way I can show you that it's not really magic, it's just a different way to look at pro programming. So, all right, that's all good stuff. Let me pull up. All right, so I have a standard search bar and this is plugged up to a DuckDuckGo implementation so I can get information from the web. So I'll go ahead and start typing in Xamarin. As you see, I'll execute the search query. Well, there we go. Now it's doing special things. <laughs> I'll execute the query. It'll happen twice, but there's a reason for that, which I'll get to later. Um, and you'll see that I've got a list of responses. Now I want to point out that, again, I said it's, there's a distinct until change on it. So if I go back and hit N again, you'll notice that the search query doesn't get executed again. But to prove that I'm not a liar, I'll fat finger it. And now you'll see that the query execution is actually happening again. Now it shouldn't provide any actual values, but this shows that we can defer execution of events that happen from our UI toolkit, being Xamarin, and not have to process everything. We can use link that we know and love and have been using since 2007 to functionally react to code, or better yet, functionally react to what the user is providing us. So I'll go ahead and change it again so we can watch the search query execute. All right. And I'll go back to the code again because I want to point out a couple of things. A lot of people will say, and I say myself, that this is a lot of boilerplate code. And I agree with you 100%. So the reason why my search query was running twice is because of this chunk of code right here. This is an actual X name to the search bar in my XAML, and I am using a package called Pharmacist, which is under the Reactive UI umbrella. It was created by uh, Glenn Watson about a year or so ago. And what it does is takes all of this boilerplate code that it takes in order to wrap events and does it for you. So anything in the Xamarin UI toolkit that has an event gets wrapped using this events. So all I have to do is name my, my element, look at the events on it, and then I get an observable that is the text change events for that particular uh, UI element. And this cuts down on a lot of time. It cuts down on a lot, writing a lot of boilerplate code, and it is very makes it very simple to start getting in and using link to events. Um, so we'll go ahead and go back. So the other thing that observables are, observables are asynchronous. They are awaitable. Um, you can use the async and await syntax. They can be scheduled on specific threads. Uh, so not just configure await false, we can actually say, use it on the task pool scheduler, do it on the immediate scheduler, do this on the UI thread, um, and they just emit values over time asynchronously. Um, they are awaitable, like I said, because you can actually use it with the TPL that you're used to, so the async and await operators are valid with observables. Um, and observables, they return iDisposable. Um, iDisposable is important because it allows us to clean up resources. Again, we're trying to prevent memory leaks. Um, the reactive extensions provide a way to model asynchronous programming and dispose of their resources very cleanly in a way that the task parallel library does not. But you can use it with the task parallel library. And if you've been programming as long as I have, you remember the old wild, wild west where you had callbacks and commands and delegates all over your code. And you didn't know where anything was or what was going on and it was very spaghetti. <clears throat> so as a Xamarin developer, how many times have you had to load data asynchronously? Or load data when the page or the view model is created? Or load data to a list view? Um, Reactive UI has an interesting story for loading data. There's no need for async void in your constructor. It's bad, don't use it. Um, there's no need for doing any type of asynchronous programming in your constructor. 
we can actually load data in response to the view model's initialization. Further, I'll say that dynamic data has an interesting story for view model creation. Um, it provides lists and dictionary style collections, and dynamic data is another library in our ecosystem. Um, it allows you to propagate changes from the, the list uh, as, a, as a set of chain sets. Uh, it has standard link operators, and it also has some custom filter and transform operators. And candidly, dynamic data is everything I wanted observable collection to be, but it just never really panned out. So let's go look at some more code. And first, I want to pull up what you'll normally see, in a, or at least what I've seen in a lot of Xamarin applications, uh, Xamarin applications that I've inherited, um, things that I did before I found reactive extensions and reactive UI. Uh, but I did this, which is very common. I use async void because a task return type will immediately cause type issues. And this works. But there's a problem. Async void is not actually good for our code because void is the absence of a return type. Um, and the TPL doesn't actually give us an aggregation of the errors in the event that the task fails somewhere along the way. So an alternative way is this code right here. What I'm basically doing here is using reactive UI, one of the extension methods that was originally created as part of the library. And I'm saying when there's a value in the view model. So anytime that the view model has a value and the view model is not null, I'm going to explicitly change it out to a notification because all I want is a notification that it's happening. I don't actually want to process on the on the change itself. I'm going to look at it on the main thread and I'm going to invoke a command. And then again, I'm going to dispose it with my nice view disposal bindings. So what this does is allows us to lift the the concern of creating an asynchronous task in our constructor and when the view loads and it creates its binding context, it will then go and generate the call and get the data. Uh, this is an extremely useful use case. Uh, this is probably one of the use cases that attracted me to reactive extensions and reactive UI because I was doing a lot of async void and then I read that async void is bad and I had no idea how to do it because constructors don't allow for asynchronous methods. Uh, and I wanted a way to load the data when the view model is loading. So I'm going to segue into pointing out that this data load is basically just an implementation of a SignalR connection hub. Um, I don't have it wired up to an actual connection right now because demos are hard and I didn't want to accidentally break the world. Uh, but you can see here in this class that the mock that I have is going to respect the exact same interface or abstract class. And what I'm going to do here in a real scenario is I'm going to connect using the connection string. I'm going to create my hub builder with that connection string. And whenever a value is pushed to me from SignalR, I'm going to add it to my dynamic data cache. But the way I'm going to do it is a little bit off. I'm not exactly going to put it directly into my cache because, again, I'm trying to separate my concerns. I'm using a subject, which is both iObserver and iObservable, and I'm going to push data onto my stream using the onNext method that we saw earlier. So effectively, what I'm going to do is anytime something gets pushed from signal R, I'm just going to tick a new value on my observable. This is asynchronous, and it's relatively easy to set up. So let's go look at the, the view model itself. The view model is going to have an injected iOrder service, which is going to have a connection hub client in it. And all I'm going to do is look at my observable cache, which is the dictionary implementation in dynamic data, and I'm going to connect, publish, and ref count, which these things are beyond the scope of this talk. I've got a blog post somewhere where I talked about these things. And then I'm just going to transform my DTO to my list view item. 
and this is very clean and very straightforward versus some of the code that I've seen in my past where I've got a function and in the middle of the function I'm newing up some data and then I'm newing up a view model but only certain times. What this does is allows us to react to the fact that values are being pushed to us and then transform those values and, and display them on screen. I'm going to bind out to a read-only observable collection, which is just a fancy observable collection, which is then bound to my view, and everything is going to be great. So let's go ahead and run this code. Let's see, that's no reactive, so let's close that. And let's execute the thing. So the usual business domain that I use for demonstrations and code samples is coffee because I drink a lot of coffee and I like coffee. Uh, so what you'll see here is basically just a list of orders that are being generated from a mock that are being pushed to my code. And as you see, the view model is just updating. So every time a value is pushed to the, uh, to the, to the source cache, I am basically transforming it out. It's getting bound out to my read-only observable collection and automatically getting populated in my list view. So I've got it set right now to push me one maybe every 750 milliseconds. But you can imagine using something like this for uh, any type of signal R, any type of real-time eventing, any type of processing where you are going to be getting a stream of values that you need to process. And let's go back over here. So we get to the part where I'm going to do some shameless plugging. Um, this is the Reactive UI team. We are part of the .NET Foundation. Um, there's some alumni team down at the bottom, as you can see, uh, people who I've learned from and continue to learn from. Um, but the main thing that I want to talk about now is kind of some of Oh, sorry. What I want to talk about is where we can actually be used. Um, we have packages that are usable in Xamarin.Forms. We actually wrap Xamarin Essentials, um, and Xamarin.Android, Xamarin iOS, Xamarin Mac, Tizen. Uh, we even actually have Blazor support. So we are found in any place that you would want to use Xamarin to develop a mobile app, you can use Reactive UI. If you want to do it at a Xamarin Android level and you want to do a Xamarin Android project, Reactive UI can support you. If you want to do Xamarin Mac, Reactive UI can support you. So now I'll talk about some of the shameless plugging and uh, some of the takeaways. So Reactive UI is just MVVM niceties on top of your UI toolkit. Most of the magic comes from reactive extensions. Um, and a better understanding of reactive extensions will help your understanding of how to get more value out of reactive UI. Pharmacist, which is the logo on the left, is a clean way to cut down on boilerplate so that you can use link to events and wrap and dispose of your event handlers easily and cleanly. It works at compile time, so you have all of the niceties around compile time. Uh, and it's a very simple way to get started with reactive extensions. Dynamic data, um, again, it's what I thought observable collection should have been when I first started. Uh, it allows for encapsulation of the data logic, so you can actually lift a lot of your data logic out of your view model and put it in the service and just allow dynamic data to present the data to your view model. It will clean up a lot of code. It'll make things a lot more testable and a lot easier for you to deal with. Some of the main things that I see when people approach reactive extensions and reactive UI is that they want to use reactive UI without actually adopting reactive programming. Uh, you can do this, but you would be leaving a lot of value on the table. People won't approach it because it's functional and functional has a very negative connotation in the .NET space. But the main thing I see is once people understand that it's really just link over events and they start using it and see the power of it, they won't want to do anything else. The biggest misunderstandings that I see about Reactive UI is Reactive UI is not React. It's not React JS. Uh, Reactive UI is just extension methods on top of .NET Reactive extensions so that you can 
have MBVM niceties. You can use as much or as little as you want. We work well with a lot of the other major MBVM frameworks because it's a very much pay as you play as you pay model where you can just take the parts you need and leave the rest behind. You can use reactive UI without using reactive extensions. And furthermore, you can use reactive extensions without actually consuming reactive UI. But again, from an MVVM perspective, it makes it a lot easier to deal with things. And the main difficult change that I see for people um, it, when they get started with reactive programming is the fact that we define all of our logic in the constructor. And people say that they want clean, human-readable code. Well, what better way than to encapsulate all of your business logic directly in your constructor? It gives you a single source of truth. You don't have handlers here and callbacks there and region tags to help clean everything up. Uh, everything's in the constructor. And you are creating composable bits that will react to state changes as opposed to you have to having to imperatively change that state. There's a book. There's a book called UI and Reactive UI that was written by one of our alumni maintainers. Uh, in it is a lot of valuable information around how to get started with reactive extensions and reactive UI. A lot of different scenarios and code samples are provided around how you would do things like uh, create a timer or change view components based on events or run animations based on events. And we exist in a Slack channel, uh, reactiveui.net slash Slack. So if you want to get involved, if you want to see what this is about, if you want to get started using link to events uh, and understand what power you can wield uh, using this paradigm, I, I recommend you coming, joining the channel, ask your questions, and we will do our absolute best to help you. But the main takeaways that I have for you are using dynamic data to load data and transform can clean up your view models a lot. Using pharmacist to generate the events can reduce a lot of your boilerplate code when you're trying to react to events. And honestly, I would say don't fear observables. Just understand that it's just another way to do link over a different collection type and you can use it to get started down this functional path. And it's very much like Pringles. Once you start, the fun doesn't stop. So I am done. Ready for questions? I think it's like reactive UI. Uh huh. Reactive UI. Yeah. Right. Ready for questions? All right. Rodney, thank you so much for the talk. And we have a feedback that. That was a nice presentation. Now I really need to play with, around with Reactive UI. So great job. Yeah, that came from Xsignal. And we have a few great questions. So the first Please. one is from Jean-Marie. And uh, the question is, Reactive UI seems great for that search example. But is it really useful in most of the apps when 95% of your screens are loaded just once, when you have so few updates messages? Um, that's a great question. And it isn't as useful when you aren't doing a lot of eventing. But I've seen a lot of people and a lot of programs use a lot of events. Uh, the average Xamarin screen that I see has anywhere between five to 10 events and event handlers. So if you're doing event intensive programming, I would say reactive extensions and reactive UI provides a lot of value. If you don't have as many events and you don't need to respond to events as often, then it may not provide as much value to you. All right, great. The next question is from Scott Baker, and he would like to know what is the difference between LinQ's select and reactive UI's transform methods? So that's actually a dynamic data extension, and there's not a lot of difference. It's really just a, a, a 
library specific way to do the transform. So you could do the same thing using select, uh, but we use it internal to uh, dynamic data because there's some additional niceties that happen under the hood. Uh, so, you know, if you find me in, in Slack, we can look at those code samples and we can kind of talk through that a little bit more if you'd like. I see. Right. And the next question we have from Aishi Birthday. And uh, the question is, what kind of design patterns are you using? So people are curious about different design patterns. Can you give any suggestions on that area? <sighs> So design patterns, like Gang of Four design patterns, um, I, I'm really kind of more following solid here, where I'm injecting a service into my view model. Um, that service happens to just provide data. So this isn't probably a, what I would consider a known pattern. This is kind of a pattern that I've started to evolve and other people I know in the, in the reactive community have started to evolve around dynamic data. Because of the way it works, I can actually, instead of injecting my data service into or injecting my database call into my view model and getting data out of the database i can wrap that in a service and lift that work out of the view model and just allow the service to provide me an aggregation of data so i'm taking the concerns of calling the database or calling the api or doing any of that work out of my view model putting it in a service and then allowing that service to propagate data to my view model because really the only thing my view model cares about is data. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Rodney. Uh, all right. Thanks for your great talk and excellent answers. And now we're going to make a five-minute break so everyone can grab lunch or relax a little and we'll be back with you in five minutes. Thank okay. you. Hey everyone, welcome back to Xamarin Forms 101. I'm your host, Maddie Legere, and today we're going to talk about compiled bindings in Xamarin Forms. So what's a compiled binding? Well, if you've ever developed for Xamarin or for .NET before, you're probably familiar with data binding. And that's the concept that you can dynamically load in all of a page's information at runtime when your user is navigating to it. So if they click on a profile page, that profile should have that person's name and picture and information and all of that. And that all happens in your XAML using data binding. So I have a label and I tell it, hey, at runtime, when I navigate to this page, you're going to be bound to someone's name. So this is great, except when you have pages that are really, really complicated or have a lot of data binding, it can take a long time for Xamarin Forms to look at every single element and say, oh, OK, this is a string. I'm going to go get that string. OK, now this is an image. I'm going to go get that image. Additionally, if you misspell something as a developer, you probably won't know until you navigate to that page and the thing that loads is not what you expect it to. So we can alleviate both those problems using compiled bindings. The way to do that is pretty simple. It's just saying to your app, hey, compile my XAML before I run my app. So it's A, more performant, and B, catches those spelling errors and those other issues with your data binding at compile time, at build time, not at runtime. So let's take a look at how to do that. Here I am in James Montemagno's Monkey Finder app, which shows you a list of monkeys that comes in from a little back end and shows you their images and their location and the type of monkey they are. And we're going to tell this app to compile my XAML at runtime. So the first thing I want to show you is this monkeys page. It has a bunch of things that's data binding to. So like the count of the monkeys, the list of all the monkeys grouped together, and other things like the monkey's image and name and location. So if I was to misspell something here, call this money count, and build it, it's actually going to build totally fine, even though when I navigate to this page, it's not going to show me what I expect. So let's turn on compiled bindings. The first thing we have to do is go into our app, our top level app, and tell it to compile my XAML. So assembly, XAML compilation, XAML compilation options dot compile. So if you want to go into a page, you can change this to skip if you don't want to compile a page. Uh, but you can do it at the top level. And we do this in our templates now. So it starts doing this automatically for you. 
Then, once I have told my app that I want it to compile my XAML, I can go in to the monkeys page and tell it what to check against. So the monkey count and the monkeys grouped both come in from my monkeys view model. So my monkeys group, my monkey count. And that's separated from my front end here. So I need to tell this XAML file, one, where to find my view model, and two, that that view model is what it should be checking my XAML data types against. So let's do that. So I'll tell it that I have a namespace called view models. And I'll go and I'll find my view models there. And then I will say that my pages, my content pages data type is of my view model, monkeys view model, right there, just like that. Two lines of code. And now you can see I still have monkey count misspelled here. If I go and I build this, this build will actually fail, which is pretty helpful. So I can see my error and it tells me, I know it's very small, money count not found on monkeys view models. So that's great. But I'm also missing an important part of this. My data template, which is what in the list view tells the list view how to display each individual item in the list, also has different kinds of data on it. The image name and location, which don't come in from that view model, they come in from my monkey itself, my monkey model. So that's where this info comes from. So I have to do the same thing just on the data template to tell it what its data type is. So I'll go here and I'll do XMLNS models equals my monkeys models. And then I'll drop down here to the data template x data type equals models monkey. And that does the same thing we just did for the page level for this particular data template in this list view. So that's all there is to using compiled bindings and compiling your XAML down at build time in Xamarin Forms. Like I said, this is James Montemagno's Monkey Finder sample app. He also did a really good blog post on compiled bindings you can find on the Xamarin blog. And you can find all the code and the sample that we use today online on GitHub. Thanks for watching. Hey, it's James, checking in on your Xamarin Forms journey into mobile development. Don't forget to do all the things such as like, subscribe, and ding that notification bell so you get all the latest episodes in your inbox. And while you're here, check out all these awesome Xamarin Forms 101 videos right here. Get going now. I am always excited about every single thing and every single session so far. Thank you so much for all the great questions that have been coming in on Twitter. Of course, you can use hashtag .NET Conf. And if we pick your question, you will be sent a Xamarin Monkey. So how cool is that? So don't forget to do that throughout all the sessions today. We have many more hours of content coming up. And don't forget, everything will be on demand later on. And we'll post that on the Xamarin blog, Channel 9, YouTube, everywhere where you get Xamarin stuff. Now, I'm really excited uh, because I have a brand new session that I've never done before. Uh, and it's between me and all my friends, all of you amazing developers out there building things in and for Xamarin. Uh, if you don't know who I am, I'm James Montemagna. I'm a principal program manager lead here at Microsoft. Uh, and I love mobile development with Xamarin. I host the Xamarin Show here. We tweet about it, blog about it, create samples. And I love the amazing work that the community is doing. So what I wanted to do today is show off that amazing work that the team's doing, the community members are doing as well. So this is a James Montemagno and Friends session. So I first want to talk about Xamarin Essentials and some of the work we're doing there. Xamarin Essentials is in the box. You get it with every file new project that you get. And what Xamarin Essentials does is it gives you access to over 60 native APIs for iOS, Android, Windows, and more from a single shared API. And that's really cool because if you want to access geolocation, phone dialer, email, vibration, connectivity, you can do all of that with just one API. So you don't have to learn it for each platform. It's completely open source and we have amazing contributions from the community that we are continuously adding. Now last year, when we launched Xamarin Essentials, we started with iOS, Android, and UWP. And we quickly heard that developers wanted on more platforms. So we then added in watchOS, tvOS, and we worked with the Samsung team to add official Xamarin Essentials API support to the Tizen platform. 
We work closely with the community and our partners to ensure that when we're adding new features to the core, they get added to additional platforms. I'm also excited to announce that soon we'll be adding even more platforms to Xamarin Essentials, and we're starting next with Mac OS. So soon, you'll have a fully cross-platform API for not only your mobile applications, but also your desktop applications too. Truly, wherever your .NET applications can run, that's where we want to be. So right now, we just recently launched version 1.5, which I'm really excited about. It has theme detection, platform extensions, a cross-platform permissions API, and even a web authenticator API to enable you to log in with OAuth with a few lines of code. It's also based on Android X um, for the brand new Android 10, um, if you're targeting that. Same with Xamarin Forms. Now, we'll be working on 1.6 next, which will add Mac OS support which is near finally in the open PR on GitHub, but we'll also be adding file pickers, context, and calendars. We've worked closely with uh, developers in the community, and these are community contributions that we've been iterating on them for for the last few months, and we're ready to pull them in to the core of Xamarin Essentials. So be on the lookout for that. But it's not about just all the great things that we're working on here. We love the community, and I love the community and all the great work that all of you are doing. So what I wanted to do today is something a little bit different. I asked all of my amazing friends out there on Twitter, on GitHub, and through all my emails that you've all sent me throughout the years to highlight your projects, the things that you're working on. You're going to see some amazing open source projects from the Xamarin team, but also community developers around the world. And I first want to start about with some amazing libraries that developers just sent me. and said, hey, I'm using this in my Xamarin app. Why don't you show it off? So I said, sure. First one's from Sean, which is Expressive, which is this awesome .NET API. It works in any .NET application that it enables you to evaluate expressions. So here he's doing one plus one, and it's going to evaluate an integer to return three, or one plus two to return three, <laughs> which is really cool. It's really extensible, completely open source. Next. All right, here we go. MVVM Adam from my good friend Samir, who works here at Microsoft now, which is really awesome. It's sort of a minimum um, base class MVVM with commands and navigation service. You wanted to get the maximum done in the most minimum amount of time. So it allows you to do custom commands and things like that for your MVVM. Next up, HTTP Tracer. This is from Dylan, Daniel, and Chase. Really, really cool stuff. I get asked all the time, hey, I'm making HTTP requests. How do I debug that? How long does it take? Well, HTTP Tracer does that. It works with any .NET application and your Xamarin apps. It's sort of like a fiddler for those applications. You can trace your responses, your requests, output it to the console, which is what you're seeing here. Best of all, completely open source. In fact, everything I'm showing you, completely open source. Anybind, Alexander sent this one in. I really like this. Um, I didn't know this, this is the best part. I didn't know half of this stuff existed, so sending it in is awesome. This um, Anybind helps improve the binding situation to get rid of those on property changes. It's really cool. Uh, what he does is he simply comes in, he sees you kind of the before here with um, adding events for property change, having to propagate up on property change notifications. And here on the right hand side, after, just simply initializes the dependency manager, adds these little attributes on top, and the magic happens. Tiny insights from Daniel. Um, out there, which is awesome. This is really cool if you're using any analytics, so App Center, App Insights, or Google Analytics. Um, it abstracts it into a common API that you can access from your shared code. You can even add your own custom providers. So if you're not satisfied with what's out there, you're using your own backend, it's really, really easy. So here there's a little tracker that you initialize. You can set up dependency trackers, what you're calling, and you can send that into the backend. It's really, really nice, so no matter what you're using, and multiple providers too. So I love that, because sometimes you're sending data to multiple sources. And I really, really like this to give you insights into your apps. Now, when you go beyond Xamarin Essentials, uh, which sometimes you may, you want deeper integration in the OS. You can always access those APIs, but there are amazing community projects out there that deliver some of this great functionality. So not only did I ask the amazing developers and all of you to send me your suggestions, I said, hey, why don't you make a video for me? So I have a few here that I want to play back for you, 
And the first is Alan Ritchie and his amazing Shiny project. I use Shiny in my applications to do all sorts of good stuff. Check him out on GitHub and the Shiny org as well, but I'm gonna let him talk about it because he deserves it, because he helped build it. So here we go. Hi, my name's Alan Ritchie. I've been working with Xamarin and .NET for many years. I'm a former Xamarin MVP and a current Microsoft MVP. Over the last few years, I've contributed many open source components to help developers get stuff done with a total of almost 4 million NuGet downloads to date. I love being a part of the Xamarin and .NET community. And today, I'm going to talk about my latest open source contribution to the community called Shiny. Traditionally, background services can be quite difficult to write and even harder to bring your shared code and services to them. No one likes to write spaghetti code or untestable code. Forget about a good cross-platform solution to this until now. Enter Shiny. Shiny fixes all these scenarios and makes it really easy for you to write this code fast that runs across all of the Xamarin platforms. By bringing a solid dependency injection architecture, Shiny allows you to get your backend done quickly, freeing you up to create beautiful user experiences and innovative applications. Shiny is a framework that has several libraries and utilities for you to use, such as periodic background jobs, geofencing, background GPS, motion activity recognition, local notifications, push notifications, Bluetooth LE client and server modes, BLE beacon detection, and more to come in the future. As the standard process, pick up the nougats you need to install. Each of the NuGet packages does contain a baseline set of instructions to help get you started. Shiny, like Xamarin Forms and Xamarin Essentials, does require some boilerplate code. Because Shiny uses dependency injection, we do need a general type of startup file. If you've used ASP.NET Core, this should look familiar to you. You'll notice that we've registered a background job with some criteria, a notifications module with categories and actions, and some geofencing. We'll take a look at how we handle the events for these modules shortly. This file is also where you want to register your own services and code so that Shiny can use them in the background events. iOS is pretty straightforward when it comes to the boilerplate code. Everything is done in app delegate and any permissions that you normally need to get set up in the, P -list, in the info plist. Nothing new here, but a couple lines of code. As you can see, Shiny wires in using extension methods. This is to make the plug points a little easier for you to discover during development. Android, on the other hand, is a bit more complicated. Shiny needs to initialize before everything. Note the use of the main application here. This is something that is a bit different versus Essentials and Forms. Behind the scenes, Shiny uses broadcast receivers, which, when run in the background, will be starting the app in a cold state without ever hitting your main activity and thus going through the normal Xamarin Forms application lifecycle you're used to. Lastly, there are a few touch points here in the main activity to enable things like notification entry, interception, and permission requests. Finally, let's take a look at our background job code. Note the constructor injection of the notification manager. You can basically DI whatever you registered in your startup file here. In this job, we're not doing anything crazy, just sending out a notification. Things you could do with background jobs are things like synchronizing offline data to and from your server, maybe cleaning up a local database, maybe sending some reminder notifications later in the day. Note that jobs are periodic, not scheduled. Android is generally pretty good about running roughly every 15 minutes. iOS is a bit more intelligent and will run shortly before the user is known to use the app. The OS is essentially being trained by the user when they like to use your application during the day. Let's take a look at some geofencing. Geofencing allows you to monitor for when your user is entering or exiting a circular region from a center point. Geofencing has several great scenarios like welcoming a user to a certain location. In the startup file, I registered a geofence for Toronto, Canada's CN Tower. When the user gets roughly a mile away from the CN Tower, we'll send a notification welcoming the user and attach a category, we'll cover that in a couple slides, which will allow the user to interact with the notification. We can also use a different set of actions based on if the user is leaving the geofence. For now, we'll just say goodbye. 
Here's a couple screenshots showing our trigger geofence running. Note the welcome response and how the app responds with another notification without ever entering the application. Let's take a look at how we accomplish that. This is the notifications delegate. From here I'm able to catch events for when the notification is actually being sent and when the user has interacted with one of your notifications. The on entry event here is where I'm responding to the user interaction from the geofence notification. If the user chose to leave a message, I'll simply respond to them saying that their message is recorded. If they wanted a free ticket, we'll just let them know that we've received their request. Because the, me me the methods are traditional .NET tasks, you could also choose to interact with your backend here to provide some additional business logic. Looks pretty simple, doesn't it? So that's a quick look at Shiny. I hope you like what you saw. Be sure to check out the links below for the latest developments and modules that are being worked on. Thanks for watching. There you have it. Shiny to accomplish so much more. Geofencing, background notifications, and syncing, everything that you could possibly want. And that's amazing work being done by Alan. I cannot thank him enough for him and all the contributors to the project. I use it in my applications, and I hope that you find it useful too. Now, sometimes, it's not just about libraries in the application, it's about extensions, it's about build time of your application. And I asked my good friend, one of my best friends in the entire world, Jonathan Dick, who you may know as Ref um, on the internet. I work closely with him here on the Xamarin team, specifically on Xamarin Essentials, and he's tackling how to properly get different image sizes from a single source. Everyone knows images, different sizes, different platforms. He's gonna show off Resizatizer NT in his project, so let's check it out. Hey James, hey everyone, this is John Dick here. Uh, you may better know me as Reth on the internet or on Twitter. And today I wanted to share with you quickly just a little something I've been working on to make cross-platform images in your Xamarin apps a lot easier. So if you've ever done images before in your Xamarin apps, you know that it can be kind of a pain. So if you have your Android app, uh, and I've got a new solution here that's just a Xamarin Forms app, it's got an Android app, it's got an iOS app, it's got a UWP app. And if I wanna add an image to this, I've gotta go into my resources, I've gotta resize it for all the different display densities that exist for Android devices. And when I'm done doing that, I've gotta go into my iOS project, and I've gotta resize everything for all of the different display densities for it. So I've got like the, one, the normal image, the 2X image, the at 3X image. And finally, if I come down to UWP and I do the same thing, I've got a bunch of different assets. I've got a uh, scale 100, a scale 200, a 400, etc., etc. That's a lot of images to have to resize. And so I've made a quick plugin that lets you uh, share your images from your shared code project. So if you go today and install resizatizer.nt, go install this to all your different projects, uh, including your shared code project. And then what I'm going to show you here is I'm going to take a vector image, an SVG, and I'm going to drag it into my shared code project here. And you'll see this pop in. It's a Xamagon. It's an SVG. It's a lovely image. Now, what I need to do is go to its properties, and I need to set it as a shared image type. And then this is a, a build action that Resizatizer adds for you. So I go and set this as a shared image. And when I'm done with this, I can actually go into my project file, my shared project file, and I'm going to go ahead and set another attribute on here called base size. And this is going to be the size of the image that I want to specify in my code. Now, because this is a vector, we actually have to know what your normal resolution, what your 1x uh, iOS resolution, your MDPI Android resolution, your scale 100 resolution for UWP is so that we can make the right sizes for all the other different display densities. So I go ahead and I save this, I add my base size, and now in my apps, I can actually reference this in all my app head projects just using, uh, now this is a vector, so we'll resize it for you, and it will actually output as a PNG file. So I'm going to go ahead and reference this as xamagon.png. So let's go into our, um, our shared project here. Let's get rid of this label, and let's add an image, and let's call it Xamagon PNG. Um, we'll center it. Uh, horizontal options will be centered to and then finally we've got to go give it our width request which is going to be 100 and our height request which will be 100. Now remember that's the size we set in our CS project our shared project as the base size. So now I've got this thing 
I can go ahead and build my app. Let's start it off on iOS. And you'll see it launch in the simulator here in a second and we'll run and we should have a lovely Zamagon image. Yep, nicely in our view here, that's great. Uh, and you'll notice that if we look at our resources, it didn't actually add it to our resources here, it's actually adding it to our resources in the uh, output folder, in the intermediate output. So if I go into the, the output folder here in the OBJ folder uh, for iPhone simulator, we can go into this folder called Resizitizer and we can see all the different display density versions of that image were created for us as PNGs. They were included into the build automatically. We didn't have to add anything specifically to those projects. So that's pretty cool. And the same is true for Android, um, for UWP, uh, it now supports WPF and it will be supporting Tizen soon as well. So we support a lot of different platforms. Now we'll just run the Android version quick here. And as we're doing that, we'll just check out the fact that, you know, we don't see any resources built into these folders for the Zamagon. They all exist at runtime, uh, just built into your app automatically for you, all from this one little include shared image item in your project. So the Android app is launching now and we should see it pop up here in a second. And there it is, that's great. We have the Android app with the, the Zamagon in there and everything works just fine. Now we could start the UWP app as well. And there we go, the icons in our UWP app as well. So this is called Resizitizer NT. This is a new plugin I've made. It's in pre-release now. Go give it a shot. Try it out on NuGet. Install it into all your projects and let me know how it goes. Thanks. That thing is absolutely astonishing. The first time John showed it to me, it blew my mind. I was like, I need to have this and we need to share it with the world. So check out Resizitizer NT and give us feedback on the project. I know John would love it. Now let's hop over to the UI. I've shown you some amazing libraries from developers out there for your Xamarin applications and some plugins into Visual Studio to help you with images, such as Resizitizer. Now, when you're building applications, there's tons in the box. We've had some great sessions about building beautiful applications, and there's a lot more out there. Sometimes you need things that are super duper custom, and you could build them yourself, but there's amazing companies in the Xamarin and Xamarin Forms ecosystem that are making awesome toolkits with tons of controls built into them. Now, I could talk about them all day, but I challenged every single one of the amazing control vendors out there to highlight their amazing tool set in just 30 seconds each. So let's hop over to the video and check them out. Can we explain why you should be using Sync Fusion Xamarin controls in just 30 seconds? Well, let's find out. Essential Studio for Xamarin's most comprehensive suite of Xamarin UI controls. Controls that include our high-performance data grid that helps you to efficiently display and manipulate large amounts of data, our seamless list view with features such as swiping, multiple orientations, folder refresh, grouping, and more, and our gallery of 30-plus charts that cater to all charting scenarios. Plus, you can implement them all in easy-to-use Xamarin templates from our Xamarin UI kit. Want to try them out for yourself? Download a free trial at syncfusion.com slash Xamarin. Whew, made it.
Putting together that video was absolutely amazing. Seeing all of the videos come in, combining them up with the awesome music, I literally was just playing that over and over again at home. Uh, I don't know how my wife put up with me. But truly, there is something out there for any single application that you're building to help you build beautiful applications. Now, these amazing control vendors are building the most complex, amazing, awesome things possible, and there's also great work being done in the community. So I asked a few of my friends, some that already present today, to show off more awesomeness. A few awesome projects out there, Magic Gradients, helping you put XAML gradients and C-sharp gradients absolutely everywhere from Marcin and Bowden. Absolutely stunning, built on top of Skia Sharp. The UI color picker control out there from Udara, being able to easily pick a color with just a single XAML snippet in your app. Zam Animation, Javier presented earlier today, easily enabling you to add in animations into your Xamarin applications all from XAML or code behind. Super duper awesome, completely open source. Sheet Control, this is an awesome one from Havard, uh, who also was tweeting today. A lot of people are asking about Sheet Control. He spent a lot of hard work on this. It's really awesome to see how easy it is to add these sheet controls into your application. XAML is a full uh, different tool set out there from Mohammed with progress, uh, switch, toggle bars, radio buttons, all awesome being built on top of Xamarin Forms to add to your applications. Now I also asked a few good friends to make another short video. Steven presented earlier today. He talked a little bit about Pancake View and Debug Rainbows, but I asked him to go a little bit more in depth. So here he is. Hi there. My name is Steven Tewisa, and I'm here to give you a quick overview of some of the NuGet packages that I've created for Xamarin Forms over the last year. The first package I'd like to show you is Pancake View, which, despite its quirky name, is a really useful control. Using the built-in Xamarin Forms controls, it can be hard to create views that use shadows or gradients or borders. There are a few built-in controls available that implement some of these things, like a frame, for example. But what Pancake View does is it combines it all into a single simple to use control. So let's take a look at what options we have available. For that I will open the accompanying sample app. You can find that in the repo and it has a built-in page with all the options that it has. And what I especially like besides these options we are showing here is the debug mode which allows you to play around with the control itself by adjusting all these sliders and exploring all the options that way. So we have gradients, we have multicolored gradients, we can adjust angles on them, um, we can add borders in all sorts of shapes and forms, so dashed or maybe a gradient as well, and the angle of that can also be adjusted. It supports corner radius, so a uniform cor corner radius for every corner, all the way up to making it a circle. Um, or we can also do, if we want to, individually uh, rounded corners. We can add shadows in multiple fashions, so either using elevation, which is an Android thing, or just a regular shadow. Um, it also clips its content automatically, so it doesn't really matter what type of borders or corners you add, the content is always clipped. And we can also make it into a multi-cornered element, so maybe a hexagon or a triangle if we really want to. And the corner radius is also influencing that, so we can create all sorts of crazy shapes and we can also rotate that shape around. So it offers a lot of freedom in that regard. It has a lot of options and can really help you quickly get started on making a beautiful user interface. Next up is Debug Rainbows. If you're creating user interfaces in Xamarin Forms, you've probably come across the scenario where you've changed the background color on an element to identify the space that it consumes on the page, or maybe to debug a positioning issue. And Debug Rainbows can help you with those kinds of issues. So essentially what the package does is give you a few additional attached properties that you can set on your content pages to enable different kinds of debug views. And I have downloaded a sample made by Kim Philpotts, hijacked his styles and added all of the debug rainbow styles in here. The sample app normally looks like this, which looks pretty great. And if we enable debug rainbows, 
becomes much more colorful, colorful. But this helps you identify where all the different elements are, where they're positioned, um, and how they align compared to one another. On the topic of alignment, Debug Rainbows also offers a alignment grid, which helps you figure out if everything is aligned evenly. So it allows you to create all these major and minor grid lines. You can adjust all the properties related to it, so colors, opacities, the interval of how many major grid lines you want, and it really helps you align your items evenly. When combining this with Hot Reload, you can really speed up your dev loop when figuring out those nasty layouting issues, or you can just use it to create pretty colorful pictures. It wraps up this little quick summary of all the packages that I've built over the last year. I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see each other soon. Awesome. I love Pancake View and Debug Rainbows. I use it in like every single application I build. Hope you find it super useful. I also challenged Steven to put the grid on there and he totally did it. It's from, from one of my favorite packages from I think Jeff Wilcox that did it back in the day um, on a bunch of different platforms. So really cool to see this work from the amazing community. Now next up, a library near, near, near and dear to a lot of our developers' heart is Skia Sharp. Uh, some of you may not even know about Skia Sharp. So I asked Matthew Liebowitz um, from um, Africa, uh, one of our amazing developers here, to give a little brief overview of what Skia Sharp is, what you can build with it, um, and also some amazing libraries built with it. So let me go ahead and show off this. Hello world. I am Matthew Libovitz, a software engineer for Microsoft, and I'm based in South Africa. I have the honor of working on many different libraries and tools for all the developers in the community, and not only do I get to work on them, but I get to see the cool and exciting things that are made with those tools. One of my favorite libraries of all time is Gearsharp, an open source, cross-platform 2D drawing library that enables you to do anything when it comes to graphics, animations, or UI. It is based on the amazing open source work done by the folks at Google on the Skia project. Skia is used in many things such as Android, Chrome and Firefox. I then take their code, wrap it in a pretty package, add a few extra APIs, make it work great with .NET and ensure that it runs on Android, iOS, UWP, Mac OS, Windows, Linux and more. You can check out the code for Skia Sharp on github.com slash mono slash Sharp. And speaking of amazing things done by the community, I just wanted to take the time to show off some of the great things that has been done with Skiershop by the folks in the community. The first cool example I'd like to show off is Balloony by Shan Mooker. It's a cool little slider where the balloon wobbles back and forth using Skiershop to draw the balloon. The next is a library called Magic Gradients by Marcin that adds shadings, backgrounds or gradients or patterns to pages and views. You can add it in code or in XAML or even use CSS to style it. Another very cool library I'd like to show off is Microcharts, originally written by Eloise. It allows you to add all sorts of colorful graphs and charts into your app to represent any sort of data that your app may be using or you want to show to the user. The last library I'd like to show off is MapSui. This is an awesome cross-platform mapping component that you can drop into your desktop or mobile applications. Just look how smooth this map renders. And this is just the CPU renderer. And now I'd like to move on from individual controls to entire control galleries built on top of Skiershaw, such as Aurora controls with their buttons, gauges, gradients, and even a fun confetti control. Another awesome control library is EliteCat with all their buttons, steppers, and other various progress bars that you can add into your app. If we go from libraries and control galleries to entire applications, Wishlaw has a really cool project called Draw2D. This is a multi-platform 2D diagram editor that allows you to create and edit 2D diagrams. I hope you enjoyed looking at some of the things made by the folks in the community. Maybe some of your stuff was shown. Maybe you were inspired to do some cool things. But I hope you would check out Skiershop. Don't forget to hit up github.com slash mono slash Skiershop. See you around. Awesome to see all the amazing things built with Skia Sharp and all the amazing libraries that are built on top of it and the awesome things you can do to your application. Now, last and not least, I couldn't talk about awesome controls without talking about my good friend Jean-Marie. Jean-Marie is an amazing developer building awesome things. Mr. 
Sharpenado himself. I'm just going to let him explain all the awesome things that he's building to use in your applications. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jean-Marie Alphonsis speaking for Sharpenado. Sharpenado.com is a blog about mainly Xamarin forms, but also a bit of C Sharp and a tiny bit of Monty Python's. Uh, behind uh, Sharpnado, this is just me, French software developer, working as a freelance. So if you want to build flabbergasting app, you can contact me and we will make this happen. But today it's about the community and I will talk about my components uh, that you can find on Nugget. And uh, I will start with the horizontal list view. So it's really self-explainable, you know. Uh, and what you can do about the horizontal is view is set the colon count, for example. So now you have three items for pages. Um, but if you set the colon count to one, you achieve a carousel layout, in fact. Uh, which is cool about the horizontal is view that is that it recycle all the items, just like the collection view. And you can also uh, change the layout of the horizontal is view and have a grid. Now you have a grid with three colon, for example, or if you set to one colon, you have now a list view, uh, which is really cool also about the horizontal list view is that you can drag and drop items. Now, if I can, I can take my father turn and put it all the way up, or I can take my Steve Carell here and put it all the way down. Okay. Now I will jump straight to the tabs, the pure Xamarin Forms tabs. And so we have a lot of different tabs here, all the, the, the different style you can uh, imagine, like the bottom tab item, this one, or the underline tab item, like this one, which are fixed types, and but you also have scrollable tabs um, and custom tabs. You can style them, you can change the color, you can change the font, everything, but which is really cool about it, it's we can also create your ob your own tab item by inheriting from tab item. Look at those spam and this animation here. We can play a bit with the, the tabs you see here. We can just go to the scrollable tabs. And yes, it's working. No problem here. Now I will be talking about my favorite component, the task loader view. Uh, it's my favorite one because it will remove a lot of boilerplate code and it will also prevent a lot of crashes. The main promise of Tastodar View is to free yourself from its busy equal true. So it's a bit mysterious. Uh, to understand it more, we will uh, launch the Retronado, Retronado app and we will want, will want to uh, achieve this, you know, a little uh, loading uh, spinner with a result view here, a list of games. And if there's an uh, error, we'll show um, an er error view to, to the user. This is what we want. Now to do this, we have our view model here and all these properties like is busy. If you set is busy to true, you will see the spinner. Uh, if it's as error is true, you will see the error view. All kinds of things here. Uh, for sure, you have a, a retro gaming service uh, you will uh, retrieve your games from it and we have our load method that will run this code and uh, which is a nesting void method we'll just uh, uh, start with the uh, properties uh, and then load uh, the initialization and catch all the exception and all those properties will be bound to our XAML so we have uh, the result view here, the loading view here, with an activity indicator and the error view as a stack layout. So, so this is what you saw earlier. If we use the task loader view, all is really simple now. You just have task loader view and that's it. And in it, you just have your result view. And all the other loading states are embedded in it. It's the same in the view model. If you use a task loader notifier, you just give it uh, give him the initialization code and it will take care of ev everything. You see, is busy, is gone. All the properties are gone. Everything is taking care, uh, ca taking care of uh, thanks to composition. So it's really great. Now, 
uh, if you look at the documentation, you can see that it features many things like default states. So there's al already uh, different uh, views that are implemented in the task loader view. Default one, like the error view is just an image with a text. It's stylable, you can put uh, a a any font you, 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 you like. Uh, for example, here at the Atari ST font. But you can also uh, use your own custom view by overriding the loading states. Uh, you, you see how you do it here, loading states. You just override the, the views and you put your own. So you can achieve really all the design you want. Though there are more to it. You can also uh, use uh, skeleton loading thanks to a risk package. But also Lochi animation. So there's really everything, anything you can do uh, with uh, the task loader view. So guys, I think that's all for me. Uh, have a great .NET Conf and see you soon on Sharp Nado. Bye, guys. I want to first say thank all of you for being part of this amazing Xamarin community, building libraries, building on top of what the team builds, and also just sending your pull requests and your feature requests in. You all made it easy for me to put together this presentation because all of you together in this amazing community help other developers build beautiful, stunning applications. We couldn't do this alone. We do it as one big happy .NET and Xamarin family. And I want to thank everyone. I want to make a shout out to all the different awesome projects that I highlighted here and the amazing component vendors. I believe we have time for just three questions. So I'm going to head over to the board here really quick. And Oli is helping me out by picking some good ones. First one's from Rob Wilson. Again, he says, does Xamarin Essential support GPS location capture with long running stuff via background services? As of today, it doesn't. Of course, Xamarin does. So you could go and access those APIs yourself on iOS and Android. But you should also look what Alan Ritchie is doing, because he's already built this library included inside of Shiny to do background updates and notifications as well. You can bind the two together if you want, or use the amazing open source libraries that are out there. And we are looking at integrating some of that stuff into the project, so check out the GitHub issues as well. Next from Ali, he says, great, James, for, yeah, he says, great presentation, James. Why, thank you. Um, he said, isn't, is it, why isn't camera and gallery added to Xamarin Essentials, or will it be added? It's a great question. You know, we're actively talking to developers all the time, seeing what you need for your applications, and we're adding those continuously into Xamarin Essentials. Now, Xamarin Essentials, since we support so many platforms and it's included inside the templates, we have to be rock solid that the um, functionality is super complete and well tested. We run hundreds of UI tests and unit tests on, our app, on Xamarin Essentials itself. Um, now, that said, our big focus is actually on file-based access. We started with sharing files, emailing files, SMSing files. And the next version, you'll see file pickers, which is going to start to get into the camera picker, video picker controls. Um, those are very, very complex controls um, out there, or APIs, I should say. But we are looking to integrate them over time. But again, just because it's not in Xamarin Essentials doesn't mean there's not an awesome library out there that can already do it, such as the media plugin or some other plugins out there. All right, last one here. Luis says, .NET Conf. Hey, James. Hey, Luis. When can we try gradients with Xamarin Forms? You can do it today. In fact, I showed you some amazing libraries from the community, including Magic Gradients and the Pancake View. I use gradients in all my applications today. Now, Xamarin Forms itself is adding it into the box, uh, different controls. I believe it's added in the next version, the one after, but you can check out the pull request and even download a NuGet from that PR. Again, I want to thank every single one of you for being part of this amazing Xamarin and .NET community. Uh, for building these awesome libraries and for letting me show off all of your hard work. Go build beautiful applications with these amazing libraries. Now let's head back over to Olia now for our next session. Thank you, James. Thank you for the amazing talk. And I just wanted to say it's so great to see so much engagement from Xamarin community. And our next talk will be especially interesting for SP.NET folks because Luce Carter will tell us about Xamarin mobile development for ASP.NET developers. So welcome, Luce Carter. Thank you. It's, uh, it's great to be here. So let's share my screen. So, oh, come on. 
share that one. There we go. Let's kick things off. So, hi everyone. Welcome to my talk on Xamarin mobile development for ASP.NET developers. Actually, before we do that, let's just double check that I haven't got my camera on. Let's save some bandwidth. There we go. Right, try again. Cool. So as I said, yeah, welcome to my talk on Xamarin mobile development for ASP.NET developers. I'm Luce Carter. I'm a software developer at Dunhumby, a data, customer data science company. As any of you that know me will know, I am quite a pedant for the English language. In fact, I bugged James with fixes to his blog so much he made me an admin. So the, this is not a typo. My company really does start its company name with a lowercase d. I started at Dunhumby back in 2018 as a ASP.NET backend developer. And I, in fact, now dabble in QA. So I don't even write code as a day job anymore. But I've known and loved Xamarin since 2015. And in fact, I learned it before I got to know ASP.NET. So I understood some of the concepts by finding analogies between uh, Xamarin and ASP. So what's quite funny about this talk is that this is a complete switch of that. We're going to learn about ASP.NET. Sorry, we're going to learn about Xamarin with a knowledge of ASP.NET. I'm also a Microsoft MVP and a Twilio champion. And along the bottom here, you will see a few handles. So at LooseCarter1 is my Twitter handle. I keep my DMs open constantly. So if you ever have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Coding with Loose is my Twitch handle where I try to stream weekly, but don't hold me to it. Um, I've coded, a, um, streamed a lot less since I stopped coding because imposter syndrome got the better of me. But hey, the summer's coming. Let's try again. If you type coding with loose into YouTube, you will also find me my videos. I don't have enough subscribers to have a slash coding with loose, but I put coding with loose in all the video titles, so you should be able to find it. Then lastly, along the right here, we have my uh, website where I blog occasionally, not as much as I should. So we're used to the .NET ecosystem. We love it and use it already. You would have seen, if you watched the keynote this morning, you see Amanda showed a much better uh, version of this diagram, but it's still a great diagram. And as you can see, .NET supports pretty much anything you can think of, from desktop to mobile to gaming, AI, you name it, .NET can probably do it. And you're used to web. You know, when you're doing your ASP.NET development, you know, it, fall, it falls under the web category. But as you would have seen from the talk title, today is about mobile. So we're going to look at this part of the platform. Why would we want to talk about it? Well, millions of people have smartphones in their pockets and they, you know, you use them every day on a, on a constant basis. I know I do. And having a website is great. And I know responsive web is, is great and everything. But yeah, you want to actually make use of the platform features available on smartphones to give your customers the best possible experience. You could use something like a PWA, but it wouldn't give you access to the native features of the devices to give your users the best experience. You could do something like React Native, Cordova, PhoneGap, or some of the other cross-platform options out there. But we love .NET, and we want to stick with .NET. And that's where Xamarin comes in. So Xamarin is a cross-platform native app experience written in C-sharp or F-sharp. You can deploy it everywhere. So you can see from this diagram that you can do iOS, Android, macOS, watchOS, tvOS. But there's more than that. It also does, it's not mentioned on here, other things like Tizen, which is Samsung's uh, platform so you can do watch and tv with them as well so you really can put xamarin everywhere and the great thing is is that because it's dotnet and it's cross-platform it allows you to do code sharing um that's you can you've got the the shared business logic which comes by default out of the box with xamarin and then optionally you can do xamarin forms so what xamarin forms is is shared ui as well so you can do you can use a .NET standard library for your shared business logic, and then you've got as part of that the shared UI and Xamarin Forms. Xamarin Forms is my personal favorite, so that's what we're going to focus on today. So out of the box, what does your app look like? 
Yeah, the, the structure of your solution will be different on the different platforms. So what do you actually see? So if we switch desktops now, I've, I've used multiple desktops for this because I don't have a, a stream deck or anything to do fancy button presses, so desktops it is. So here we've got a simple ASP.NET solution. So I'll just zoom into that. Oh, come on, magnifying glass. There we go. So we've got our solution here. It's just a web project. And inside of it, it's just that one project. That is our ASP.NET web project. And then you've got the files and folder structures that you'd expect. So for example, you've got startup.cs. So this is where you this is where you do things like dependency injection, uh, configuration, and things like that. Yeah, it's just, just out of the box. It's what you'd expect. It does all the different configurations that you need all there set up for you. Then you've got the program file. So that contains main, because under the box, all an ASP.NET project is, is a console app with a web builder on top of it, like an extra layer. So you still have main inside of program.cs like you'd expect from your console apps. And this is where you'd go to find where the program starts and you know does other configuration. But yeah, this is where you go to start. So what about Xamarin? So if we go across to here now, this solution, which I'll zoom in again, here we go, is our out of the box Xamarin Forms project. So you get a you get three projects and possibly four. You get, so the reason I say four is that you've got these platform specific projects here, which I'll go through in a minute. If you create the project on Visual Studio for Windows, it will give you the option to add UWP as well, for uni which is obviously universal Windows platform so that you can create Windows 10, even Xbox apps, because Xbox is just UWP under the hood. Not actually tried making an Xbox app yet, but I might might do it for a laugh. So what's actually going on in these projects? So we'll start with the platform specific, as we call them. You don't need to worry too much about what's going on here, but just in terms of understanding where it starts, you know, this is this is quite a good one to look at. So in iOS, we have App Delegate, which is a bit like that main that you saw. So we've got we've got some code in here. Don't worry too much if it looks a bit scary with all the comments. The main thing to look at here is that it initializes Xamarin Forms and then calls the load application new app, which we'll see where that is shortly. Then on the Android project, it's very similar. You just go into the main activity class, it initializes Xamarin Forms and calls the new app. So rather than calling any, any files or UI in the platform specific project, it's calling up to our shared project. So if we have a look at our shared project again. So this is the crux of the interesting stuff. So most of the work that you do will happen inside this shared project. And the one I want to show you first is this app.xaml.cs. So if you've ever done razor pages before, this idea of a, of a dot extension dot CS won't be unusual to you. Xamarin Forms also uses partial classes or code behind as they're called in both. So if we have a look at our app xaml.cs now, you'll see this app. So this app constructor is what we saw being called from here. And so it goes ahead and calls the new main page. So this is where you set up what the root page of your application will be, aka the first page that you see. So in ASP.NET, you might know this from um, launch settings and setting you know, the, the default root. Normally it's indexed, but of course you can set it to be something else. So we've got We've got it running here. It just calls main page, which is a file here, which we'll come on to later. So let's go back to the slides. So that's our app structure, and we've and we've talked about what you get out of the box. But let's talk architectural patterns. We've talked about the app structure, but what about architecture? Because especially as your solutions get bigger and you add more and more projects to it, I I know that when I was doing uh, back-end development last year, the project that I worked on, I think, had 64 projects in the solution. 
So, you know, the bigger your project gets, the more important architect architecture is, because architecture plays a key role in the maintainability of our apps, ensuring code reuse, easy code reuse, readability and maintainability. I'm sure we've all opened some code and gone a bit like, oh, what is going on? So that's why architecture is really important. So we know MVC. Well, you, you may be familiar with MVC. Of course, with ASP.NET, you get different types of projects that you can create. But the one that we're going to look at is MVC. So MVC, as you can see here, stands for Model View Controller. The model handles our business logic. Then you've got the pages. And as you'll see later, the view, which is the pages, sorry. And as you'll see later, our website uses Razor Pages. Then you've got the controller down here, which acts as the sets up the routes and acts as a messenger between the model and the view. And if we have a look at that in action, we'll go back to that counter website. So I'm just going to quickly run it so you can see what it's doing. And then we'll talk about how it's doing what it's doing. So just kick it off here. Hopefully I made enough. Uh, sacrifices to the demo gods today and it works on my side hey there we go so this is just a simple counter i will zoom in slightly you just got a button click the button and the number increments pretty boring pretty simple but how's that how's that working so you've got this mvc so we'll start with the at the lowest level, which is, the, as I like to think of it, as the models. So all I did was create an increment model that just has a property of count equals zero, because most counts start at zero. We're developers, everything's zero indexed, right? Well, unless you're American, in which case the ground floor is first, but yeah, simple enough. So we've got our increment model. Then if we go up one in the tree, as it were, Obviously, it's not a sort of actual hierarchy, but I like to think of it as a tree in different levels. So we'll look at the controller. So I've just got a simple counter controller here. All that does, a lot of it is out of the, co out of the box code, but we've just got this property here, private property called int. Then we've got the index where we create that model, set its count to be the count value, and then return the view. Then, of course, we have an HTTP POST increment endpoint that does pretty much the same, except it increments the count and then returns the view, calls that index, and then passes it in that model. The reason that we do that is because, obviously, every time you click the button, which you'll see in here, it goes to, oh, there you go, counter. Yeah, so we've got the page here, the button, is a submit button with a from so a form within a form so obviously it refreshes the page each time so you just need to be able to keep that number consistent so that it actually counts upwards otherwise every time you just click the button it stays zero you see here that you've got some uh, razor binding syntax between the the page and the the model this is so that you can pass that data around in this case it's the the count all pretty straightforward stuff said all it was was a button that you clicked and the number goes up so let's just go back to our slides again that was MVC. but the architectural pattern that Xamarin Forms uses is actually something called MVVM it doesn't automatically use it out the box, but as you start to make more complicated apps, you will find that MVVM is your best friend. A lot of apps that you see developed out there will use MVVM. You know, a lot of the code samples that, that you would have seen today, I'm sure no doubt had MVVM in them. I know James uses it a lot. It's great. So the M part is, again, still model, and it's still a business logic. The view is still pages, except rather than being a razor page or any other type of page, it's a Xamarin Forms content page. Then you've got the view model. This talks between the view and the model. And then it still uses data binding, except rather than being the razor bindings like you saw in the counter, it uses Xamarin's own data binding. And you'll see this in action later in a demo. So we've talked about the architecture of the page. But how do we actually go about starting to build the UI and putting all those components together? So 
you've got two options. You've got XAML or C sharp. So, or F sharp, of course. So with the XAML, it's um, obviously it's a it's an extensible application markup language. I think it, you if you've ever done anything like UWP development before, you might be familiar with XAML. It's not the same dialect. It is XAML forms XAML, but there's still a lot of similarities. It's still very intuitive and easy to get started with. And then, of course, you've got uh, C sharp or F sharp. So you don't just have to use XAML to declare UI. You can also actually declare the UI in code. And you know, you've got all these different building blocks that you can put together. And both are an option how you do it. There's no limitations. It's not that what you can do in one you can't do in the other. It's fully consistent. So let's just have a, look at a demo of our building blocks. So if I just cheat here and go to here. Uh, actually, let's start with the other example first, because that'd be easier. Nope, wrong one. There we go. So you would have seen this earlier. This is the counter I showed you. So let's just have a look at it running, and then you can see what it looks like. I was having problems earlier with uh, iOS build, so I just quickly made sure it was on the app. So if we just load the app here, I promise, take my word for it, this is the app. So it's just a simple counter again with a button. You click it the number goes up. So we've seen how it works. Let's look at how it's put together. Oh, not that one. So many desktops, so easy to get it wrong. There we go. So how's it put together? Well, as I mentioned earlier, out of the box, it calls main page. And for a simple app like this, that's not using MVVM and is just a simple example, using main page was fine because it's a single page application. So it uses Xamarin Forms content page, as I mentioned. Then it's got a stack layout which dictates the, you know, the order of the page. Um, you know, so stack layout, stack things one on top of the other. There are other types like grid, for example, which you'll see in action later. In fact, you'll see it in the next demo. So we've got the label here and a button. Pretty straightforward. Set the text, give it a name so we can refer to it, set some stuff about where it lives, and then a button that says when you click it, call this method. So if we go into the code behind, you can see we've just got a private int. And then again, we just that method that we call when you click the button, all it does is increment the count. And then that label that we named, you just set the text to be the count as a string. So it's still just a few lines of code and, and pretty straightforward. And yeah, again, you can have a counter just like that pretty quick. So what about if you're doing it in code? So again, I uh, cheated and did a, here's what I prepared earlier style. So this is just the same app. I apologize for the terrible design, but again, you just click a button and the number goes up. So it's the same concept, the button, a label, the number goes up, but you'll see that it's written in C sharp and we can achieve exactly the same thing. So if we go back to here, that one. There we go. Cool. So this here, if we have a look, we've got the solution with multiple projects. This one does have UWP in it because I created it in Windows. Again, you've got the app XAML. It's still a Xamarin Forms project. I didn't do anything different to create it just because it's not using XAML for the pages. It's still an app. Still got everything you'd expect. It's just when we set the root page, we're actually calling counter page, which, as you'll see here, is just a C sharp class, just a plain old C sharp class. Nothing fancy about it. It extends Xamarin Forms content page. Cool. Again, it's got int, but rather than using XAML to declare the components, we've got we've got it declared in the code itself. So we've still got a label. We've still got a button. We still set properties on the label, such as text. In our case, we set it to be the string value of that count property. We've got a button, just like you'd expect, with some text on it. And then we set up an event handler for when the button's clicked. In this case, it's called in this method here. Then I decided to put this inside of a grid, 
just to make laying it out easier. And so we de declare it in code. It's just setting it up with some columns and some rows, then adding the label to it and the button and just telling it where to place those items, setting the content to be the, and then setting the content to be the grid. At the bottom here, we've got that private method. It's exactly the same as you saw before. Increase the count by one and set the text to be that value as a string. Cool. If we, right, so we're going to just do this. So that's both ways you can do it. You can do it in, uh, yeah, in code or XAML, which gives you a lot of options. XAML is the most common that you'll see. Most people I know, including myself, use XAML, and most of the docs are done in XAML. And of course, you can, if you watch Maddie's session before, you'll know about a load of the amazing things coming to XAML, like hot reload and hot restart. So XAML is probably the best place to start. But if you, for whatever reason, do choose to do C Sharp, that is fine. I know very good Xamarin developers who write C Sharp UIs. So the choice is yours. So we've seen the building blocks, but how do we make better looking applications? You know, so these images here are just a couple of pictures that I stole of apps. So Stephen, who you would have watched give a talk earlier, he's made this really cool app here. And then my friend Kim Philpott also uh, does really cool apps. And again, this is another app that he put together. And as you can see, they look much more professional than my terrible attempts because you can start adding styling to make things look better. But when it comes to how you apply that styling, you've got a few options of how you can start making it look better. So you can add attributes in the individual components, which you saw in my the app before, my counter app, where there were attributes on the XAML for the color, the font size, uh, even the location of where the component was positioned on the page. You can also do page-wide styling declared in the XAML file, or you can do, so you can just declare it at the top of the page, or you can do app-wide styling in app.xaml, which as you start doing larger applications where you want, where there's multiple pages and you no doubt want a consistent theme, this is where you start. Then there's CSS support. Now, we all know that CSS is a bit contentious in mobile and a lot of people have opinions, but it is an option that I wanted to share with you because as web developers, you know, CSS is something you're familiar with. It is a subset of the web CSS. It's not uh, everything you can do in the CSS for your websites you can do in, in Xamarin's implementation of CSS, but it's still an option for you. And one of the cool things as well is that you can control the styling based on the media. So you might be used to something like media selector, where you might control it based on screen size or whether it's a phone. We have something called on device idiom. So you can say, oh, if I'm on a TV or a, or a tablet, lay out like this. If you're on or look like this, if you're on a watch, look like this. And the reason for that will be literally the just the sheer change in screen size and what you can fit in. So you imagine, you know, for example, I've got a 55 inch TV. The amount of things I could fit on a page is vast compared to something like my Apple Watch. If you try to fit the same number of components on both, on an Apple Watch it would look stupidly cramped and on a TV it would probably just look empty. So you do sometimes want to start thinking about things like how you handle the sizes on a different uh, platform. It might be that you have an almost menu and sort of detail when you select a menu item kind of layout on a tablet or a TV, but on a watch, you maybe just want to show a menu, for example, of just a few buttons, and then it takes you to the individual pages rather than showing you too much at once. Just have a look at how you might beautify your applications. So as you saw earlier in my counter example, we just set attributes on the individual component. So as you can imagine, this only applies to that one label on this one page. Again, with the button, I didn't do anything fancy with the styling apart from the font size. So that's that's great. That's one way of doing it. 
The other thing you can do, and wish me luck here, because this didn't go very well earlier. Just going to zoom in. We're just going to switch branches quickly to something called CSS. This wouldn't... Let's see. Right, let's reload this. Let's see if the demo gods are on my side. Ah, oh, look, they are. Would you believe it? Cool. The checkout failed earlier, so I thought it was going to go wrong. I was prepared to open it in Visual Studio Code. But we're okay. I mentioned before about the app, the page-wide styling that you could apply at the top of a page. So this would fall under this content page resources tag, I believe. I might be wrong, so I do apologize. I don't ever do it like this, so it is, I could be wrong. But as you can see, we just declare a style sheet. So we've got the same components again. We've got a label with some text. We set its name. We've got the button. It calls the same method with the same text on it. But there's no attributes around the styling. And that's because, as you can see here, we have a style sheet and set its source to a file called styles.css. So if we just have a quick look at styles.css, it's as you'd expect. This is a pretty bare bones CSS file, but we're saying on the label, set the font size to 70 in the color to aquamarine. So it's still the same as you would have seen in the XAML. And then on the button again, we just do the font size. So it's achieving the same goal, but with CSS. Then, of course, we've got app-wide styling. So I'm going to jump to an app that I did not write. So here we have a app that James put together, actually. So thanks, James, called Monkey Finder. He makes much prettier, much more functional apps than I do. So I thought, since I don't even write code for a living anymore, I'll borrow his. So here we've got our app.saml. And once we've been through this, I'll show you what it looks like when it's running. But we've just got a resource dictionary that sets some application values. So we've got what is equivalent of key value pairs here to set some colors. So give it a name and a value. Then we have a style. So we're saying that you can apply it to a button. So you could set this target type to a label or whatever else you want to style and then give it a key. So you can say if you're writing your button, for example, you can say that the style is button outline and then it will apply these properties under here so it will set the background color the text color which is a static resource so that's referring to these colors up here then you've just got other properties that you can set so it's setting a border width the height request corner radius i believe in the web world is called board uh, border radius but yeah corner radius and border radius are the same thing and then visual material is just saying that regardless of whether it's on Android, iOS, or UWP, apply Android's material um, styling. So it will look the same regardless of the app. Because out of the box, Xamarin is native, which means that when it's built down to the components on, a, on an app level on the phones you wouldn't or devices, you wouldn't have a clue whether it was Xamarin or native tooling. And so it will have the native look and feel of this platform. So this visual property just lets you apply the same Android material design across the platforms. So if we have a look at that running now to see how it looks. Later on, we'll go into a bit more detail about this application. But I just wanted to show you what's happening. So we'll quickly just run this now. So I'm going to do a here's what I prepared earlier style. So we can minimize that and we can go to Monkey Finder. So this has got the button theming that you saw before with the yellow outline and the, the white background. If we click it, it will go ahead and bring up some monkeys and some details and very pretty, very pretty images of monkeys because we love monkeys in the Xamarin community. Monkey is a hot, hot property. So that's just the app, and you can find the closest if you want to. We can allow it to search on the internet. But that might take too long, so we'll come back to that afterwards if we've got time. So if we just jump into the code again, and we can have a look how it was done. So as I mentioned earlier, a lot of apps written in, in Xamarin forms use the MVVM architecture, and this app is no different. So we've got our view, which is got, don't worry too much about this stuff, but yeah, if we've got a grid, 
So you saw me declare a grid in C sharp, and now you can see it in action in in XAML. Then you've got the list view, which is just displaying those items. It's got Xamarin Forms data binding, and you declare it with these brackets in the word binding. And then you can scroll down, and there's the list view, and there's other bits going on. You set the grid and the image and whatnot. So it's all fairly straightforward. It's just using um, yeah, XAML with some data binding. If we look at the code behind briefly, you'll see that we set something called the binding context, which is just saying to it, hey, this is where you go and find the properties for what it should look like. Sorry, not what it should look like. Where, where you set the bindings, it's going to look for the properties of those bindings to know what to display and how to, you know, what to do. And that's where it's saying, hey, go to the view model. So if we have a look at that view model, we have this monkey's view model. If you look here, it actually extends something called base view model, because with data binding, you need to do updates so that not only does it know that this properties, you know, this UI component is looking at this property, but when something changes, you need it to know about it. And it uses I notify property changed. You may have seen this before. It's just C sharp. It's not Xamarin. It comes from the system namespace. And it just has a few properties on it which are shared, but of course we want to look at the view model for the, the actual monkey view model that extends it. So it's just got some commands, so when the button is clicked, it's got that list of monkeys, and then we just set some details. So these options down here, this code is available online and I do share it, I'll share it later, so don't worry too much about what's going on, but it's just plain old CLR. What's it? Plain old POCO, isn't it? Plain old C sharp object, I don't know, but yeah, it's just C sharp and it's a view model with some properties with data binding built in. All fairly straightforward stuff. And then at the model level, we've just got a monkey with some properties on it. It uses newtonsoft.json. So again, just a really great C sharp library, nothing Xamarin specific. So we've seen that running and we've seen how it's built with MVVM and the styling. So if we go back to the slides again. So I just want to take a few minutes to talk about some other things that might matter to you with your applications. So native features. You may well kind of be used to some of these things for stuff like geolocation. I know a lot of the time when you want to achieve certain things, you would, imp you would grab a JavaScript library and start doing that. And wanting native features is no different in Xamarin. In fact, I'd say it's even more important because you're using devices with extra features like cameras and, and you know battery life and whatnot. And that's where something called Xamarin Essentials comes in. So Xamarin Essentials is a really great source of uh, nat sort of shared sort of libraries for, I suppose libraries, APIs for native features. So a lot of the time with Xamarin, if you want to, or previously before Xamarin Essentials, a lot of the features you'd have to write custom, custom controls to achieve that, which you'd have to go into the platform level and write native code, as it were, but in C sharp for you know the things in. So iOS, it might be a UI something in android you'd have to do something else and you'd declare those components how it's done and then you'd have it in the shared that you'd reference and when it's run on those platforms it would look in the shared project but that gets confusing and it's quite complicated to implement so what happened was a load of generous people in the community often with james involved would create libraries so that you didn't have to worry about how to do it on those platforms you just call it from your shared code and as more and more of those plugins were created, out came Xamarin Essentials. So Xamarin Essentials is now automatically included as a new get in all new Xamarin Forms projects. So you already have access to all these great features out of the box. So whether that's accelerometer, the file system, connectivity, battery life, I think 60 plus APIs available now in Xamarin Essentials. So there's you know, so much to cover. And Essentials is 100% linker safe. So your app will only include the parts of Essentials that, it, that you're actually using. So if you're looking at all of these and thinking, oh my God, having all of these available in my app must cause it to be giant and take ages to download and forever to open. Nope, 
not to worry, none of that bloat is there because the linker strips out anything that you're not using. If you are interested in Xamarin Essentials, James does a whole series of uh, called Xamarin Essentials APR of the Week, which I'll share a link to later, which shows you how to get up and running, usually with just a few lines of code, sometimes even one. And you know you can get started straight away making use of some of these features, which can be really, really powerful. Another thing that's important is authentication, because your personal identity is a key part of both websites and mobile apps. Logging in is so common these days, you don't even think about it. I mean, today I think I've logged into Twitter, Facebook, email, uh, Nintendo Online, because, um, yeah, Animal Crossing. So it's, you know, it's important. So what can Xamarin do? So like with, you know, websites and things, there's a lot of social authentication that, it, that you can implement. It's just C Sharp. So you can log in with your Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, or even use, rather than social authentication, do Microsoft's, Microsoft authentication library with Azure AD B2C. What's cool is that Azure AD B2C not only handles who you are, but what you have access to within um, Azure, such as other services, which brings me nicely on to authorization. So you're used to that little buddy right there, cookies. Cookies is what you use, to, uh, no doubt, to store lots of little snippets of information about your users, whether it's information they want to remember, like passwords and usernames, or something else. And you want to do the same in Xamarin, but it doesn't use cookies. And so I mentioned a good example that I quite like to explain this stuff is a, a switch on your app for remembering your username. So you might have a login page and you might say, remember me. So you can bind the is toggled property of the switch to a property and then store that. And that's where Xamarin Essentials preferences comes in. Preferences gives you almost the equivalent of cookies, but obviously they work differently under the hood, but the concept of having somewhere to save small snippets of data. So preferences is really easy to get started with, as you can see from this code snippet here. So you've got uh, this, you could have it bind to a ball property called remember me. And if you want to actually get the value, so when the app starts, it sets the toggle to whatever it was previously, you just call preferences.get the name of the property you want to fetch and then a default value. Of course, you want it to be false as a default. So if it can't get the value out or it hasn't, one hasn't been set yet, it's just false. To set it, it's just the same. You just call set one line of code again, what you want to call it, so the key and then the value, and then just obviously a bit of error handling. Yeah, that's fine. I can be done in one minute. We have one slide left. So we've got the, uh, so we've talked about the, the, how you'd log in and how you'd remember things. And we've talked about all this stuff that you can do with Xamarin, but you're probably thinking, but Loose, we're web developers. And not so long ago, we heard about something called experimental Blazor mobile bindings. So what the experimental Blazor mobile bindings is, is it uses Razor syntax to define UI components and behaviors. And it's based on Xamarin Forms, so you'll see some similarities. There's stack layouts, there's labels, there's buttons. But I still like Xamarin, and I still think Xamarin has a place, especially because the Blazor stuff is experimental. But if you do have an interest in it, then there was, of course, a Focus on Blazor event back in January. The recordings are available on the I believe it'll be Channel 9's YouTube channel, so you can go back and watch a session on the Blazor mobile bindings if you want to learn more. So today we've talked about two parts of the platform. We've looked at web and mobile and how you can use your love and knowledge of C Sharp and .NET to get started with Xamarin. It's really cool. It's really exciting. Hopefully you, you get as excited by it as I do and you're keen to get started. Here we have a bit.ly link, which just takes you to a, uh, a gist, gist, whatever you want to say, on GitHub with some links in it. So that's the docs, James's Xamarin API of the week, Xamarin 101, which is an amazing series to help you get started. Also Xamarin Forms 101 and just some other stuff to get started. And with that, thank you very much. I'll take time for questions. Hopefully they're not too difficult. 
Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, we're at time, so we have some great questions and we will follow up with them on Twitter. And now I'm heading it back to James, who has our next speakers. Awesome. Thank you, Olia and Luce. I love coming in from the website. It's always new to me, so I can actually go the reverse now. Now that I know the Xamarin part, go to ASP.NET. Now I'm really excited to my favorite individuals in the entire world are here with me. There's a dual presentation to talk about dual screen devices. Craig Dunn and Guy Marin, I'll let them take it away. Thanks, James. Hi, I'm Craig. And I'm Guy. Um, thanks for joining our presentation today. Let me start. Welcome to our session on developing dual screen experiences with Xamarin. Today, we're going to quickly introduce you to the world of dual screen devices and explain how to get started building dual screen apps using C-sharp, Xamarin, and Visual Studio. Let's start by taking a look at two upcoming dual screen devices from Microsoft, the Surface Neo and the Surface Duo. As you can see, both of these devices have distinctly separate screens, similar to having two monitors on your desktop computer. They're joined by a hinge that allows the screens to fold into different positions. Holding and using them feels a lot different to interacting with just a tablet or a laptop. This creates opportunities for new ways to present information and new ways for people to interact with your apps. Besides the obvious size difference, there's one other thing you should know about them. The Surface Neo runs Windows 10X, and the Surface Duo runs Android. This is fantastic for the breadth of apps available on these platforms, but for some developers, it might present a challenge. How can we build apps that work on both these devices when they run completely different operating systems? It's a trick question, of course. Everyone watching knows the answer is Xamarin. With Xamarin Forms, we can build cross-platform apps that target UWP and Android, so we can support both devices, regardless of operating system or number of screens. Let's talk a little about the dual screen user experience and then see how Xamarin Forms makes it easy to build apps that take advantage of them. Here, you can see the Surface Duo being held in a book-like position. This is the key selling point of dual screen. They expand the capabilities of our devices in a natural way. Existing apps are definitely supported. Devices can fold into what we call flip mode, where they only show one screen and behave just like any other mobile device. When unfolded, existing apps continue to just work, except now they can run side by side, one per screen. Comparing and sharing data all becomes easier, especially with drag and drop. But the best experience occurs when apps are expanded and optimized for both screens. They can now offer new ways of presenting information and new ways for the user to interact with it. What might these interactions look like? Here's a summary of the different postures the devices can be placed in. The first row is similar to existing devices, a single screen in portrait or landscape orientation. Note that the Surface Neo has a unique landscape orientation with its hardware keyboard applied and the wonder bar visible. But when the devices are unfolded and using both screens, they enable the postures in the second row. In dual portrait or wide mode, it almost feels like you have two phones side by side. Users might prefer to be multitasking in this mode with two screens being used to separate or compare or to share content. In dual landscape or tall mode, users often want to use the entire area to focus on one task. So the two screens are often used to expand the content area for a single app. When the app is expanded to take up two screens, we say that it has been spanned across the screens. It can be spanned in two orientations, and we say tall and wide to prevent confusion with single screen layouts. One last piece of terminology, we call the space between the two screens, the seam or hinge. On the Surface Duo device, the seam represents pixels that aren't drawn, so app content can be hidden behind it. On the Surface Neo, the seam has zero width, so that's a difference to be aware of. We have a custom control available to help you take this into account automatically, but we'll cover that shortly. These five common UI patterns are able to help you tailor your app user experience to what they're trying to accomplish. Think of them as a framework to help you think about the ways your app can take advantage of dual screen devices. Each of the two screens should have a specific and well-defined purpose in the user's workflow. We don't want to expand to two screens to make apps more confusing or hard to use. We're going to examine each of these in more detail and then look at the Xamarin Forms, XAML, and C Sharp to implement them. 
Extend Canvas is very simple. An app's view resizes to take up the additional screen. While it's the simplest dual screen pattern, it's still powerful and a great way for some types of visual data to be consumed. You might consider this pattern if your app has a free-flowing canvas where the user is able to scroll around under the scene, or if you need a bigger canvas for tasks such as drawing. Excel sheets, maps, and drawing apps are all good candidates for this pattern. Master detail is already a common pattern in mobile and desktop apps. There is a master pane, usually with a list view, and a details pane with more content. When an item in the master list is selected, the corresponding details are displayed. The list could be text or images or anything really. In this view, it's important to consider what happens when the device is rotated into dual landscape mode. Users often intend to focus on the detail content with that posture, so consider hiding the master list. Examples of apps that suit this style include email, to-do lists, photo browsing, and other data structures where the user might drill down to individual items in a list. In tall mode, email or photo apps would typically hide the list view and use both screens as a scrollable view of the detail item, say your individual email message or a photo that you want to look at. Look at. The next one, two page, is for apps that work with a book-like navigation, so scrolling back and forth between pages. You can use the division created by the seam and the book-like posture of the devices to create a natural feeling where people can move between pages, like text or pictures, in a scrolling fashion. E-readers are an obvious application for this pattern, but it can also be used for content creation, such as a notes app or a drawing tool where the data is entered but conceptually navigated like a book. Dual view is subtly different to master detail. In this case, the two screens provide a way to compare or to contrast versions of the same content side by side, like two images, two lists, or two documents. Alternatively, you can provide different perspectives on the same data. An example of the first case might be a markdown document showing source editing on one side and a preview rendering on the other. An example of the second style might be a restaurant booking app where a map with markers could appear on one screen and the same list of restaurants on the other screen. It's conceptually the same data, but you've provided two different views for the user to manipulate, letting them dynamically choose how they want to interact with the content. A key element of the dual view is keeping them synchronized to reflect changes as the user interacts with them. And last but not least, the companion pane. Companion pane lends itself to exposing otherwise hidden UI that wouldn't be easily accessible with a single screen. For instance, show complementary context to augment the task the user was working on by elevating buried functionality for quicker access. The functionality should still be available in single screen mode, but it might be hidden by menus or buttons or other multi-steps. An example is creative tools like an image drawing app which could be placed, could be placing the canvas on one screen and using the other to hold the brightness and contrast and filtering tools. Another example is gaming. Single screen devices often have the controls overlaid on the game viewport, but a second screen allows for dedicated controls without obscuring the graphics. That's all the patterns. But before we get into demos, here's a few simple do's and don'ts for dual screen layouts. Firstly, Avoid positioning app elements under the seam, especially when presenting actions the user needs to take. The operating system will attempt to do this for system dialogues, but you should manage your app layouts with this in mind. Also, avoid spreading lists of options, menus, or command palettes across both screens. Choose which screen to display these options so that the user can see relevant information on the other screen. Similarly, be mindful of where the keyboard appears when entering text. Take advantage of both screens to keep the customer in their flow. If the device is rotated while the app is spanned, make sure to move UI elements to a logical position in the new layout. Choose a location that makes the most sense for what the user is trying to accomplish. And finally, look for opportunities to use the UI patterns we just discussed to group or represent content using the seam as a boundary. So given these layout ideas and tips, what have we done to make it easy for you as .NET developers to take advantage of dual screens? 
Xamarin can help developers target dual screen applications and devices in a couple of ways. The first is the most obvious, it's cross-platform. Xamarin already runs on Android and UWP for Windows 10X, so you can build your app once and deploy it to both styles of dual screen device. The second way we can help is with a set of methods that provide information about the device. Is the app spanned across two screens? What are the coordinates of the scene? Does my app need to detect changes in the hinge angle? All of this information is available in a new get that you can use to do the calculations to lay out your own views to take advantage of dual screen devices. And the third way we can help is with layout controls that will automatically help place the content on one screen or two screens while still being configurable and letting you override the behavior. All this is available now with Xamarin Forms. You can add the Xamarin Forms dual screen preview NuGet to your apps today to start playing with these APIs. Here's a closer look at the dual screen info class. Spanning bounds gives you rectangles for each screen that the app is visible on. Only one rectangle on regular devices or if the app is a single screen, but two if it's spanned. Hinge bounds is the opposite. It gives you the area of pixels hidden by the seam. As I mentioned earlier, the Surface Duo and Surface Neo handle this differently, but if you code against the values from this API, you shouldn't have any issues. Is landscape returns dual screen aware landscape status. And span mode tells you the state of the app, whether it's on just one screen or if it's on two screens in tall or wide mode. There's an event, property changed, which will let you listen to changes to any of these values so that you can adjust your layouts manually. And finally, Get Hinge Angle Async lets you query the angle between the two screens for innovative user experiences that revolve around how the user is opening or closing the device. The second item is the new layout control, two-pane view. Here you can see the most simple XAML for two-pane view. At the moment, it supports content views as its children. So here you can map uh, a search videos view and a browse videos view um, side by side on a screen. On a single screen device, they'll still be side by side. On a dual screen device, when they're spanned, they'll appear either side of the scene. If you want to change that behavior, the two pane view has a number of additional configuration options. The first four bolded attributes apply no matter whether there is one screen or two. They can be used to force different layouts in tall and wide mode. For example, have one pane take up the entire two screens in tall, but not in wide mode. The last four options are only applied on single screens. They help the layout reason about what to do with the two views when only one screen is available. Recall that the tall and wide modes we referred to are the dual portrait and dual landscape positions that we mentioned earlier. In wide mode, the two screens are actually both in portrait. It takes a get a bit, get, bit of getting used to uh, thinking about the differences. The controls measurements are based on a grid. So the length values are relative and can be specified with one star, two star, etc. You don't need to specify exact pixels, which is helpful when scaling up from a duo to a neo or even to desktop apps. I've shown most of the properties as data binding here, but of course you can also set them directly in your code behind. Let's jump over to the emulators and Visual Studio and see these patterns in action in the Xamarin Forms dual screen sample. There's Xamarin Forms. So uh, before we start looking at the code, um, for everyone that's just getting started with dual screen devices, there are two emulators. They're both available in the start menu after that you installed them. So Surface Duo emulator. Yep. Oh, thanks for that tip, got it. Now let's go to Visual Studio. Thanks, James. So let's try that again. 
when you install uh, the emulators, they both appear in the start menu. So the Surface Duo emulator for Windows and the Microsoft emulator, which contains the Windows 10X. Um, oh, shoot. Tell me now. Okay, let's see the start menu and Surface Duo emulator and the Microsoft emulator. So here we have Windows 10X, dual screen emulator, and here we have the Android emulator. When you first install them, they won't automatically show up in Windows, in, in Visual Studio as a deployment target, but, you can, but once they're started, the Android emulator will show up for deployment and the Windows 10X emulator can be installed in Visual Studio via its uh, um, control panel. So you can easily get your apps deploying on both of them. If we have a look at the devices other than the two screens, they have some other similarities. When we uh, start an app, uh, it, takes, uh, it opens in the screen that we started it in. We can move the app from screen to screen and to cause a spanning to occur, you just wait for the ghost image to appear across both screens and uh, the 10X takes a bit longer, um, but you know the app will span and then we can move it back to a single screen and we can cause rotation and we can uh, span again. And you've just seen some of the layouts that uh, occur with uh, the dual screen view. So these are the two emulators. Let's actually dive in and see some demos. I want to start with some of the patterns that we just looked at, um, beginning with, I guess, the simplest one, Extend Canvas. While it's the simplest pattern, it's still useful for things like maps. Um, and it's kind of easy to build because if your app already supports resizing, um, it's probably going to do just fine spanned across two screens. So here it goes, spanned. And here's a lesson about the, the do's and don'ts. Here, uh, the seam covers up the place mark that we entered. So an, uh, an update that you might want to do to this application would be when you're in spanned, um, maybe move the place mark a bit to one of the screens rather than leave it in the center. Let's skip back to Visual Studio and see how that works. So Visual Studio dual screen demos. First thing to note, the dual screen nougat is installed and a tip before we start that in your Android main activity, um, remember to call init. So for those of you that are gonna go and get started with dual screen apps right after this, install the NuGet, add the init, and you're ready to go. The Extend Canvas SAML is extremely simple. It turns out it's just a content page containing a grid. Um, and you know, there's really nothing in the code behind either. So you can actually build apps that are gonna work well in spanned mode on dual screen devices without really taking advantage of any of the additional functionality that um, we're offering. But it's really just a baseline or a starting point. And like I said, if you wanted to move the marker a bit to the left, um, you'd wanna include some of our APIs to help you do that. Uh, a good example of that is the two page view. So the two-page view, uh, if you recall, is the one that feels like a book. So in wide mode, you have two pages. And if I go back to a single, um, we have one page, which is great. Um, but you'll recall also, I mentioned it's kind of nice when you're in tall mode to use the entire area to consume a piece of content. So in tall mode, if I span and go into two-page view, you can see the navigation has changed. It's scrolling up and down, and the entire page is taking up both screens. So that's 
you know, a nice adaptation to how the users might want to, to use this style of interaction. If we go and look at the code, so here's two-page view XAML, you'll see once again, actually it's just a grid uh, and within that a collection view. And we're taking advantage of the collection view's ability to be <laughs> super flexible. Um, so we have a linear item layout that's just laying things out, uh, scrolling left to right. Uh, it's an horizontal orientation. Um, and you'll notice though, that for the item spacing, the binding is to hinge width. So this has got a really neat trick where it's just using regular features of Xamarin Forms linear layout of an item of a collection view and the, the spacing of the the pages is the the width of the hinge so it automatically is going to avoid that uh, seam area as the pages are rendering and scrolling so if we look a bit further down at the actual page sizing you'll see that that's also a binding to content width and content height uh, and those two values are also being driven by the dual screen info SDK, um, even though we're using regular Xamarin Forms controls, where dual screen enabling them by linking them to uh, properties from the helper class. So here we are in the code behind. The list is just a thousand pages, so there's nothing special there. Um, we wire up the property change events but the really interesting thing, like we said, content height and content width are properties that are bound um, in the XAML. But here's where the, the magic happens. Uh, we have the panel heights and the hinge width all being set from the dual screen layout info class um, for different properties. So we're looking for the spanning bounds for the heights for panel one and two. And you recall I mentioned the spanning bounds are the two, rectang two rectangles that this method returns if the application is spanned across two screens. And you'll notice that if it is spanned, they both get um, height zero and height one because those two rectangles exist. If the spanning is false, the first one gets its height, but the second one is zero because when we're not spanned, we're only, playing, we're only showing one page. So we effectively collapse the second pane uh, and it's not displayed. Uh, and the hinge width is similarly using dual screen loud info um, and you know defaulting to zero if it's not there. So that actually takes care of if this is gonna be on the Surface Neo as well, um, the hinge width for, for that device is zero. So it's a neat way to take advantage of dual screen info properties from the device and using traditional Xamarin Forms controls to create a two-screen aware layout. So let's go back. And the next one is going to, is, you know, probably the most popular layout uh, and that is master detail. So it looks exactly like you'd expect on a dual screen device, a list on the left and a uh, detail on the right. If we take it down to a single screen, notice that when I click, the, the second screen animates in. It's really behaving like a master detail um, with you know, back gestures working to take us back to the previous, uh, previous screen. So let's take a look at how that's implemented because there's a little bit more to it. Here in the master detail screen, uh, it's a pretty vanilla implementation of two pane view. We've got a master page and a details page within the two panes. And we're using the min wide mode and min tall mode properties to basically force single page, single view to only show the master page. So the master page itself is a collection view Nothing special there, pure Xamarin forms. For the details view, um, again, it's just a regular Xamarin view. It's got a grid and some labels and so on. But because we're using the detail in two different ways, here we're opening it in a new content page um, to get that navigation style. And when it's spanned, we're just updating 
a pane in our two-pane two view. So in addition to the detailed view, we create a details view container page, which is the one that we can use to pop it open when we're on a single screen. Uh, and if you look at the master detail code, I'm skipping through a lot of uh, you know, vanilla Xamarin Forms code that you all know and love, um, and just trying to look for where you can see dual screen info is being taken advantage of to enable the dual screen behavior on, on these controls. So you'll notice here, if it's testing for landscape, it's testing for spanned, um, setting the binding context for the data. And if it's not spanned and it hasn't already been pushed, um, we're using the standard Xamarin Forms navigation to push the details page onto the navigation stack rather than using the the side by side. So, if you're interested in implementing master detail, this pattern in combination with the current version of the two pane view is going to be very helpful. Now, I'm not going to dive into uh, the other two because they're very similar to master detail. Um, I want to jump straight over to the two pane view black um, playground. This is the sample that I would recommend everyone go straight to um, when they start using two pane view to kind of understand uh, the kind of options and functionality that it provides. So I mentioned earlier the, the, the heights and the lengths, they're only really important when you're in a single pane. And you'll notice if I increase the length of this one and decrease the length of that one, I can make it disappear. Um, if I span, sometimes the mouse makes this tricky. Oops. Oh, there we go. Got it. Got it. Got it. Uh, there we go. I can. You know, those, those lengths make no effect because it's spanned across the two screens. We know where the panes are going to be. But we can change the layout. So we're in wide mode. So we can affect wide mode for configuration by sending it to single pane, which pops the screen across. Or we can choose right, left, which um, <laughs> switches them back, back and forth. So this is a really neat way of just interactively exploring those um, properties on the two pane view that I showed earlier in the slides um, to let you get a sense of how you can achieve the layout you want that works for single screens, it works for dual screens, uh, and best represents the user interface that you want uh, your user to have. And uh, before we leave it, I just want to mention there's a hinge angle there. Uh, you can test the hinge angle on the emulator. It's bound at the moment for, for development purposes to the pressure uh, slider. So if you want to have some fun building apps that care about the angle of the hinge, uh, you can do that there too. So that's a quick look at, you know, the different levels of integration you can have our new controls. Uh, the expanded view just didn't use any Xamarin um, dual screen specific stuff at all. And the master detail is really heavily based on the two pane view. And you know, there's, there's levels in between, it's really up to you. Uh, and what you want to accomplish with your app's user interface. So, heading back to the slides, I just quickly took some screenshots of that same uh, layout test on a single screen device and on a larger screen device so that you can see, you know, the kinds of things that you can accomplish. So, uh, you can very carefully um, tweak your, your UI for um, any, any screen size and style uh, with a two-pane view control. And no real demo would be complete without uh, a production-looking app. So I think we're uh, running out of time, but I just want to quickly show you Xamarin TV, uh, and I'd encourage you to download this one as well and have a play with it and look at the code. So I don't need to deploy it. It's already installed on the emulator. Maybe we can get it running on Windows 10X as well. Oops, I've uh, ran out my demo lock. It appears. 
Well, oh, wait, here we go. So the, yes, I refuse up my luck. Um, so the, the Summer TV app is a fantastic looking app. Um, I think those emulators have just been running a little bit too long. Um, oh, wait, here we go. There's Maddie. Um, it's using two, the two pane view in both port, in single screen and dual screen mode. It's got a really cool um, ink capability. Um, and uh, it's starting up over here too. Anyway, let's uh, let's save some time and come and look at the static screenshots. Um, it does a really great job of demonstrating the use of two pane view with a sophisticated user interface that's 100% MM MVVM so that it's driven by a navigation service, data binding, and state triggers, which is a relatively new addition to, to Xamarin Forms that makes it really easy to uh, affect your UI and keep state in a really natural way if you're an MVVM developer. So I encourage everyone to take a look at that code. Now, once you're ready to get uh, your apps updated for dual screen devices, um, we have a couple of steps that we suggest. First, download the emulators that we just looked at uh, and test your app. Use it in single screen mode, both in portrait and landscape to verify it works well. Uh, and then try spanning it across the screens and start to think about how you might enhance that experience. Second, make incremental changes to work better on dual screen devices. You don't have to immediately adopt two pane view. Um, some of the other things that I mentioned about tweaking the UI might be enough. Um, additions like multi-instance, pen input, drag and drop, uh, and other fan Android features can benefit all your users but really shine on dual screen devices. And third, using the UI patterns we just talked about and the APIs and layouts provided by Xamarin Forms, start to implement dual screen specific navigation and interactions that really take advantage of both screens. Uh, I hope today's talk, despite the little snafu at the end, uh, has got you starting to think about new ways to engage your customers and take the first step by downloading the developer tools today. Here are some resources. Um, I don't expect you to remember all these links. Um, I bet everyone on the video call today has been to docs.microsoft.com before. So if you can remember docs.microsoft.com slash dual screen, you'll be able to find your way to all of the other links here. Um, I think, I don't know, I'll see if we have time for questions, but please reach out to Guy and myself on Twitter. Um, our uh, links are there at the end. And uh, otherwise, don't forget to use the .NET comp hashtag when you ask your questions and uh, maybe win a Xamarin Monkey. Awesome. Thank you, Craig and Guy. Now, we do have some questions for both of you. Um, I know Guy's been waiting for all of the questions. First was David. Actually, it's not a uh, question. It's actually a comment. It says, everything we've seen so far is amazing, especially all the dual screen stuff. Thank you for contributors and developers for having time. He's watching from South Korea, which is awesome. We do have some dual screen questions, actually. Um, one that came in from Robert. He says, he's starting to build out and extend um, his application and taking a look at all the great samples on the Microsoft repo. His question was, I am writing to ask if a beta program is available to obtain hardware. Um, Android emulators are fabulous, but the next step is to get it onto a device. Now, I'm sure this is a tricky question, so I figured I'd ask both of you. Craig, do you want me to take it? Yes, please. Now, if you guys so stop let me start by screen saying, sharing if you want to. Let me start to. by saying that the, the device is real. Uh, let me actually show it to you in a second here. So devices are real and we are testing them now. Turn off my backward effect. Let me turn off the, the backward effect here one second. Devices are real. I have a device here that I'm uh, testing uh, uh, today. Um, actually, I have a couple of them um, lying around because I'm testing multiple options here. Um, right now, we are not opening it for beta, uh, but we will in the future, uh, in a few, probably in a few months. Uh, however, the emulator will get you started pretty much with everything. And I can safely say that in the next couple of weeks, probably around two weeks, we're adding more support for the emulator itself to have all the postures 
and supporting a flip mode and a fold and all the other things that you can actually achieve on a uh, on a physical device only. We're adding all that support in the emulator. Uh, we just had a chat with Google today about you know how do we contribute back to the QME Android emulator framework and uh, you know that's something that we're going to do together with them um, because other foldable uh, um, device manufacturers can actually utilize those changes as well. So this is something that we're adding uh, and will come uh, in one of our uh, upcoming uh, refreshes. With that said, yes, we will open it to uh, uh, to beta for um, uh, for app developers to try on devices, uh, but we're not there yet. Gotcha. A question I had. The on... best way the, be the best way to 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 know the current status is just to follow our uh, weekly blogs. Uh, you saw it there in uh, uh, in the decks, and we have a reference from the dual screen documentation. And every week we provide updates on the refreshes and on the beta program. That's probably the best way to to know what's going on. Nice. Awesome. Other question I saw actually come in on YouTube. I was checking out the YouTube comments. Someone said, you know, you have the so many emulators. You have the 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 the, the Neo Windows 10X emulator and the Duo emulator. What type of dev machine are developers going to need for this type of setup? Uh, I, I can cover that as well, Craig, if you want. So our goal is hashtag meet developers where they are at. So you can use whatever. Um, machines you yeah, um, you're using today um, will meet you if you are using a Windows PC device, uh, a Mac. Um, right now, for Linux, we're supporting Ubuntu, Debian. Um, we just added support for uh, for Chromebooks. Um, so wherever the Android emulator runs in terms of uh, uh, RAM and uh, uh, Hyper-V. Um, you can run the Surface Duo emulator uh, as well, and all these platforms. In terms of uh, IDEs, you can use Android Studio uh, if you're a hardcore uh, native uh, Android developer. Um, of course, most of us here are .NET developers, so Visual Studio. We're adding support for Visual Studio Code to be able to deploy as well. Um, so you know you can use all those. Wherever you're developing, whatever machine you're developing on, dual screen yes. devices. Yes. Awesome. All right, we're out of time for this session. Thank you so much, Guy and Craig, for showing off amazing dual screen stuff. I can't wait to get my hands on one. We're going to kick it back over to Olia next. All right, and we're moving on, and the next talk will be about Xamarin Forms Shell. I have our next speaker, Shane Neville, with us, with the amazing Xamarin Monkey on the background, and he's going to tell us about all things Xamarin Forms Shell. Shane. Hello. Let's see. Let me get my screen sharing here. We good? You can see me? OK. Cool. All right. Let's minimize our little Teams window here. <clears throat> yeah, so welcome to .NET Conf. Uh, thank you for having me, James and everyone. I've been had some really good talks. Really enjoyed the dual screen stuff. <laughs> that stuff's very exciting. So. Um, excited to work on some scenarios there with Shell as well, so that'll be cool. Speaking of, I'm here to talk about Xamarin Forms Shell. Uh, I'm a senior engineer here at Microsoft on the Xamarin Forms team. I've been here about two years, and yeah, I do a lot of work on Shell, so I figured I would uh, kind of let you in on everything that we've been doing. So the first question, obviously, for, all, for anybody who hasn't um, already been using Shell, what is Shell? So the core idea of Shell <coughs> was to provide a declarative application structure. So the idea here is that apps always have a, uh, an intrinsic structure, uh, almost like a site map, or uh, on, on iOS terms, you might call it like a storyboard, something that kind of articulates where you navigate to, uh, what links to what, et cetera. So we wanted to kind of bring that same experience to Xamarin Forms. So that, that's what Shell was born out of. The other nice thing that happens once you have this declarative application structure is it lets you simplify navigation. So if you know what is a child of what and where things sort of lay out, you can kind of just let navigation naturally flow. What it also lets you do is it lets you really easily uh, articulate from a coding standpoint where you want to go in the application. So in Shell, we have everything represented by strings 
like your routes and things like that. So you can just say, hey, I want to go to this place in the application, and you know what, I want to, I want this to be my navigation stack, which is really nice over the kind of the non-shell way of navigating. Ease of customization is also a big uh, focus on shell. So the idea of being able to sort of theme your shell application. So you want to be able to just take shell, uh, define your theme at the shell level, and then that sort of permeates through all the different areas. So there's no need to sort of like <laughs> set it up on each different page, et cetera, et cetera. All of this sort of comes together in, in a rapid, app, rapid development application experience. Because with everything just kind of tying together and all of the UIs just kind of building themselves off of your uh, declarative app structure, we're able to sort of just project that to a UI paradigm to represent that declarative structure. So, but let's sort of give a little bit more context to what we mean by declarative. So here you'll see a typical Xamarin Forms app, a Xamarin Forms shell app. Now what we've done here is we've told it what type of elements this app is composed of. So we essentially have a flyout item, a flyout item. So these are things we want to show in our flyout navigation menu. And then we have this here, which is a which is another area of shell saying, hey, we don't want this to show up in the shell, in the flyout. This is going to be a separate page that just has like a tab bar. And then here we have some menu items that we want to show up uh, that don't have any content, uh, but we just we want to we want to provide actions to them. So if we look at what that translates to, that's this. See here we have our flyout item homepage account flyout item and then our tab bar doesn't show up because it's we're, we don't we, we haven't declared that this is something that you can reach through a flyout navigation point but we do have the two menu items here so let's drill down uh, into the flyout item here a little bit so if we drill down to the structure what we're saying here now is flyout item has two children here two children that uh, are two children <laughs> account basically has two children now we're saying, okay, we want these children to be represented as tabs. So as you can see here, uh, we have two tabs. So tab details, tab settings. Now this is all just created. Uh, you, there's no need to really create like tab pages or anything like that. At this point, it's just, you know, we're generating this UI based on how you've declared the layout of your application. And then you'll see here, we've all also already articulated that this tab has two children. And those two children we've represented as top tabs, as you can see here. So these two tabs here are children of details. If we were to click on settings, which you'll see later, the top tabs would disappear because <coughs> settings only has one child. So one thing we also wanted to make sure was that you could, you could really easily theme your entire app. So here you have a very bare bones shell app. So this has no theming, no colors, uh, nothing really added to it. So what we can do now at the shell level, here we go, I'm pretty excited about this transition. I'm kind of building it up a little. Ooh, pretty fancy. All right, so if you look at this here, you'll see what we've done is at the shell level, we've defined a resource. And then what you do is you indicate the different styles that you want to apply to each coloring point. So here we have like a background color, foreground color, our title color we've set to magenta, disabled, unselected. Uh, as you can see down here, title color for the selected one, unselected is this. I don't know what that would be named. It's, a, it's like a white with an alpha value. So um, yeah, so it's really neat because you can just specify these at the, uh, at, the, at the high level to say this is generally what we want our app theme to look like, kind of like what, how should everything um, color? So, but we can kind of drill down a little bit more and get a little bit more uh, creative with how we customize. For example, on the flyouts, you can customize. So as you saw on the flyout, the flyout was just a list of items. Now what you can do though, is that each of those different items, so the, what generates each of those items is essentially just a Xamarin Forms grid. That's all it is. It's not native, it's not some native uh, element that we're creating that you can't really tap into. It's literally just a grid. Uh, on our documentation, you can see it here. I'll show you later in an app. But basically all we've done is take a grid here and this grid represents 
um, all the different elements. So if you, it's kind of like a control template, editing it in this way. So you can, you can start from the default behavior and then modulate it as you need. So you'll see here, I've basically just set the background color to yellow. Um, and then if you looked over here, I've increased the height. So all this has done is now this menu item has rendered as a larger grid. But, so this is a new feature actually that's coming in 4.6. What we wanted to do was make it easier to sort of articulate these differences without having to uh, throw, in the whole, throw in the whole thing. So what we're adding here are style classes. And the idea with this is that on the flyout item, you can add style classes to style uh, individual properties. So the nice thing about this is that when you're setting the style on properties, you can target any single property of a Xamarin Forms element. Uh, so we really wanted to avoid just having um, the entire label API uh, replicated up to here. So this, this is really neat because it lets you just touch into it. See, right here, all we've really done with this is we've said, hey, flyout item, I want your text color to be purple and I want your text decoration to be underlined. And you can see it's still following the same style as everything else. And the neat thing about style classes is that they're composable. So you can do the main page flyout item for the label. Then you can add another style for the, la for the image, so this guy over here, and then just add another one to that. And then you could even do it for the entire layout because this is just a grid, so you could set a style for the entire grid. Also, this lets you uh, tap into, say, like the visual state manager for these different items um, or anything like that. So yeah. It's really neat. So it kind of you start out. It's neat because you start out with this declarative structure that just gives you this. All right, here's your app that you're 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 good to go with. And then at that point, you can just kind of tap in in little areas you need to to just kind of beautify it or just to make it more uh, the app you want. So this also plays into the tabs. So as you can see here, we have these properties here where you can set. Uh, and all, any of these properties are settable at any declarative level, which is neat, uh, which lets you really customize how these things, um, how these colors show up. So as you can see here at the shell level, uh, basically what I've done is just tab, tab bar background, cornflower blue, unselected color purple, and title green. So yeah, if your boss ever asks you if you can get that tab bar in cornflower blue, you can, you can oblige. But all right, let's get to some of the exciting things here. Shell navigation. So the navigation on Shell is really exciting because you don't really, it just kind of comes with it for free. So the basic idea here is that you name your destination. So back when we were looking at the declarative layout, you essentially just give any of those elements a route name. You don't have to give everything a route name. All that really matters is that you name your destination point of where you want to go. Once you've given it a name, you can go there from anywhere. So this is the nice idea um, because it makes it easy to just articulate from anywhere. So you can do it from a service. From, if you, you can do it from a view model. If you don't like statics in your view model, you can wrap it in like an iNavigation service of sorts and do it from there. But you don't really have to then worry as much about pulling in the context of the Xamarin Forms app. Because sometimes that gets tricky with Xamarin Forms because you have these navigation pages and you have to figure out which navigation page is active and which one's inactive and have kind of pass that one is in the active one and find it. Whereas this just says, hey, this is where I want to navigate to. So another thing you can do with, that, with Shell is you can register these generic pages. So these are pages that you want to be able to go to from anywhere. So they don't necessarily fit in your exact layout. So for example, you might have a modal page on the uh, flyout that you can click that just pushes a modal page onto the stack, uh, but that doesn't really exist as a child of anything. It's just a page you want to be able to get to. So once you kind of register that type, you can then deep link navigate to it, just like this. So at this point, you can just go await, go to async, details modal page, which is really cool because now what that's going to do is that's going to go to the details tab, and then it's going to push this modal page onto the stack. So you can just start your app up like that, which is really neat. And the neat thing that this lets you do is that it's just a string. That's it. So the cool things you can do with this is, for example, you can save your app location. So as the app location is, as the app location is, uh, as you're navigating around, you can see where you're going to, and then you can be like, hey, 
I need to save the location that I'm at currently, and then you can use that later on, which I'll, I'll demonstrate in the demo as well. You can also navigate to any locations from a web URL, which is really cool for deep linking. So for example, here you'll see I've taken the, uh, the URL for .NET Conf, and I've added uh, a route destination point here. And the, one, the thing to note about Shell is that Shell, Shell will automatically strip the scheme and the host here, and then it'll just look at this part of the navigation point. So you can effectively, when that data element comes in from like your Android intent, you can just, you can just take that data string and say, hey, Shell, navigate to this thing. Like if the, if the URL page has a logical mapping into Shell, and then it'll just go there. So it's really neat. Um, if you've been using Shell, maybe you haven't seen this, but we recently added modal pages to Shell. So the, I, the neat thing here is all you really have to do is you on your content page, so on the page that you want to act like a modal page, you basically just say presentation mode modal. And then at that point, anytime that page is navigated to, it's done modally. Just like that. So you just do go to async, async modal page. So you just, that's how Shell kind of works a lot with these attached properties. Because that's the idea is that Shell is the structure. And then you use these attached properties to indicate, to, to annotate your different, the different actual UI elements, how you want Shell to treat those things once Shell has to present it. Um, so in, in, a, in a future world, someone might even build a completely different abstraction UI, abstra uh, UI concrete implementation against the shell's declarative structure. So for example, uh, Tizen has built, they took our Xaminals app and they built a shell version of that that projects onto a watch. So you know the watch doesn't have this concept of flyouts or tabs or anything like that, but because shell just is like, okay, since they can, they can just consume the shell declarative structure and then they can, uh, they can just map that over to, they can interpret any of those declarative elements however they want to onto a watch UI, which is really neat. So if any other UI paradigms come across dual screen, then we can kind of do the same thing, which is really fun. The other fun thing about navigation, passing parameters. So this is really nice because it makes it easy to pass context into, <laughs> into a navigation page. So really all you have to do is you attribute your, so this works on the view or VM. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be more clear here to say binding context. But if there's a binding context on the page, it tries to apply the property to that first. If it can't, then it applies it to the view. So you'll see in this case here, I've named the properties the same name in order to be uh, confusing. But one of these properties here, this I'm pretty sure it's the first one here maps to what property inside the view model you want it to be. And then the second property here is the incoming query string property. Now this lets you do a couple of cool things as well. One, it gives context to the navigation. So this also kind of let this is the way lets you also do that deep leaking concept is that that URL coming in now has that ID. So if you kind of keep everything simple, even with strings, um, <coughs> and you're able to articulate your destination points that way, then it's really nice too, because every string represents your exact location, uh, which it's, it's, a, it's a really neat way to kind of maintain state if you sort of want to like pull things up. So yeah, here, navigate, go to async page ID 12, just like that. And then it gets pulled into the uh, ID. So the other nice thing here is shell navigation events. There's a lot of really useful eventing uh, that you can do with the navigation to sort of centralize, because even like the navigation page stuff doesn't have the greatest navigate, um, generalized navigation concept, uh, especially because you know the navigation pages each exist at their own sort of level. So if you have a navigation page on one tab and another tab, um, it's a little tricky to sort of aggregate those into a single cons into a single area. But Shell basically gives you these neat little ideas here where you can tap into any time Shell is navigating. So for example, there's a cool API here, navigating, where any time Shell types, tries to navigate, so this even works for like the back button. So if the user hits the back button, navigating is hit, and then you can cancel the navigation. Uh, you can look at where they're going, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then, um, yeah, I mean, you can even look at where they're going, cancel it, and then change where, they go, where, they, where they're going to go to. Uh, it's, it's nice because it just gives you this really simplified um, central location to do that. And then 
obviously, if there's a navigate ting, we need a navigate hit, right? So uh, here is just different things that you might want to do on navigated. So here you'll see kind of a sample later where, where basically what I'm doing is I'm saving off the navigated uh, uh, URL and saving it to preferences that I can use when the application is restarted. Shell also comes with a bunch of nice, neat little uh, helpers, uh, attached properties for different UI concepts um, that kind of will, will easily create these ideas for you. So for example, here, uh, we have this search handler. So the search handler is cool because it just adds a nice little search handler here up in your title view. And then it has kind of sets of APIs uh, that you can tap into when the user selects items, when they hit the enter key, when they hit the clear key. And then at that point, um, and then at that point, you can, you can just act upon those. So you'll see here in my sample, I've typed the letter T. And now it's, it's a list here of, of items. So, and a lot of times what you'll see people do, so the, the, the items here bind to like an item source. And then what people will do is they'll bind it to like an observable collection. And then as they type, you kind of can filter down that collection as you need. Uh, and then the user can kind of click, click on it. So yeah, search handle. Uh, this is kind of a familiar one if you've used navigations. This is kind of just showing you some things that exist that are that will um, that you can also use in shell. So the title view is fully functional as well. Here, you just on any content page, you basically just say, "Hey, this is my title view," boop boop, and then it shows up just like that. So you know, nothing too crazy from if you've used navigation pages. Just sort of showing you kind of like the API symmetry there. Um, of, of being able to still do all the things that you want you want to do in non shell apps, but sort of in shell apps. So to kind of continue along that, uh, shell also will pull in your toolbar items, for example. So if you have toolbar items on a content page, then those toolbar items will show up um, here, up in your up in your top right corner, like you'd expect. So I've kind of put together a demo, which I think it's it's sort of a um, it's kind of going over these ideas again, but it's 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 letting you kind of see them construct and and build up from kind of the ground up. So here, let me let me load up my studio. Let me bring over my emulator. So the other this is also kind of a fun demo because I wanted to show off um, Hot Reload <laughs> as well. So here we have a basic app, right? Home page. Um, yeah. So here's the home page. So let's give this home page a title. OK, so we give that a title. Hopefully it refreshes. There it goes. Yay, look at that home page title. But here, we want to kind of build more of our app, right? So there's other sort of APIs here that you can tap into that are super helpful um, to kind of just quickly do what you want. So let's look at this. All right, I want this to have kind of a nifty little header, right? So shell flyout header. So this just takes any type of content view. There's also a header data template if you want to use a data template. Here, and there you go adds our nice header to our flyout. And as you can see, this flyout behavior is said to scroll. So the other options there are scroll, scroll which just lets it scroll, doo, doo, doo. Uh, fixed, which will just stay at the top stuck. So then the items here will scroll underneath it. And then collapse on scroll uh, will basically collapse it down to a min height. Uh, so it kind of makes it, it has this really cool like squishing effect. All right, so let's, let's, let's keep kind of going along this journey of customizing. So a lot of these things are the ones you saw from the demo. Just making sure I didn't comment this out. No, I didn't. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the the other things here. So let's add let's add our account screens here. So if we add our account screens, we'll see this this shows up. Account. Now this is a flyout item. Boom. With two tabs, and I've specified that I want the icon to be an elephant because elephants are awesome. Now, some of the neat stuff you can do here is you can kind of indicate how you want the flyout items to display. Like, let's say you don't really want to display this one. Let's say you want people to link directly into your tabs. So what you can do here is you can tell this to go as multiple items. Then if we save that, you'll see, see they lay out here. So these are those two children. So now if I click on these, it'll go directly to this tab or this tab. And you can kind of take this idea uh, pretty far down. Into the I, into the structure here. So as multiple items here. Now this is representing the two shell contents. But for this, I want to keep it as single item. 
But the other nice thing here is we can sort of, um, we can make our icons a little bit better. So let's add some icons. Let's add a duck, let's add a cat. And then let's add a dog. Here, dog, dog, G. Cool. Oh, blue circle, it'll recover, I promise. But yeah, all right. <laughs> so there we have a dog. So we have a cat dog. Alone in this world was a little cat dog. So if we click on one of these items, now you'll see it just takes us directly to that, that tab here. But I want to make these tabs a little bit more interesting. So what you can do too is you can kind of change these things around. So you can, you can do different icons. So for example here, I can add a calculator PNG if I want it to, to be on the tab. So see, nice little tab. Ooh, fun. And then this, this here on the styling, this was the one I was showing you from the uh, demo here, this details. You'll see this has a style class on it, main page flyout item. So all I've really done on that one is change it to purple and underline, and you see everything else kind of stays the same to match the properties. Neat stuff. Yeah, so that, so now let's kind of go into the pages and make those a little more involved. So some of this is still just kind of showing off the, uh, some of the fun stuff you can do with, uh, some of the fun stuff you can do with the um, hot reload. So this is, what is this? This is customer details. I thought I had all these set up. Where is it? Oh, here it is. That is the right one. <laughs> I just didn't see the comment out. So if I take this title view and I uncomment it, you'll see I can save it. And then at that point, the text will show up. Hello from title view. Cool. All right. So then now I kind of wanted to show some other fun APIs here. So if I click on add customer, what that does is that goes to a second page right here, new customer. So if you look at, uh, there's nothing, that's just kind of the, the registering stuff that I was talking about earlier. So basically what I've done is I've just registered two different pages, modal page and new customer details here. So those are pages I can kind of navigate to from anywhere. But the neat thing here that I've done with the new customer details is I've changed the behavior of the back button. So you'll see here when I went there, I changed it to a save button. So you'll see text override equals save. And I've tied the command to a command uh, on the back end so that when I click the save button, what it does is it executes a command instead of what would typically be going back. So here I'll click save. You'll see, oh, error, please fill out this form. Maybe try the back button. All right, let's try the back button. Do, do, do. Nope. Better just fill out the form. Wah, wah. So you'll see this was that navigating I was telling you about here, shell navigating, where I basically cancel the event. And then I go from there. So let's enter in the data, click save, bum -ba -da, cool stuff. Now let's kind of keep going along this. You see the customers. So this isn't, <laughs> this is basically just the search handler I was showing you. I just kind of wanted to show it working. Uh, so here, if you type, you can click something, boom, shows up here, rabbit. Um, and that's that's a pretty, it's kind of nice because it the handler handles sort of, um, mapping into all of your, uh, all of the data, any of the actions. So you'll see here, all I've done to realize this search view is I've created a search handler here. I've inherited from search handler and then I'm overriding on item selected. And then at that point I'm passing this up to the account page. So that's it. So all, all I had to do to get this search handler is just create my own one, which is used to handle sort of the, um, the message negotiate negotiating. And then on the account customers, it's just a search handler and that's it. Simple, simple. All right. So then this is kind of some additional uh, APIs you can cut, you can customize here. So the neat thing with this is like, let's say you're on a page here where you don't really want the nav bar. So let's say when they go to settings, you don't want that. So basically you would just say false if you can spell it like that. And then the nav bar will magically disappear. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> nav bar magically dis disappears. Yeah, and you can do the same thing with the tab bar. Boom. And we can bring it back. Cool stuff. So I kind of hit all my stuff inside the pages. Yeah, so those are th those are kind of the <clears throat> that, those are kind of the basics of sort of styling everything. All right. But I wanted to kind of 
demonstrate some some uh, some fun uh, extension extension points and things that you could do. So let's demo this. We will see our hot reload. Dun, dun, dun. So you'll see here, this is just using kind of some of the styling features I was talking about. Menu item, menu template, custom flyout template here, um, <coughs> which is really neat because now I've, all I've really said is go big, go cornflower blue, and then you're good to go. And then see here, I can just click it, oh, modal page loads, boom. Neat stuff. So the other thing I wanted to show was deep linking, just kind of how, how quickly I, I sort of put together this deep linking concept. So all I really did here was the stuff you do for Android. So on Android, I set up the intent filter. So I tell the intent, you know, this is the activity to handle this intent. Uh, I set the launch mode to single top because I just wanted to reuse the activity when it's there. And then I just have it handle the HTTPS scheme and then my data host of .NET Conf .NET. Now this is, then all I do is handle the new intent property. Now let's go sort of into this process initial navigation here. And when I go over here, I click on the URL. Oh, it asked me this again. I thought I did it once and then it was happy. Hold on. Let me click through, go back. Uh, what did I click wrong on that one? All right, let me get the permissions. Oh wait, ask every time. I'm clicking, I'm I need to slow down. Open in this app. There we go. <laughs> All right, there we go. So you can see this is just passing the URL. .NET Conf page ID 12. Now if we continue this along, boom, look at that. So what that's done is that's navigated now into my shell page here. So that's this tab bar. And on that shell page, uh, is it? No, not the shell page, I'm sorry. The deep link page here is where it, it goes into. So the deep link page has a view model. So this is that ID I was talking about. Dun, dun, dun. Look at that, deep link page. So this just throws the event, ID maps, it, uh, it binds it to a 12. Um, I'm sort of just showing this so you don't think I randomly put a 12 on a page. I'd like, you're like, yeah, whatever. It's not actually linking in. But no, there's the 12 that I promised you. Um, yeah. And then you just you kind of you can kind of click back to your app here. All right, so let me. I wanted to show one more thing uh, before we kind of get to the questions part. So you'll see on my shell page here, what I'm doing is I'm saving these uh, URLs here to the last known location. So what happens with this is if I go to a modal page here, you'll see now it triggers this. Uh, I take the location, which is home page modal page, and I save it to preferences using essentials because essentials is awesome. And then at that point, let's stop the app and then let's start it. I have to use the debugger to start it, which I realized uh, because the hot reload doesn't project the new DLL in completeness. So if I was to start up the app again here, it would just be the initial page. So <laughs> uh, yeah, I have to start it back up. But what that does here, I'll kind of walk through while it's starting up, is on the on create, what I'm doing is after I load the application, I'm passing process initial navigation into here. And then the initial navigation here is now looking for last known URL. And if it finds last known URL, then it navigates to it. So you can see here, look, it returned to the modal page. Now, if I click back, well, we're back to our home page, and here we have all of our happy little items. So uh, there was one other small thing I saw that I had missed. I just wanted to show you. Kind of saw this in the styling, but what you can do here, kind of the cool style properties. I just wanted to see, kind of see the uh, hot reload magic here of it um, turning colors. Woo, wasn't that fun? <laughs> cool. All right. Well, let's switch back to the slides. So that's a blue screen of nothingness, which is. Not that exciting. Um, and I went back to the whole slide. All right, let me just go here from current slide. So the whole idea with Shell especially is that we want it to be a stand-in replacement for the majority of the of the of your pages. So you can, as you saw, you can kind of express any of these ideas here. So we want all your file new apps to be shell apps. If you do that and you fail, uh, please let us know so that we can try, we can make sure to account for those scenarios. Um, what's coming here for Shell? These are the our upcoming um, 
upcoming work that we're doing. So right now I've been working with Dan Siegel a bunch on prism integration. Uh, we want to pull in all the title view stuff to get all that centering. We want to be able to template everything. So that's that whole tab bar, everything, native dual screen support. We're looking a lot at performance improvements because I know a lot of people have been asking about that. And if you look on our Xamarin Forms board, you'll see we have a shell project. And you can look at that to kind of see uh, where we're going and what, um, yeah, kind of what's important. So if you look at the project board and you think that, that project board makes no sense, please let us know so we can kind of change prioritizations on different items. So cool. And with that, we can go to the questions portion of the talk. I was going to bring up Twitter here real quick. Uh, I don't know if there's some questions that the um, the, peop the, the folks you there have. Yeah, Shane, thank you so much. We have some a lot of questions, so we're going to do a rapid fire Q&As. And the first All question right. is from George. He would like to know, does Shell support nested tab with nested one having like a hero image view on top of its tab bar buttons? Not currently, but that is also another scenario we are um, we are very actively working on. So the, the big thing there is wanting to be able to push. So like right now, if you have a tab bar, you can't like push that onto the stack, um, which is a, it's definitely a frustrating limitation. Uh, but that's a very high priority thing, which will let you do uh, those types of scenarios. Got it. Excellent. The next question I have from Diogo, and he would like to know, can we navigate with shell in the same way we can with prism, passing objects as arguments to the navigate <coughs> method? Not currently. Uh, we have a PR out there for it. Um, there's a little bit of discussion around the best way that we want to articulate that. One of the kind of nice things about doing your string stuff is because a lot of the stuff with shell we want sort of deep linking. Um, once you kind of pass a class in, that gives sort of a contextual point of navigation, uh, which might be fine, but it's not something, say, that you could you could as easily do for sort of restoring or things like that. Um, there were some, I think, reasons with Hot Reload we hadn't done it yet, but there is a PR for it, and it is something we're looking into. So um, the way you can kind of do that now is you can, uh, you know, you can pass the ID and sort of use different sort of storage mechanisms to kind of pass it across. Um, but yeah, that is one that we're definitely kind of discussing the best way uh, to do. So, because a lot of it is wanting to be able to have the state be um, uh, immutable and passing modal objects kind of, passing concrete objects kind of ruins a little bit of that. Uh, so, yeah. I see. Okay, uh, Ryan from Twitter is asking, does Shell support async navigation? Yeah, go to async is all async. Uh, so the uh, the calls when you're doing go to async are all, it's all awaited. Perfect. Yes. Uh, yes. Also, so they, Ryan <laughs> has another question. Does Shell have an async unnavigated or unnavigating methods? Uh, not currently. So that's going to be coming in some of the work that I'm doing with uh, the MVVM things. So the MVVM thing is going to be converting a lot of those uh, events and such to be uh, async. So, and we have there's a PR out there um, that has a lot of that work in it. So that's that's one uh, that's that's coming as well. Perfect. All right. Next question from Mikhail. He would like to know, will you add possibility to add flyout sub-items? Can we make items dynamic using binding? Yeah, I think I mostly follow that. So the um, <coughs> with the templates, you can kind of bind into the templates. So the nice thing about the templates is that they let you, uh, is, is you can sort of set up this template, and then you can set up the binding here. And so this binding um, here kind of binds into the, the, the view model at the shell level. Uh, or you can kind of set the binding context here onto each one of those things and bind to it. Um, and then if you're sort of asking about the visibility stuff, uh, that one we're working on, uh, we improved a lot of the behavior for removing and adding items. Um, we had added an is visible property, but the is visible property sort of violates some of the UI paradigms. So we're reworking that a little bit. Um, the ideal thing I think is going to be to tie it to is enabled, because uh, that sort of matches the declarative structure a bit. So that one we're kind of IP we're we're um, 
we're shopping. So at this point, you can remove and add the items. So you can do that via, say, like a converter or something of that nature. It's not quite as uh, smooth, but um, yeah, so that's, that's another one we're looking to make easier. Okay, great. And we have the last question from Johan, and that is, how does Shell compare to forms in runtime performance? Uh, that's a hard one <laughs> to answer. I don't, I don't have numbers on that, sorry. I know um, Peppers and Chris King are doing a lot of performance stuff, and they're doing a lot of the performance and analysis they're doing are with Shell. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's a little, I don't have any specific numbers on that. The, the, the rawest thing I could say is if, you, if your app is just purely a content page, that's probably going to start a little bit faster. But um, with Shell, uh, you know, once you get your app to a point where it's, it has stuff, um, then it's, it's going to, the, the goal is to get Shell faster. So if, you're using, if you switch to Shell and it's slower, let us know. There's some performance stuff we're, dealing, we're working with, with navigating um, that need to be fixed, but uh, the goal is to make it as fast as possible. Plus, it's not as quite of a complex, deep um, uh, native hierarchy. So it's fundamentally a simpler app, like the layout structure, once you sort of get to the native bare bones of it. Excellent. All right, we're at time. Thank you very much, cool. Shane, again for the great talk. And we're moving next to James. Awesome, uh, thank you. Awesome, I love learning about Shell. I've been using it, expanding it, and it's great to see where it's going. And awesome questions. Keep the questions coming in with hashtag .NET Conf. Of course, for your chance, if you get picked, we'll send you a Xamarin Monkey, which is awesome. Now, I am ridiculously excited yet again for one of my best friends in the entire world. Barty is coming in. I have his apps on my phone right now. I use them every single day. They're award-winning, amazing, and he's going to tell you all about how he made them and how you can do it, too. Hey everybody, uh, I'm Barty Goldriz, and today I'll be talking to you about building and marketing award-winning Xamarin apps. So, <clears throat> I know every app developer's journey is different, and so I thought it'd be nice if I start this talk by sharing with you my story, one that eventually and unexpectedly led to building two award-winning apps. I'll then talk about the apps in a bit more detail, and then I'll finish the talk by going through 10 lessons I learned on this journey that will hopefully help you on yours. I should caveat this by stating this is not going to be a technical walkthrough, and so apologies in advance if that's what you're looking forward to. But, I mean, I expect the other amazing talks today to have satisfied that need. So the journey. Back in 2012, I was a passionate Windows Phone user, so much so I decided to learn to develop for it. Appy Weather, one of the apps I'll be talking to you today, launched on 2014 on Windows Phone. Its development took a while, mainly because I was learning as we go. I had a full-time job, and probably most influentially, I sweat over the details, which can be generally a good thing, but not always. A couple of years later, rest in peace Windows Phone, I launched Appy Text, a lightweight text editor on Windows 10. Although both apps were what I consider to have been successful side projects, neither of them generated enough revenue to act as my primary source of income. That said, I know there were plenty of developers uh, at the time, and it's at, uh, yeah, uh, there were plenty of developers at the time who managed to make successful careers out of uh, having apps on Windows, but unfortunately that didn't apply to me. So what followed was a lot of reflection, and probably after years of denial, I came to the realization that I need to be where the users are, i.e. iOS and Android. So Q2018, when I started looking into Xamarin more, I had heard a lot about it, but I never had done a deep dive into it, mainly because I had the full-time job and I was probably too invested in the technologies that my existing apps were built in. But I was sold. So much so that I made a big life decision, which was to quit my full-time job to become a full-time independent developer. I was confident by what I had learned that Xamarin would, able, would be able to get me, where the, get me to where the users are within a reasonable time frame. But it's important for me to note that I had a financial runway to work with, primarily thanks to my wife, that gave me the opportunity to make such a move. Six months later, AppyWeather finally launched on Android. 
a few weeks after that, Rough, the second of the apps I'll be talking to you about today, launched on Android as well. A few months later, Rough had a release on Windows 10, something which would have not been a, uh, possible if it wasn't for Xamarin. So that's two apps, uh, one of them on two platforms in less than a year by a single developer. Thank you, Xamarin. And earlier this year, I began iOS development work on Appy Weather. What primarily convinced me to go with Xamarin was a combination of Visual Studio and C Sharp. I'm comfortable in Visual Studio and I love C Sharp. When I restarted work on Appy Weather as a full-time indie, the original plan was to launch an Android first and see how it goes. Because of this, as well as my desire to have access to the same toolkit as a native Android developer, I went with Xamarin Android. So let's talk about the apps in more detail now. Happy Weather, I like to think of Happy Weather as the most personal weather app because it's been designed by someone who checks the weather every day. I live in London, and so the, checking the weather is one of the first things I do every day, regardless of the season. What makes Appy Weather unique is how it summarizes the weather in user-friendly language. Appy Weather ended the year on Google Play's 2019 best of list in Everyday Essentials, and it was one of Fast Company's 25 best new apps of 2019. As I hinted at the start, all the, uh, even though I knew I had created apps of a certain quality, the recognition that followed was beyond my wildest dreams. It's the dead simple weather app you've always wanted. That's what Jared Newman of Fast Company had to say about Appy Weather. Rough, on the other hand, is designed to be the springboard for all your writing on the go. Drafts, notes, lists, thoughts, you name it. It doesn't want or need to replace your text editor or to-do list. It can complement them, or it can work on its own. Whatever works. It's a pleasure to write in rough, and it's effortless to move the writing out. Something that still hasn't sunk in is the fact that rough won a Google 2019 Material Design Award. It also ended the year on Google Play's Best of 29 list in Hidden Gems. Prioritizing function and clarity, Ruff's consistent use of typography, shape, and color create an inviting themed experience. That's what Google Design had to say about Ruff. Next, I'll be sharing with you 10 lessons I've learned since becoming an indie that will hopefully help you on your journey towards recognition. Lesson number one, not another app. It's not 2008 anymore when App Store launched. There are millions of apps on Android and iOS, and plenty in whatever category you're looking at, even if it's a niche app. This isn't the time to create just another weather app or just another text editor. There's enough of those available already. And you know what? They've got a 10 plus year head start on you. So good luck competing with that. The good news is you know what's out there already. You know what their strengths are, you know what their weaknesses are. The established players are set in their ways. They don't wanna alienate their user base with changes. And this is the type of legacy baggage that you're not carrying by being late to the party. Use your late entry to your advantage. Be bold or don't bother. When I originally started work on Appy Weather many years ago on Windows Phone, the early designs were very similar to every other weather app that was out there. And if I wasn't designing for myself, there's a good chance that I would have just released just another weather app. And this is really important. If the problem that you're attempting to solve is your own problem, then that's what I like to call home court advantage. You have a deep understanding of the requirements and you'll be the first to recognize a design that works. Don't start the app on the back of an idea. Focus on a problem instead. The problem app or weather meant to solve was not to present the weather, but to save me the trouble and summarize it for me instead. I didn't enjoy writing on my phone, so I built rough and made sure it made it easy to move text to the next and final target. 
Both apps entered really crowded markets, but managed to stand out in the crowd because they offered a fresh spin on an existing problem. Lesson number two, don't write a pop tune. Because if you try to please everyone, you're more likely to deliver a forgettable experience. With both apps, people seem to have a love-hate relationship with them. And I actually take great pride in that. I know their unconventional designs aren't for everyone, but when there are millions of potential users out there, I was happy to be a niche player. Lesson number three, and this is one of my favorites, version 3.0. The MVP, so that's the minimal viable product, ship it. That seems to be the popular opinion. I mostly disagree, but let me explain why. You're up against apps with years and years of iteration, i.e. they're rich in features and polish. When it comes to the overall user experience, you don't want to ship anything that is rough around the edges. You want to release an app that feels like a 3.0. But it's a bit trickier with functionality because that's going to be difficult unless you're prepared to spend many months or maybe even years to catch up. But here's the secret. It's better if you don't. Do less, but what you do, do it better than the rest. Because if you try to do everything, you're going to be directly judged versus all the other apps out there who offer the same and more. And so you're going to be penalized for anything that you've missed. But if you do that one thing and you do it really well, people are more likely to stay away from these unfair comparisons and much more likely to judge you based on what you do and not what you're missing. So with Rough, for example, it's just a single sheet of text. File management is out the window. But because of the intentionally narrow scope of its feature set, it was important the app made up for this in terms of personality. So I paid extra attention to its branding and I was actually rewarded for it in terms of the Google D Design Award that it got later on. Lesson number four, problem comes first, execution comes second, and then testing. Lots and lots of testing. It may come as a surprise, but you're your most valuable tester. You shouldn't just be testing the app. You need to be living with it to the point that no feedback from anyone should come as a total surprise to you. You should already know what works, what doesn't, what could be better, what could be much better. But there's a role for the other testers as well. You will need their help. And what you need to be doing is you got to be monitoring for recurring themes and people's feedback, and you got to prioritize accordingly. If something keeps coming up, it probably needs your attention. As far as the question of when do you begin testing, it depends on what you're after. If it's deep feedback, then as early as possible. But if it's more shallow feedback that you're after, i.e., you want to just test for functionality rather than its user experience, then you can afford to bring in testers later. To help you decide, remember, the earlier the testers are on board, the more likely it is that you can act on their feedback. When you leave it late, you're not as agile. You're carrying a lot of weight. And you know what's going to hurt? It's when you get a piece of feedback and you want to act on it, but it's going to hurt because it's going to result in delays and rewrites things that could have been avoidable had you brought in the testers earlier. Lesson number five, back from the future. Appy Weather has a lot of strings, and they're not conventional text-only strings. They have a number of different position dynamic variables. It's complicated, trust me. When I originally launched Appy Weather on Windows Phone many years ago, it wasn't long before I started receiving requests from users from all around the world asking for the app to be available in their local language. Problem was, I couldn't because the back end wasn't flexible enough. I didn't design it with localization in mind. 
given how tech-centric AppyWeather was and still is, I lost a lot of potential users because of this limitation. And so, as far as AppyWeather on Android was concerned, one of the core requirements was for me to be able to support localization. This added dev time, but I felt it was justified. Today, I'm proud to say AppyWeather is available in eight different languages and approximately 40% of its revenue is from non-English speaking markets. Pro tip, a German above any other language, at least on Android, based on my experience with AppyWeather and Rough, is the one that you should be focusing on translating first. Think carefully about monetization before you launch. So as far as AppyWeather and Rough are concerned, they both have two different models. For AppyWeather to be sustainable, it became clear a recurring revenue stream is essential because getting the weather costs money. If I made it a one-time purchase, even if it was at a premium, say $5, which is a lot for an app these days, yes, there would have been more sales up front, but I eventually would have ended up making a loss on that user. Short-term gain, long-term pain. Always plan to be sustainable. In the spirit of being a side project, I thought I'd experiment with Ruff's uh, monetization model. At launch, it was an old school, paid up front app for 99 cents. It did really bad. But I mean, if I was an established developer, it probably would have done better. But being an unknown, it just didn't work out. So I went freemium and almost immediately saw much, much better results. An important thing to keep in mind is <clears throat> if you've acquired a reasonable number of users, making changes to your monetization model may get complicated. So just try to, you're, it's going to be tough to get it spot on before launch, but pay attention to it. Think about it carefully. Another important thing to keep in mind that is easy to forget is if you prioritize for volume, you're going to end up spending much less time on the product and way more time doing customer support. If that's okay with you, fine, but just keep that in mind. This, as far as I'm concerned, volume shouldn't be your biggest concern at launch, because, especially because you want to keep it on the down low. So, okay, imagine the scenario. You've been working on the app for months. It's ready to finally go out to the public. You can't wait. I've been there. You've been there. It's a great feeling. Conventional wisdom and great planning says you got to reach out in advance to all the influencers in the space to get a day one press boost. Makes sense, right? Maybe. Remember, you can only make a first impression once. So you can do that and it definitely has its benefits or you wait. No matter how well private testing went, there's no substitutes for having your apps out in the wild. What I would personally advise is go with a soft launch. Put it out there, but don't broadcast to the world about it. Monitor the crash logs. Look out for unexpected behavior and feedback. This is especially relevant if you're developing for Android. Given its ecosystem's fragmented nature, I can guarantee there will be unaccounted issues on devices you haven't tested on, and possibly specific versions of Android even. I'll give you two quick examples. AppyWeather had a lot of text display issues on phones with certain DPIs. Rough, on the other hand, had a blank setting screen on Android 7 and below due to hitting a newer API endpoint. So I didn't follow this advice and I wish I had. But the thing is, both apps generally got great positive press at launch. But if I think back to the version that the press was on, it, kind of, it gives me the shivers almost. If I had waited, I'm pretty confident the uninstall rate would have been lower and sales higher. So the question that you need to ask yourself is, do you want to prioritize having 100 downloads today 
or potentially 100 customers tomorrow. Timing this isn't an exact science. Trust that there will come a moment when you just know that the app is ready from a performance, feature set, and overall polished point of view. And to get there, you have to iterate for life. And this has two meanings. If you don't iterate, you're not going to survive. And spoilers, you never stop iterating. The priority shouldn't be to add, but to refine. Don't be tempted by the numbers game. Don't fall into that trap. When I approach any potential feature work, what I ask myself is, will this add value to the experience? If yes, I prioritize it. And my tips are to prioritize the ones that will add the most value and take the least time to accomplish, followed by the ones that take more time and still add value. Also, another thing to do is to identify the pain points within the experience and make addressing those a priority too, ideally during your soft launch. Performance and stability tend to be overlooked when you're evaluating value. But I mean, that's a mistake because don't think because the product of your work is invisible that it won't be felt. Remember, you want the app to feel like a 3.0. And a pro tip, this is something that helped me a lot, was using the profiler to identify friction points within the experience. That's number eight engage the app is out there what you should be doing is you got to respond to every review and email because here's a secret all users appreciate being acknowledged this will lead to sales this will lead to customer loyalty and this will lead to five star reviews i've lost count to the number of one star reviews that i managed to turn around to five star reviews simply on the back of providing excellent and personal customer support and this is important for people depending on subscriptions. It's essential you provide five-star customer service. You can't afford to do otherwise. And for indies out there, if you are an indie, leverage this. Wear this badge with pride because you know what? People try to go out of their way to support independence. They find it refreshing when they reach out to the developer they're expecting to hear back from a team of developers, and then this one person comes back to them. It's refreshing for them to hear from an actual person rather than a massive company, and a person who treats them not like a customer, but like family. Lesson number nine, dev are better things to do. If you want your app to succeed, you can't just be a developer. My natural instinct, identifying first and foremost as a developer, is to constantly improve the app, add this feature, add that feature. My rationale is, if I keep improving the app, then the users will follow. And it's not that this isn't correct, but there's another way. There's a faster way to get to more users. And the reason why I say this is because you're going to reach a point within the app's life cycle that you're going to experience diminishing returns to your development efforts from a customer acquisition perspective. Uh, by that, I mean, once the app demonstrates enough value, it doesn't need to be any better to convince users of its current and potential value. A more, an effect, a more an effective way to grow is to find users. Dedicate time in your schedule for marketing and growth. Reach out to tech sites, bloggers, YouTubers, all the influencers, routinely engage with them. And if your app is available in other languages, reach out to the above big players in those languages. App store optimization should be a priority. I'll give you a quick example. I had reasonable notice that Rough will be announced as a material design winner on a specific date. One of my big regrets in this last year was I didn't prioritize improving its clearly not good enough screenshots for the announcement drop. What I did, being a developer, is I worked on a bunch of features. I focused on core development work instead. I then optimized to make the most out of the heavy traffic that came in post-announcement, and I really wish I had. Experiment, with, especially with monetization. Increase it, 
decrease it in all markets, in some markets. See what works. Find the sweet spot for you and your users. You need to start to get into the mindset that these kinds of tax, tasks are just as important as core development work, especially once the app reaches certain maturity. The best piece of advice I've been given in my indie app journey is really simple, and it's the final lesson. Keep going. If you keep at it, it's only a matter of time before you start to get recognition. Happy Weather today now has more than 100,000 downloads. Rough has more than 50,000 downloads. It may be surprising and reassuring that this was almost all organic growth. Quick story about Rough. I originally started, uh, started working on it from a business and creative need to complement Happy Weather. There are many moments throughout its life cycle, both before and after its release, that it just made sense for me to abandon it. I thought it, others will tell me it, and the numbers would support it, but I just couldn't. I just felt I had something here that was worth persevering with. And I'm glad I didn't give up because otherwise, Ruff would not have won a 2019 Material Design Award and things would not have snowballed since. <clears throat> so I know I haven't touched on Xamarin in any of the 10 lessons shared, and there's good reason for that. Because the best compliment I can send Xamarin's way is the fact that it got out of my way throughout this entire experience. Never once did I feel like a second-class Android developer, or more recently, on iOS. You know how in sports, you know how to tell if a referee slash umpire is great at what they do? It's when you don't notice them. That's how I describe Xamarin. It's been this immensely dependable, invisible presence throughout this last year. Being an indie, time really is money. The cross Platform APIs provided by Xamarin Essentials have saved me a ton of time. Geolocation, permissions, settings. Without these, I'd have spent way more time doing busy work and way less time adding core value to the, exper to the experience. What's great about Xamarin is how the most popular third-party libraries for Android and iOS have Xamarin bindings available. If they're not, and you're smarter than I am, the tools are available for you to do it yourself. A few I'm especially great, uh, grateful for are the Sliding Up Panel by Martin Van Dyke, Fab by Fabio Nuno. Both of these I use in rough. Last but not least, James Montemagno's in-app billing plugin. I have no idea what I would have done without this one. Happy Weather wouldn't look as nice as it does if it wasn't for Sync Fusion Xamarin UI chart control. They've got a bunch of others worth checking out as well. Another thing that's great about being a Xamarin developer is how the Xamarin team actively provides what I like to call freebies for developers. Startup tracing and custom profilers are two that come to mind that significantly improve startup times. They took me less than five minutes to implement each. And trust me, these are the sorts of optimizations that are important to users. And I, as I mentioned at the start, I've recently started work on the iOS version of Appy Weather using Xamarin iOS. And I'm delighted by how I can focus basically my entire efforts on the user experience and not need to worry about rewriting any logic. And there's a lot of logic, let me tell you. This is going to save me a ton of critical time. Finally, according to Google Design, Material Design Awards is about recognizing best-in-class designs from around the community. Let Ruff winning a Material Design Award leave no doubt that Xamarin is capable of delivering best-in-class designs on Android and elsewhere. Thank you again to Xamarin for enabling this journey. And you can find me on Twitter at MetroStyle, M-T-R-O style. Happy to answer any of your questions now or on Twitter later. Thanks, everyone. Barty, thank you so much. It was absolutely amazing over here. We were just both sitting here watching in awe, loving it. Felt just like a TED Talk. <laughs> I love it. And in fact, lots of great comments, people loving 
your story, and also how to enable these great award-winning app designs, and just kind of the guidance that you're giving. A few questions, we got time for two really quick. Cool. First is from Samir on Twitter. It says, one, okay. great to hear from you, Barty. He did have a question. Um, he just also said, downloaded both of your apps, so boom, awesome. Uh, I also just great. upgraded Rough to Rough Plus. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, first, uh, first question from Samir is, you know, you chose to just go straight to Android first. Uh, what were your thoughts on why you didn't decide to go to iOS as well using either like MVVM Cross or Xamarin Forms or some other cross-platform framework? I mean, it's, it's, it's a really simple answer. I, I had an Android phone and it just made sense for me to design for the phone that I'm comfortable with. I didn't have a Mac at the time as well, so it made it a bit tricky to develop for iOS. But I mean, th that's basically the, th it's, it's not a good reason. It was a convenient factor really at the time. Gotcha. That makes sense. I mean, whatever you have is what you start developing for, right? So exactly. I love it. That's, that's how I started. I was the same way. Um, good question from Starlin came in. Um, this is actually directly to, you may have hit on it, maybe you can go a little bit more in detail. He said, for Appy Weather or, or even Rough, how did you actually start promoting the application t to the media? Like, how did you go about that? So basically, I, I mean, I was uh, kind of aware because I followed the news and everything. So I know who all the big uh, writers and the tech sites are. So I had a, I put the list together of all these uh, different people and publications. And I put together like an email template with a press kit. And I would just send out emails, it, basically as simple as that. I would just be sending out emails to them giving them the opportunity to get a promo code if they want and just tell, sharing with them my story. Going back to my whole point about leveraging the fact that you're indie, so making sure that they're aware of, let's say, my background and trying to use that almost to my advantage. And it was just constantly just reaching out to different people. Really. Awesome. Barty, thank you so much um, for the amazing session. I can't wait to go rewatch it again. Um, and learn even more and go deep and deep and take it to all my applications in the store. Congratulations again. And, um, Thanks a lot, James. Have a good night. Cheers. You too. Thanks. Awesome. We're going to head back over to Olia for the next session. Great. Thank you very much. We just heard the talk by Bardi Golris about his amazing experience of building two award-winning apps. And actually, all those lessons learned can be applied not only to Xamarin, but to any software startup in any area. So if you missed it, check it out on Videos On Demand on YouTube or Channel 9. And we're moving to the next topic, which is accessibility. I have the next speaker, Alexandra, and he will tell us how to develop accessible Xamarin applications. Alexandra? Hello. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, it's uh, always a pleasure sharing my knowledge about not only Xamarin, but also accessibility. That is a so important topic, uh, almost uh, forgotten by the developers during the process of uh, creating and publishing the, the apps. So uh, I. I really uh, w wish that uh, all that are watching us uh, think about it during uh, the uh, development process. Um, I start share my screen. Okay, uh, so I will uh, talk about uh, developing awesome uh, apps, uh, accessible apps. Mm -hmm. mm, let me see. Now you can see. Oh, all right. Uh, so uh, developing uh, awesome accessible apps. Uh, here are my uh, uh, social networks uh, details.
Okay, let's talk a little about accessibility. It's abilities, uh, their, their abilities, uh, and uh, overcoming uh, physical, uh, sensorial, and cognitive barriers. So when you develop a product that can be used by a, a visually impaired person, that it can be used by a deaf person, can be used, used by something, uh, someone uh, on a wheelchair, uh, you are thinking about accessibility. You are thinking that everyone has uh, the right to use your product and your service. And doing that is not only a, a social thing, but it's also business. Uh, I, I, I read about uh, almost one billion people in the world uh, has any kind of disability. So it's a very huge public. It's a, a, a public that uh, wants to consume products and services and it, it's a business strategy to attend this kind of person. And people with disabilities uh, are uh, supported by assistive technologies. Uh, assistive technologies are, are any kind of hardware or software that uh, help uh, helps uh, the, the, that person to overcome some barrier. Uh, so, uh, talking about uh, visual impaired uh, people, we can use screen readers, that is something that I am using right now to read the, all the text on the screen. Uh, we can use magnifiers so we can in, in, amplify the screen and can apply zoom on the screen so I can read it better. We have color schemas. Uh, we have we have person that has color blindness or has any kind of problems with the different uh, contrasts, so it's, it's something that you have to have in mind. And other disabilities has other technologies to support them, like joystick, like special mouse. We have the eye movement mouse, for example. Uh, we have a lot of different technologies to, to help them. So it's using this kind of technology that it's possible, for example, to a blind person like me, uh, develop out some uh, apps using Xamarin. about the, the process of de developing uh, the accessible apps? How do, do we do that? Uh, when we, we talk about uh, accessible apps, we have to have in mind that uh, our TV technologies are based on some uh, protocols that, that uh, your app uh, should be uh, 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 should follow. So, for example, uh, uh, related to controls, what makes a, a control accessible? Uh, a control has to uh, to uh, send to the active technology uh, uh, at least this for information that it's the name or the identifier of the control, so the user can know what, what you're talking about. This uh, text field is to put my phone number, is to put my social security number, is to put my name, what I have to introduce in this control. Uh, this checkbox is related to what? To if I agree with this contract, or this checkbox is related to receiving uh, advertisement about your products. I, I need to know wh what are you talking about. Uh, I need to know the role or the, or the treat of this control. Is that a checkbox that has the ability to be checked or unchecked? It's a text field so I can introduce information on, on it. I can type information on it. Uh, it's a radio button so I, I know that I, I have different choices and I can choose just one. It's a button that I need to tap to access some uh, new feature. Uh, what is this? Uh, the third information is the state. Is this control enabled? Is this control disabled? Is this control checked, unchecked? Is this control uh, uh, 
uh, is the app in a waiting state, so I, I need to know the state of that control. And last but not least, the value. What is the text introduced into the text field? What is the value of a spinner? What is the value of a, a, a slider? I need to know the value that, that I am inputting so I make sure I am doing the, the, the right thing on, on that control. And uh, as we are talking about Xamarin and Xamarin developed uh, awesome uh, native, uh, native apps, I have here in this slide, if you want to take a screenshot, uh, the, the links for the uh, Google's and Apple's documentations related to accessibility. Microsoft has a lot of uh, uh, information about that too, not only related to Xamarin, but related to Windows and other uh, Microsoft products. But I, I put here the, the two, because uh, as uh, cross-platform developers, it's good to know what the platforms say that uh, suggestions as good practice for accessibility. Now, what about Xamarin Forms? Uh, how can we implement accessibility inside our Xamarin Forms apps? We have a group of attach uh, attached properties uh, that is uh, automation properties that help us uh, give to the assistive technologies more context about our app and about our controls. So uh, if we are using native controls, if you, we are using labels, entry, buttons, uh, checkbox, uh, all of these controls uh, have good accessibility and send all kind of information to the uh, assistive technology. But we, when we are using custom controls, when we are creating very different and stylish uh, interfaces, sometimes you need to send more context to the assistive technology. And we do that using the automation properties. So the name is the identifier, is what is this control uh, is doing. Uh, it's uh, I am using an image as a button. I am using a box view as a container for something. Is that uh, is using uh, automation properties dot name that we send to the user the information related to the identifying this control. Uh, help text is a, a hint to the user uh, how they should interact with this control. Uh, they should double tap to activate. They should uh, swipe up and down to choose a value. They should drag and drop this item. Uh, it's something that you can send more context to the user so they uh, can uh, do something. Uh, usually the identifier is a, uh, a substantive, so I say what is this control for, and in hint I put a, a, sentence, a small, very small sentence, usually in a imperative mode, so I, I tell the user what they should do to use this control. Uh, we have the uh, labeled by, that's a uh, how I can uh, link two controls, one for a label and another for the control, and use this label as the identifier of my control. For example, usually on a user interface, I have a checkbox and a label uh, beside it. So usually what we do is mark the label. Uh, uh, so in the, uh, in the checkbox, I put automation properties la uh, dot labeled by, referencing that label so when the user focuses on the checkbox it reads the, the it reads the, the label for me and with that I know what this checkbox is is made for uh, and the more, most important one of the most important ones is the easing accessible tree uh, what this uh, flag do as, as it's a boolean uh, is that it uh, tells to the assistive technology, technology if uh, it should 
take care or not of this control. So I can use this property to show or hide uh, some information from the assistive technology. Usually uh, in some apps to make it beautiful, awesome, re really shining, uh, we put a lot of images on the user interface. But sometimes these images are only decorative. So as it don't have any kind of, of functionality, it's a good process to hide it from the user. So when I, the, the user is navigating on the interface, I can uh, show them that I, I can hide it from them and they can go straight forward to the controls that are important to use it. Uh, by the way, uh, on Android, this property is called important for accessibility. So it, it's a good uh, property to use and uh, we will have demos about it. And we have other properties too. We have the tab index, so we can uh, change the way that the navigation is done inside the, 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 the screen. Uh, cause uh, one uh, information is, for example, as a viewing, visual impaired person, when I am using my smartphone, I don't, uh, I, I, I have the option to explore the screen, touching on the screen and exploring with my finger, but usually it's faster and more accurate to navigate on the screen using swipe uh, gestures. So swiping left uh, uh, brings me to the uh, previous item and uh, swiping right uh, moves me to the next item. So I usually I go from the top to the bottom, uh, swiping from uh, swiping right, reading what is the, uh, each uh, element, interacting with it, going forward until reach the end of the screen and finish my activity. So Tab Index helps us to make this navigation uh, less painful, uh, making that the most important controls are uh, focused first, uh, independent of the how they are displayed on the screen. And uh, we have named fonts on the device uh, class uh, that can be used uh, as dynamic resources, and it's great to uh, respect uh, the platform uh, font sizes. Uh, usually people with low vision uh, uh, change the uh, device uh, font size to a bigger uh, size and uh, it, using these named fonts uh, on, on the device uh, class help us to respect this configuration and have your app adapted to these changes. So let's go to a demo. I will uh, change the screen sharing. Sorry, Teams is not letting me share the screen. Uh, can you see my screen? 
in praise. Double tap to open. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Now it's the phone. Muon Bader. One new item. Location control. Calculate camera, flashlight, desktop ah, right, theater, right. button. Use 3D touch to show more control. I don't know what happened, but uh, unfortunately, uh, my screen reader came to read the chief's screen. Oh. Mm -hmm. No, is that now I need to really to share the, the screen calls. I, I would like to show some, some code, but... I think now I, I got it. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. So just mm -hmm. and don't 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 be afraid, but you also will listen to my audio. Edge, Copa Airlines. <laughs> Double tap to open. Use three D. Right. So it's uh, as I use my my phone. So for example, Xamarin. Bookshelf. Mobile. An app I created. Xamarin. Xamarin. Bookshelf. My books. Tab. One. Uh, Library. Tab. Two of two. Back. Back button. Back. Descent. Xamarin forms. Xamarin blueprints. Image. Xamarin forms. Image. Xamarin. Forms project. Xamarin. Uh, the idea of this app, it's uh, an app to, uh, to, so I can register the books I am reading or the books I want to read. Uh, it's because, uh, let's show Zammer, very Zammerin. fast. Bookshelf. Watch. Pay. Telegram. Pay. Residential. Any. Pay. Cabecera. Uh, wh what it, uh, why Cabecera. is it so important to create uh, accessible apps? Heading. Perful. Tap. Perf. Not if. Explorer. Tab. It's an app with the same ob ob objective, and I want to search for a book, for example. Descubra NASA. Busker Pati Chulo OU Auto. Search, delete. And I will search for Xamarin. Caps E. Caps A. A. Caps Delete. Cap X. Pesquis selected. Pes. So. <laughs> Machilero. <laughs> Implementing selected. Implementing Donna. Oh, well, I certainly get a, a old search. Uh, it's searching for the book. Cadastro Libro. Resultado Neo Encontrado. And uh, it, it's reading to me, but when I search for a book, it's hard to, to find. But okay, let's return to Rappi. the app. Page 6 of 8. Center of pay Positivo. Pay Xamarin. Bookshelf. Mobile. And go to Visual Studio. Xamarin. 
Bookshelf. Microsoft. Mobile. Xamarin. Text field. Uh, that screen that I showed that has a list of books is Go to book search page dot on this uh, this page I will focus So I use it, uh, the, the automation property, to make uh, the image accessible. Uh, uh, it, it's a, a, a good example of that. Another place where uh, in this app I, I, I use it, this was on the image button uh, and I don't want to to show a text on it I use it automation properties name to uh, make it available for the 
the access chief technology and it's, it's working uh completely completely so uh, it, it's very accessible uh let's show again the app selected selected library so we can show xamarin that. blueprint xamarin 4 xamarin for xamarin image xamarin 4x cross-platform application development image loading ellipsis uh by the way xamarin uh, mobile app the, the uh, activity indicator i also put in an uh automation property name on that so i can uh no, no notice that when it's loading my book one great published pack pu xamarin writer add to my library so Button. one xamarin mo published pack pu xamarin writer review add to my library alert select a book yes shell. i am using all the native apis uh, using xamarin for example i have the access I want to, to read. the Button. action I'm sheet reading. Book okay, alert. Success. Book added to your bookshelf successfully. Okay. Publish. Pack. Pub. Xamarin for. Write a review. Button. Can text field. Send review. Button. So I have all the access to it. Uh, it it's incredible how uh, it, it is. It, it is easy to, to make things accessible with Xamarin Forms. And uh, although uh, we are using controls, na na native controls that uh, are part of each platform, uh, Microsoft and the Xamarin team has a, a huge uh, impact uh, making all the controls accessible. I am part of a board that discuss uh, monthly accessibility on Xamarin Forms. Uh, if you go to the Xamarin Forms GitHub, you notice now that there, there is a project for uh, accessibility uh, work on, on, on the forms with uh, that group, all the issues, and the team is really, really um, uh, uh, Working hard, pushing hard to to have uh, each uh, each version more uh, accessible than the other. Uh, James uh, that created the checkbox. The checkbox is completely accessible. It's a control that uh, is not native on iOS, but the team uh, took care to make it accessible. So uh, after watching to this uh, session, we don't have uh, any excuse to don't make your apps accessible from now. Thank you, people. All right. Thank you very much, Alexandra. That was absolutely amazing talk on how to build Xamarin accessible applications. And we're at time, so we're heading back to James, and he will introduce our next speakers. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Ole and Alexander. Absolutely spectacular seeing how you can easily light up your application with accessibility. I love whenever he comes and gives talks. I'm always learning something new to add further accessibility into my apps. I'm really excited, of course, for every single talk here at .NETCOM Focus on Xamarin, but truly for one of my best friends in the entire world. I stole him all the way from Wisconsin, and he's here now in the Pacific Northwest. One of my best friends in the world, Matt Sokup the cheese curd king himself. And he's here to give a great talk on mobile backends. Matt, go ahead and take it away. All right, thanks, James. That's one thing I really miss about Wisconsin. They don't have here in the PNW that much it is the cheese curds. And maybe the next time I'll be talking a lot more about cheese curds in the app. But today we're gonna be talking about some monkeys in our app. So today what I'm gonna talk about though is stitching together a mobile backend. So as James said, my name is Matt Sokup. Um, Code Mill Matt is my Twitter handle. And during this session, hit up the .NET Conf hashtag on Twitter. Tag me, Code Mill Matt, as well. And we'll be able to answer some questions if you have any. And get put on the screen, you'll get some plush monkeys sent to you as well. So I'm a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft. Cloud means I like to talk about Azure. I love talking about mobile. And if you have any 
any questions at all about either, contact me at aka.ms slash office dash hours, 30 minutes. We can sit down and talk about anything you want. Let's jump into it. There's a whole lot to cover. All right. So applications, mobile apps need a back end for a couple of different reasons. Resiliency. So everybody thinks, oh, resilient. The data centers are going down. There's a big earthquake in Seattle, which never happens in Wisconsin. But in Seattle, it might be a huge earthquake. I like to think of resiliency in a good sense. Your app makes so much. There's so many people hitting it that the servers go down. You want it to be resilient just in case it's so successful or when it is so successful, you want it to keep on going. Also scalable, the flip side of resiliency is that you want to be able to scale up super quickly to handle when things start getting heavy. So if you know there's going to be some special loads going on, you want to scale up, but you also want to be able to scale down so you don't have to pay too much to have it like in your own data center. You don't want to have a ton of servers going. So this back end, you want it to be also scalable. And flip side of that scalable coin, super duper fast. You want it fast all around the world as well. So you have people here in the US or in Europe or South America, wherever, you want it to be fast for those users. And then especially for mobile apps, you want to be synchronization. Nobody has one device anymore. You have a phone, you're going to have a tablet. Pretty soon, everybody's going to have a Surface Neo and Duo with four screens, not just two. So you're going to want to be have synchronized everywhere. So every app needs a back end. But there's really, there's a ton of moving pieces here. You have to consider authentication. How do you sign your users in? How do you sign them up? You have data. And now I'm not just talking like database data, but also data for images and things like that. Security, not necessarily your auth security, but locking down your resources to make sure like there's nobody getting into the back end of it, into the, the data center portion of your security. And also compute. Compute is kind of like thrown around, like, what, what does compute mean? Compute, you think about is like your web APIs portion of compute. So how do all those fit together? Well, we're going to stitch them together. We're going to make all those work. First, we're going to talk about Azure Storage and wrap a CDN around it to make it super fast. Cosmos DB for our data. And it's also super fast because it's Cosmos is spread out across the world. Azure, AD, B2C. I love me some B2C. I chant it when I go to sleep at night. B2C, B2C, B2C. And Azure Functions. Azure Functions is super duper cheap and very, very nice to use. And then Azure Key Vault. I, Key Vault's this thing that actually is great for security and it's not hard for devs to use. Kind of stays out of your way but makes everything really secure. All right. So let's take a look at what we're starting with or what we're going to Azure eyes. I have this app here, the Monkey Finder app that we've been using a couple different times in the, in the uh, conference today. And it's nice and orange, looks like cheese, has monkeys, everybody's happy. And you go into it, you see, all right, we have a baboon, little where they are, Africa and Asia, how many there's left, and gives us a little description of it. This could all be hard coded, but it's not. Actually, it is pulling down from GitHub, and everything is hard-coded, essentially. That's, well, that's a back end of some sorts, but we can do better. We can do totally better, and we're going to. So this is what we're up to. We are taking this app, which is pulling data from a bunch of JSON on GitHub, and we're going to Azureize it. We're going to make it so great. So here we go. We're up, we're up, and we're away. All right, so first thing I want to talk about is Azure Storage and CDNs, or Content Delivery Networks. First off, what is storage good for? It's good for your static data. You have images that you want to deliver to your apps, storage is great for it. Why? Because it's cheap. It's really cheap. We're talking pennies on the massive gigabytes. It's it's the way to go. And it's great, it's great for the images that you want to put on or any other static content blobs think about blobs for here and it's really really fast and with the cdn it is available worldwide so let's see how we can really go ahead and start using that so 
before, all our images were here. A lot of them were coming just from Wikimedia. So what I wanted to do is get those up into storage. So I already have a storage account created here. And then once I get that, I'm going to put everything into a container. So I'm going to open up the Storage um, Explorer. I have my blob containers, and I have a photo in there too. So I've gone ahead and already uploaded all the photos there. So generally speaking, if you had a bunch to um, migrate over here, we do have like command line tools that can do it for you really, really quickly, but there's only like 10 here, so I did them <laughs> all by hand. But you can see them, they're, they're all right here. So we, we click on Henry, double click, and there we see Henry with the channel nine doll there. But everything is here and everything is great and good to go. But storage, my account here for storage is in the Western US. That's great for us here in Seattle, but for somebody in Europe it's, or in Asia, it's not that great. So what I want to do is wrap a CDN around it to make it even faster. And so one of the great things that Azure Storage does give us, I just typed in CDN here, and it pops up Azure CDN. So it's built right in the storage where I can just click on it. And I've already did it, but I can just do create give it a name and so on, new name, pick a pricing tier, and then the whatever uh, URL I want, and then it'll create a CDN endpoint for us. And that CDN endpoint, what that's gonna do is essentially it's gonna spread all those images out and put them on the edge, the Azure edge. And what that means, they get cached on various data centers around the world, so they're gonna be closer and faster to where your users are. So all that means then is our URLs are going to now be foxcdn.azureedge.net. We would replace that in our JSON, and then in our code, nothing changes at all. They just load up. They're the same for um, in the images. We just load them with a the URL. So it's a seamless as far as our apps concern, but it's a nice little touch over on the Azure side to make our images load faster. It's really cheap to host and it's great. Now it's resilient. We don't have to worry about them any longer. All right, we did that demo. Next thing up is data and Cosmos DB is where I'm gonna put everything here. So instead of hosting it on GitHub, we're gonna put it more into a real database so we can actually modify it and play around with it. Um, first thing I want to let everybody know is that there is a free tier of Cosmos, free as in forever free tier that you get. And it's great for prototyping and very light production loads, but it's free forever. And that's what we're using here. Um, Cosmos, what we're going to also use is uh, the NoSQL portion of it. It's called DocumentDB, which is great for JSON. So which means my code is not going to have to change that much over on the Xamarin side of things because we're still using JSON. And what's cool about DocumentDB is I can actually query it with SQL. That's pretty neat. Cosmos also has a really robust security system built in, both for as far as accessing data from a user perspective and also so it can get at various other portions. So like when let's say Azure Functions, which we'll get to, wants to access Cosmos, we can lock that down really tight so nobody else can get in. Has a great .NET SDK, which makes it really easy to use from Xamarin Apps, and it's also distributed worldwide. That way, again, we have multiple read points around the world. Wherever our users are, they can get at it. So we wanna take a look next up at our Cosmos DB. So back into Azure, and I'm gonna open up Cosmos here. And what I did is in my data explorer, I pretty much just copied over, I created a zoo database, a monkeys collection, and then the items here, I have really just the same thing as we did over on GitHub, name, location, details. I put those into a document with an ID and a partition key. Now, there's a reason behind my madness here, but this is what I did. 
name, location, details. It's the same object that we were using over on GitHub, but it's now within this document object, this document class. And one other thing I want to call out is the image that's being pulled down. It is boxcdn.azureedge.net. So it's using my CDN as well. All right, cool. So what's next here? Why, why is this, why do I have it in document for? Well, I'm gonna go jump over to Visual Studio now and in my empty document class. So what I have here is an empty document and it has this generic T, right? And so ID, partition key, and then I have this document and it's of type T. Well, that's great because my of type then can be monkey. So what I'm able to do then is make my documents here essentially be reusable. So ID, document, and partition key, they're going to stay the same over and over again. But inside this document object, because it's JSON and it's very NoSQL, very malleable, I'm able to put whatever I want to within there anything I want, and I'm going to. So right now I just have these monkeys over and over again. And so then when I want to read it, let's go over to my monkeys view model. I'm just going to new up a data client and say, get all items, monkey. It's going to call up over here. And then this is what my .NET SDK looks like. It's doc client that create document query it's getting an empty document saying, I want the empty document of type T, which is my monkey. And then this goes on and it's just saying, all right, this is where I'm gonna find it, database name, collection name, zoo and monkeys, and as document query. And then I just loop through everything, grab it and put it in. So what I'm saying here is this, this get all items that I put into my data service is completely generic across whatever I will put up in my Cosmos collection there. So that's that's really neat. And then I made it really, I'm stitching together something I'm hoping is very generic across everything. All right. So, I mean, that's getting the data. The getting the data is pretty, pretty straightforward. But what about security, right? I mean, you can't access Cosmos without um, putting, a, putting a connection string in there. And eventually, I'm going to want to be able to, let's say, go in here and maybe favorite a monkey. And that monkey is going to be my favorite, not everybody's favorite. And so I want that to be just for me. So how do I do that? Well, Cosmos has this great thing called partitions. And we saw that just before, and I kind of glazed over it, where I had a partition that said public user. Well, we're going to have partitions for each individual user as well. And so that's kind of one good way that we can split up data within Cosmos is by putting it into a partition. And you can do it public and per user. And what happens then when we want to load that data from Cosmos, we use tokens. And what's great about using the token is that you don't have to hard code the connection string to Cosmos into your app. Super nice. That way, when you're not hard coding it into your app, a bunch of great things happen, including you never have to worry about checking it in, pushing it up to GitHub. And then that all that craziness that goes along there. No app credentials at all in GitHub. No app credentials anywhere, actually, because everything is just a token that expires after a while. But where are all, all those tokens put? That's our next topic here, Azure Functions. So what are functions? Functions are the serverless paradigm that we have in Azure. So what serverless means is, well, obviously there's no server. And it also means that it's, you don't have to worry about any infrastructure. You don't have to worry about even the operating system. You're just running the smallest amount of code that you need to write to make something. So you're just writing these tiny little nuggets everywhere. And so what we can use these functions for is for a web API. We can build out a, essentially a REST service without having to build a full like .NET Core web API. We can just build individual things for it. They're super cheap. You're only gonna pay for it when they run. 
And they have these things called bindings. And what's really cool about the bindings is that they connect up the things like blob storage or table storage or even Cosmos DB. And by this having this connection to Cosmos DB when you're bound to it, the functions runtime is going to take care of newing up a Cosmos DB connection for you. And you just have to declaratively say, hey, I want to be connected to Cosmos DB. Functions are going to take care of everything else. You're really, you're cool to go. And that's what I mean when it plays nice with others. There's so many bindings, there's so many triggers. Functions really is integrated well within the Azure ecosystem. So let's take a look at functions and how we can make functions work to get us a token for the public user partitions. So we can get all these public user from Cosmos down to our app without having to have any credentials. All right, so I have my function over here in VS Code. And all I'm doing here is have, I have a function here called public broker. So what this public broker does is here's the binding. It says Cosmos DB. I'm gonna take in saying what the database name is, the collection name, I do have a connection string here, but it's cool. And I'll tell you why it's cool in two settings here. And it's going to be a document client. So our functions is going to take care of doing all that up for me and handling it. And then eventually what I'm going to do is say, I'm going to get a partition permission. And here it's going to say read. So what I'm saying here is I'm going down and creating a bunch of things that are Cosmos based, but it, what's gonna come out of here is because I'm going after the public user one, I'm gonna get a read only permission to Cosmos. It's gonna return that token to me through the app. And then what happens when I initialize my token, I say, all right, get me an access token. My app then says, all right, when I initialize the Cosmos client on app, it goes out, hits that endpoint for the function, gets the token back, and then it uses that token right here when it news up the client. So essentially all I'm doing is hitting this endpoint, getting the read-only partition for my public users, and it comes back to the document client, and that's all I can access because that token is only good for that particular partition. Cool. But like I said, I'm going to want to have more than just that, right? I'm gonna to wanna to enter data myself and my identity. And that's where Azure AD B2C comes in. And B2C is identity as a service. Right, we let Azure handle all the hard stuff. We let them actually encrypt all the data, all the users' identity, have it up there. We let them do all the communication back and forth to all their identity providers and so on. It's identity of the service. We just have to worry about running our apps. It's aimed at consumers, right? So when you think of Active Directory, usually it's enterprise-based. AD B2C is consumer-based. You don't know who your users are beforehand. B2C lets them sign up for your app. They can even sign up with social accounts. So like Google, Google or Twitter, they can come up and say, all right, I don't want to create a username and password. I have a Twitter account. Let me log in with that. You're good to go with B2C. It is based off of Active Directory, though. So you do have all that power underneath. And it was mentioned before in Lucy's section, she mentioned authentication. You have the MCEL SDK at your disposal as well. And that's super powerful. It's crazy powerful how actually that is. So B2C, let's look at how we can hook all that up. All right. So when you do create a B2C tenant, you get actually a whole other essentially instance to play in. So you notice that my Azure right over here is blue top. My B2C has a black top so I can keep them separated. And what I have then is the ability to log in with my monkey finder. So this is my app to log in, and this is my API to log in with. So this is the Azure Functions, and this is the app that I'm gonna log in with. So 
by registering those two, what I can do then is have this user flow. And so what the user flow is, essentially, is a way for me to go through and sign in. And I'm just going to say run user flow. And it allows, allows me to sign in. So I can do matt.sokup at microsoft.com. And my favorite password, ABCD1234 exclamation point, and sign in. And this directs me back. And here I get this big token back who, when you look at the claims, identifies me for who I am. See, my given name is Matt, and it tells me what I logged in at. And it even gives me an access token hash. All right. So that's B2C letting me log in and giving me back an access token that I can use to go back over into my Azure Functions and we'll go over here to Function App Settings, Authentication Authorization. What I do is I have this set up configured, advanced, and so I have this calling back to B2C. So essentially what I did, I said, all right, Azure Functions, here's the information that you know to go talk to B2C, and so when B2C does call it, it's going to pass it this information, or when my app calls it, it's going to pass it this information. Functions going to say, all right, I got this information. B2C, what do you think about it? B2C says, yeah, that's good to me, and then Functions is going to be able to return to me a token that it creates for user broker run, which down here will come back. And it's going to give me a partition key value of user dash user ID with all the permissions. And so that user ID is my Active Directory user ID. So let's actually run this here. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to log in. It says Monkey Finder wants to use B2C to log in. That is an iOS thing. They are protecting you from yourself there. So I'm going to log in again. Microsoft.com. Did I spell that right? We'll find out. Favorite password in the world. Sign in. All right, I'm in. So I'm going to go log in. Oh, cancel. I'm logged in. Search. Do I have any favorites yet? Not yet. Make favorite. Maybe not. Let's see. Make my favorite. All right, it should tell me that I made the favorite, but it's not. So we'll give it one last try. All right, it is my favorite, so I'll delete it already. All right, so I never liked Baboon anyway. Make my favorite. All right, yeah, I love you, Baboon. I love Baboon. So I'll go over here to VS Code, Browse Azure, Refresh. And you can see I have another Baboon in here. And my partition key is that. That's my user ID. And you can see in my name, document, is just monkey name. So I really just made it whatever I wanted to. All right. So, I'm getting near time, but I'm almost done. And so that's B2C, but let's, let's make things a little more secure, and that's what Key Vault does. So Key Vault's really for secrets management. Think connection strings. It uses Azure Active Directory on the back end, which means apps can have access, but your users, or the bad people, don't. So let's see this really quick in practice. And so what I have here, I'm in my Azure Functions. And if I go down to Configuration, I can see everything. And if I go to Cosmos Configuration, you'll see here it says Key Vault Reference. Well, what does that mean? If I do Advanced Edit, you see I'm using Microsoft.KeyVault, and I have this URI in there. So where my Cosmos connection string is, it's actually reading from Key Vault here. And if I would actually go through and try to open up that URL. No dice, unauthorized, it gives me. Cool, I mean, that's, that's exactly what I wanted. So, 
what is Key Vault all about? I go down here, and I have my connection string in the secrets portion of Key Vault. See Cosmos Connection. And I can go in here and here where it actually is. If I do show secret value, it's it's right down there. And what's neat about this then is I can go in and I can disable it. I can set an ex expiration date. I can actually version it if I wanted to. But where it gets really, really nice is in this access policies. You see, here I am. I can get to it. But this FO Xamarin 2, that's my functions app. I was able to say, hey, Functions app, you have permission to it because you're sitting on Azure. Nobody else besides me and the Functions app has permission to that. Nice, right? So Cosmos connection string, totally locked down. Only the Azure app, Functions app, get at it. Nobody else. Nice. All right, it's stitched. We went and we stitched a bunch of different things together. CDN, storage, Cosmos, functions, Azure, AD, B2C, Key Vault. That's a lot in like 25 minutes. All the code is at that AKA MS link, monkey dash fresh. And all right, Code Mill Matt, hit me on Twitter, AKA MS office dash hours. I'm flipping it back over to Channel 9 Studios. We made it. Awesome, we made it, Matt. Thank you so much. We had two questions really quick. Um, one from a um, very handsome gentleman, James Montemagno on Twitter, ask, how much is, um, um, uh, is Cosmos DB to get started? Free, James, it's oh. free. Okay. Uh, All right, great. hold on, hold on, James. Now, if you remember way back when, there's a great podcast called the Xamarin Podcast, when we introduced um, Xamarin you when it moved over to Microsoft Learn. Do you remember how much that cost? Uh, I believe it was free. It was free, yeah. Cosmos, the same cost. Free. <laughs> same cost. That's a deal. Uh, <laughs> all right, one other question. Also check out Matt and I um, every month on the Xamarin Podcast, xamarinpodcast.com. Um, question for Clifford asks, you know, um, App Center, um, they had a preview of auth and data that sort of has been um, deprecated, gone away, which now we can see how we can stitch together all these Azure parts. Any insights in the diagnostic and analytics? Because there's also kind of App Insights um, in general. Yeah, so right now, App Center has a great um, telemetry offering. And what's nice about App Center's telemetry offering is that you can export it into Application Insights. So right now, today, I'd still be using App Center's telemetry offering. So that's, that's where I go today. So that's also why I didn't touch on it right now, because App Center's telemetry is still there. Perfect. Yeah, it's used by a lot, a lot of developers, including myself <laughs> and a lot of us here, <laughs> too. So um, awesome. Well, thank you, Matt, so much for stitching it together for us. Of course, um, make sure you hit him up at Code Mill Matt on Twitter. I'll answer more questions there. We're going to head it up for our last session before a final goodbye. Head back over to Olia. All right. Thank you very much, James. And we are approaching our last session for today. And this session will be about performance. So our next speaker has an amazing collection of Xamarin monkeys cheering her in the background. And I'm happy to introduce you Sviki Tatpasi with her talk, Developing Performance Xamarin Applications. Hello. Hello, everyone. What an amazing day of sessions. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead, share. Oop, let's minimize you. Get out of the way. All right. Uh, just going to confirm everybody can see my slides, and we can get started. Oh, OK, awesome. Um, so yeah. Um, Hi hey everyone, last session of the day. So um, it's also uh, the most uh, complex topic I can say. So think of this session more as sort of like a recap of everything we learned today and sort of like a compendium of information on where and how and uh, you know, sort of how to build good performing Xamarin apps. So um, let's dive right into it. Um, so here are my quick hot tips. This is focused only on if you're hitting issues with your like, uh, like hot tips, uh, issues sort of way before when you're starting your new app, how to make good decisions right at the start, right? So first off, 
please make good architecture choices. In the long run, that's what that's what usually determines how your app performs. So, you know, pick a good MVVM, you know, library to use or build one of your own, but please use the pattern. If there's going to be databases involved, make sure you're picking a good repository pattern. Um, and since it's right at the beginning, we have Xamarin Form Shell now. Shane had an awesome session about it. So if it fits in your, you know, use case requirement, go ahead and use it. Uh, it's a lot more. It's they've pushed in a lot of performance into it, so it's a good, you know, good option to use. Um, pick your dependencies wisely, so don't go too dependency heavy. Uh, you want to make your, you know, app light and smart, you know, and snappy. So you know, pick pick those wisely, and of course. Test often, that's of course like the easiest way to find, you know, performance issues in your app and then fix them often, of course. Um, and suppose you are watching right now and you already have an app and you're hitting problems. Uh, please, please, please go check out the Improved Xamarin Forms app doc that we have. It is extensive, it is long, it has a lot of stuff I'm going to be talking about today. It has a lot of stuff probably already mentioned in some of the sessions from today, so it's a good place to start. And it, and it has my favorite video in the whole world, uh, Jason's talk from Evolve 16, which is a legitly awesome um, talk and absolutely relevant even today. Um, all right, so. Let's talk performance optimizations, right? Um, this is what I will suggest for a startup performance sort of checklist. Like if you're hitting issues or you're trying to resolve uh, some startup performance problems, here's what I'd suggest taking a look at. Uh, don't register services, of course. Don't do a lot of heavy uh, processing right at the beginning in the startup of your app. Try and lazy load as much as possible. Um, again, also don't sort of do a bulk giant download of data on startup. If there's something that's needed only like maybe five navigation pages away, wait till you get to that page to sort of, you know, download those bits. Don't get everything that you would need at the startup of the app. And of course, be nice about the user experience. In case you do have a performance hit or your app is taking a while to load, please be nice to your users. Put in like a loading screen, put in like an animation, use Lottie. Uh, like uh, Steven said earlier in his session, if you can't make it, fake it. So fake as if, you know, that's whole part that, you know, the whole loading icon is part of your app experience. Um, so now let's deep dive a little bit into uh, specific cases in Android and iOS. So on Android, this was uh, Maddie and David mentioned startup tracing. I'm going to do a shout out to it again. Um, please, please check out what Android Startup Tasting does. So it's a feature in sort of profile your app and uh, we just announced custom profiles with Startup Tracing. So you can see this is right from John Douglas's blog post, which I had links to at the end, don't worry. Um, you can see that turning on Startup Tracing and even possibly using Startup Tracing with a custom profile increases your app startup with like, like this app, app startup performance a lot. And you don't have to add too much of overhead to your APK size either. So uh, definitely check this out if you haven't already. Uh, for iOS, there's this little option that's hidden in iOS build that turns on your LLVM optimizing compiler. It's turned off by default in debug. So it usually you'd want to turn it on in release mode, but I will put a small caveat to this. After you turn it on, please, please thoroughly test your apps on a device and make sure that it's not breaking something else and your app continues to like you know have good performance. Uh, some other gotchas uh, that I'd like to touch upon right now. Of course, the big bad boy in performance is async and await. So please, please use async and await, but please follow best practices. Um, don't have time to go through every single async await thing that you can do correctly in this session. So think of this as sort of like my top five issues uh, that I think we see a lot and pretty commonly. But I mean, in the end, I'm going to link uh, my teammate Dean did a bunch of amazing sessions on how to use async await. Brandon Minnick has a great talk and great resources. I'm going to link all of it. Um, but if you aren't already using async await or you are using it, please make sure you're following these best practices. So, uh, you know, sort of, uh, we'll walk through a couple of these with some small code samples to understand what I'm talking about. But uh, these are usually the top offenders that we see. So let's sort of look at a small code snippet to understand what I mean about all of these. So when to use consecutive versus concurrent operations, right? So if you look at this code sample over here, it's sort of processing each URL as it's coming in inside a for loop. Um, this, uh, it, uh, executing this asynchronously 
consecutively sort of negates the whole you know benefit of using async and await right so instead why not just use when all and when all is so you can pick between uh, when any or when all uh, when all is suited for a situation like this where the task must be completed before the processing can begin so again this is like okay code but you can make it much much better let's talk about efficiently processing an async operation right so um, if you look at this code sample over here it is going to first when all and wait for all of the sort of results to come in and then it's going to post process those results um we could make this slightly more performant by maybe instead doing a when any and as and when the results are coming in it can start processing it and then adding it to your list so again you can go from okay code to better code and make your app a lot more performant uh, another small example here uh, cancellation tokens who doesn't want to use them everybody wants to use them so please make sure you're using them but like I said, use them correctly. So what you see in this um, code snippet over here, we have a cancellation token, but when you set it up in task run in this uh, syntax, it only checks if the token has been canceled at the start of the task, but you know, so this task may actually still continue to run. Checking this is actually a manual process. So instead you want to, you know, sort of put in a check like in this code snippet over here, or a solution alternate could be, you could just do if token dot is cancellation requested and then throw in a return over there. So I, you may be already using cancellation tokens, but make sure you're using them correctly. Um, so like I said, there's a ton of content out there. My, uh, so there's Clancy's Evolve talk again, it's in 2016, but still stands the test of time. Um, or uh, David has a you know some blog post or specifically to Xamarin Forms. There's a bunch of resources over here. These slides are going to go out. I'll post them so you can feel free to go and read each and every one of these. They're amazing tools. Uh, and yeah, just make sure you're using it and you're using it correctly. Uh, next up, memory management. Because of course, how can you talk about performance and not about memory management? So our first offenders, event handlers. So. Uh, I think uh, Rodney mentioned it in his uh, talk about how it's important to sort of, you know, dispose and use I disposable. Um, it's again, it's, this is something you'd hear again and again, but trust me, it's very important to remember these rules. Um, so what we have over here, uh, you can see, is sort of to remember to unsubscribe if, from events. Uh, and, uh, and you should remember to unsubscribe them before the subscriber object is disposed of, right? Uh, so... Uh, until the event is unsubscribed from, delegate for the event in the publishing object has a reference to the delegate uh, in the subscriber's event handler. So as long as the publishing object holds this reference, the garbage collector will not reclaim the subscriber from object memory. So you want to make sure you're handling event handlers correctly. Weird sentence there, but sure, yes. Another uh, bad offender in memory uh, leaks is uh, holding a ref uh, like creating a uh, uh, strong and it made sort of like a strong reference that can be seen over here so in this example object a and object b have strong uh, references to each other and because of this this creates what we call an immortal object and i'm not talking about like lord voldemort or sauron from lord of the rings it's talking about just this immortal object which is bad to the garbage collector uh, and because of which neither of these will be collected by our good friend, the garbage collector. Instead, what you want to do is use a weak reference. So this is an example of a good weak reference instead of doing the strong cyclic reference above. Uh, so it uh, basically the way, if you follow this code over here, you can see that the weak reference is created using the instance of the object to be tracked. So object A maintains a strong reference to object B but object B maintains a weak reference of object A. So again, if you're noticing patterns like this, or right now you're just like, oh my God, I might be doing this in my code, please go correct it. All right, next up, loading data efficiently. So you want to make sure our aim as mobile devs, of course, is to make uh, the app perform well for users. So be a little more informative when you're loading types of, you know, different types of data. So for text, have placeholder text and display those first. So the user gets an experience of like, okay, there's something happening and not just like, you know, there's just nothing appearing on the screen. Uh, placeholder images are great. Showing a loading icon is also great. Uh, and a good way to sort of optimize this overall experience also is to make sure you're not, like I said, right at the beginning, downloading like one GB of data or something right at the start, sort of 
break up your API to just, you know, download as much as you need as you're going along. Um, another good one to remember is don't overbind. So binding in MVVM is very, very tempting. You want to go and over, like bind every single thing. If you have two, two labels, say, for, for example, one just describes something and the other one is what actually gets updated with some sort of data, don't, don't bind the descriptive label. Let, let that be. You can bind the other one for sure. So small things like this will add up to making your apps like a lot more performant. Um, and again, uh, the best thing to catch all sorts of weird memory leaks is to use profilers. Uh, a quick tip on when you're looking for when you're using a profiler is look for things like memory leaks for so big large objects uh, you're seeing the garbage garbage collector runs but it's not actually cleaning anything up um, and things you can measure which are good uh, sort of things to like information to have startup time operation time see the io profile uh, of course ma manage the memory consumption so uh, when using profilers good tips to remember to make your you know sort of profiling experience a useful data collection um so profiler options that we have out there in case no one knows we have of course our xamarin profiler there's xcode instruments and there's android studio profiler and in case you're wondering oh my god how am i going to use this here are all your resources my other amazing teammate i work on a great team don't i um alexi did a great xamarin show episode with james on memory management he walks through how to use the native uh, profilers and shows you how to use the xamarin profiler so it's great we have a ton of other resources sort of walk you through how to use these next up Quick tips on managing your resources. So by resources, I of course mean your icons, your assets. Uh, so uh, we already went through like this, like this, I feel like this keeps coming back again and again, but trust me, it's a, it's a bad offender. People keep doing this, but make sure your assets are not just, especially in Android, you're not just dumping them in drawable. Be smart about it. Go and use, there's like M Fractor, there's a bunch of online resources, there's, um, uh, Red uh, resize, dot nt. Um, go and resize your assets. It's going to make a huge difference. You don't want to bulk up and make these because essentially the system will spend all this time resizing it from drawable. If you provided different density images, it just saves its time from processing all of it and therefore giving you performance in your app. So small things, but adds up to make a much much better app. Same thing for images, continuing with it. Uh, avoid putting large files and loading it from your net standard projects. Um, uh, and if it's things like icons, tabbed in, like tab bar images, um, try not sort of loading those resources from the web. Be smart about it, make smart decisions. Some of these images can be just embedded by default into the app. The others can of course be downloaded from uh, using the internet. Um, consider using smart uh, uh, controls. So use Glidex, Sharpnado's Nuke is awesome. Uh, implement caching for your images. If you're feeling too lazy to implement it, like I do sometimes, I go and use FF image loading. It's a great NuGet. A uh, lot of performance enhancements already built into it. So again, I all of these different resources, uh, there's a ton of great content. A bunch of stuff was uh, mentioned today. Uh, like even uh, James and his session covered a lot of it. So go back, rewatch videos from today, uh, come back and check out and click all of these links and, you know, check these out. Um, Android Asset Studio is a great way to sort of resize your assets also, which again, important step, don't forget. Um, all right, moving on to dependencies. So optimize how many dependencies. I kind of touched upon this site at the beginning, but sometimes, you know, it's, it's not anyone's fault, but it can maybe a project got sort of inherited through five different developers. And by the time it comes to you, uh, people have sort of added different dependencies, decided to use this NuGet versus that NuGet. Um, and they forget to sort of delete references to those NuGets sometimes, or maybe you've just like sort of, you know, eventually realize, oh, wait, we don't need to like sort of use this dependency. You can just sort of roll our own. Could be many, many different decisions. Uh, you could just by mistake also just have like a ton of references that you don't accept, you don't, you aren't using all of them. So go through that and clean it up. Make it nice and clean. Uh, the lesser dependencies you use, uh, like you don't need like 50 MB worth of just like dependencies, you know. So be smart about it. Uh, it you know, cut down and just use as many as necessary. Um, another good tip. This is James actually showed this to me on um, Friday, which is amazing. Um, so I knew. I mean, of course, try moving. Uh, start moving over to package reference and in Visual Studio, in under NuGet Mag Manager, you can actually set your default preference for new projects now, which is great and awesome. In case you already are using 
package dot references and you haven't switched over friends use this awesome right click migrator tool it is awesome it'll change your life it changes my life so many times um go ahead and do it it's unbelievable and you know just say like, yeah just great just throwing it out there so again uh good resources understanding uh you know how dependencies can add or subtract your performance uh again great resources i'm going to going to be sharing all these links please please go read them next up app packaging okay let's talk about our good friend linker so everybody sees that option you know when they go into uh you know android options or ios options um try turning them on sometimes they will totally help you um so at the very least uh keep sdk uh, like link SD, sdk assemblies only in your release builds um you know if you know it's, it's the it's least aggressive it it removes everything from the xamarin sdk so at the very least we try and thin your app out as much as possible in that without losing anything and without breaking the app uh if you can if you can go a little bit more aggressive link all or link all with sdks and user assemblies is is it's exceptional It'll, it'll actually shrink your app size down quite a bit, which again adds to performance hindrance. So bigger app sizes, the more laggy your app is going to be. So try uh, with with Link All. I would again suggest turn it on, but test your app. You know, test it aggressively on devices. Use Test Cloud. Make sure you know it's not like you know linking away uh, anything that's important. In case it does, you can go check our docs, and it shows you how to um, you know keep those linkers safe. Um, and with the new awesome android app bundles uh, go ahead turn it on check it out it will again change your life make your AB, uh, apk's much much smaller target specific abis life changing again will definitely help you out with your performance um again all the different resources how to understand how to turn these things on turn these things off uh, james is an awesome uh, a blog post on you know understanding linker different linker settings how to even enable linker in your xamarin library so go ahead check them out friends all right uh, closing it out soon so good ui layer uh, ui tips we saw some great uis let's make those performance so don't don't be bad don't do ew don't nest stacks inside stacks inside stacks these are expensive this take a while to draw out do not do that don't use auto in your grids uh and again please if there's a repeated style put them in a data template it will it will just save you like a a ton of time writing the code and b make your app a lot lot more performant um and on android if you aren't already which would be very surprising to me please use app compact it's your good friend um again uh, with fonts uh try using instead of like you know uh, putting all these uh, You know, like specific numbers and settings try putting like the generic names uh for the font size a large small uh and uh, a cool one which my uh, teammate ben wrote an awesome article on uh, like an article and blog post on is try using uh, checking out using fonts for assets so something like in your tab bars instead of you know adding separate assets for each image that shows up in a tab bar see if a font can do the same work for you we just did, did it for our zam twitch app uh, again i'm going to throw links for all of this you can check out how we used it he also uh, in the blog post ex explains how to use it uh, to like sort of have a checked and unchecked state so it, it's amazing this it you know fonts and can do styles so if you can use it instead of an asset even better another uh, good one to remember with views and uis is if uh, especially with tab pages um make sure you're loading information only for your primary tab and not for the tabs that's hidden at the back because sometimes you might update a view model and that sort of updates all of your tabs uh, you're just wasting processing uh, those tabs are not even viewable like no one's clicked on them yet so you know sort of check check out for things like that so again more resources a link to our zam twitch app a link to ben's um toggling tabs with triggers uh blog post is awesome um so yeah this is me um i hope you all found this a uh, quick recap sort of of everything today and stuff you can do useful thank you very much squeaky a very amazing presentation on such an important topic i and know i personally absolutely love the amount of gifts on the slides <laughs> that's uh, that's my preferred way of communicating to the world so that was amazing and we have some questions for you on Twitter. So the sure. first one is from Ali. Well, first, Ali says, excellent presentation. Wow. And Thank I agree you. with him. <laughs> wow. 
<laughs> and we would like to hear from your best ways to measure different performance metrics in Xamarin while developing applications. Um, so while developing, it's hard to sort of keep track of what your performance is doing. If you are talking about your own developer loop, uh, Maggie's presentation, productivity tools, uh, you know, just use all of them. Uh, but for your app itself, uh, a good practice would be once you feel like you have an MVP version of your app ready, profile, profile, profile. That would be my tip. Perfect. And another question for Nilesh. Uh, he's thanking for presenting and he would like to know, is there any plan to support AOT in debug test cycle? As far as I know, actually I'm not 100% sure about this. I can check right now. I don't know if there's any efforts, but um, since you're on Twitter, uh, I'll get back to you with more information on that with a more solid uh, response. Yeah. Sounds great. And I think that's all our questions for today. So thank you again very much for your great thank talk. Thank you. And yeah. this was our last talk. So I want to thank everyone who joined us today. Thank all the speakers for their amazing job and all people who posted questions and comments on Twitter. Uh, I, that's all for me. And I will hand it back to James. Thank you, everyone. And Goodbye. Thank you, Olia. Thank you, Suiki, for the amazing presentation. Like Olia said, I want to thank each and every single one of you that hung out, hung out with us all day today on YouTube, Twitch, and of course on the .NET Conf website. Really excited to bring this amazing Xamarin content to all of you to help build you uh, help build all these beautiful mobile applications with C Sharp and .NET and F Sharp and all the amazing languages and technologies. Truly, all of this couldn't be made possible with all of your help out there. Like I said earlier, open sourcing libraries, um, creating great NuGet packages, contributing to the open source projects, coming and presenting, sharing this with the world, the things that you build every single day. Thanks to all of our partners around the globe, to our vendors, to our community members that contributed a few slides here and there, to full presentations, to hanging out and answering questions in the chat. And of course, we'll be back here all the time with great content on our Xamarin YouTube, .NET YouTube, Twitch, and everywhere where you find .NET and Xamarin. Thanks to all the teams behind the scene, like I mentioned earlier. There's a lot of people that you didn't get to see up here that are making it all happen behind the scenes. So shout out to, to Beth and to Javier and to Ryan, to Cameron. And thanks again for Olia for hanging out every single moment with me. Um, and thanks to all of you yet again. All the sessions will be on demand in a few days. Be sure to subscribe to the Xamarin blog um, on both, and it'll be on YouTube, Channel 9, and everywhere you find great Xamarin content. Thanks again so much, and have a great day, afternoon, or morning, wherever you are in the world.